Flowers from the Storm by Laura Kinsall Prologue He liked radical politics and had a fondness for chocolate. Five years ago, the Honorable Miss Lacey Gray had verifiably swooned on the occasion of his requesting her hand for a country dance, an example of that category of incidents which one's friends found endlessly amusing and became fond of recalling ad nauseum in their cups. The circulating quip had been that a marriage proposal would have crippled the girl for life, and an offer of a baser sort killed her on the spot. Since Christian lay now with his head pillowed in the smooth curve of her back, his fingers indolently sliding between her stocking and her skin just above a blue and yellow garter, he had to assume that his friends had been slightly out in their predictions. She seemed perfectly alive to him. Her ankles crossed prettily, waving gently back and forth in the air above him. He shaped his palm over her buttock, gave the dimple in the small of her back a kiss and sat up, leaning on his elbow. When will Sutherland be home? Not for a fortnight. At the very least. The former Miss Lacey Gray rolled over, smiling, exposing breasts that had grown heavier and the slight, swelling thickness at her waist. They'd been lovers for nigh three months. Christian passed his gaze over the subtle changes and lifted his lashes, saying nothing. I wish he would never come, she said, twining her hands together above her head. It's been wonderful. Better than chocolate, he said. Really? He looked around, having reminded himself. The tall pot sat waiting, the kettle steamed softly on the hob. Excuse me. He pushed out of bed. You odious man. He gave her a sweeping bow and a wink, and helped himself to the kettle, pouring out boiling water into the cold milk, precisely half and half, scraping chocolate shavings into the pot and inserting the mill. The carpet felt cool and silken beneath his bare feet. He rubbed the tall mill handle vigorously between his hands, that ought to have been done over the fire, not in the pot but conditions in the middle of the night in another man's bedroom weren't always ideal, and poured the frothy mix into a cup. How you can bring yourself to drink that without a grain of sugar defies the imagination, she said. But you're the sugar, my sweet, he said promptly. He took a sip, standing naked next to the table. How else? She tried to make a jaded pout, but it turned into a smile. She stretched her hands upward again, sighing and arching in a provocative way, sliding her stocking foot up and down the bed. Oh, yes, I hope Sutherland never comes home. You'd best have him home to bed you, my girl, and soon enough at that. She stared at her hands and then lowered them. Her mouth gathered again into that appealing pucker. He won't care. Right ho, Christian said cynically. She spread her palm on her increasing belly and slid a glance at him sideways. He put down the chocolate and leaned across her, kissing her breast, tangling his hands in her hair and kissing her throat. Worth it? He murmured, very close to her ear. She brought her arms up around his shoulders and held him tightly. The softness of her reawakened him. He nuzzled his face into her skin, and while she clung to him as if she were drowning— he took advantage of the moment to tarnish her good character one more time. She seemed to enjoy it. God knew he did. A single candle guttered at the base of the stairwell, illuminating the left arm and draperies of a marble copy of Ceres gazing down with an excess of sentimentality upon a sheaf of wheat. Christian moved discreetly on the stair, but not stealthily, having made his peace with the butler some weeks ago by the simple habit of leaving a neat stack of three yellow boys, by the candlestick as he let himself out. He was collecting them together in his pocket, feeling for the coins through his glove, when he heard the shuffle of a footstep from below. He paused at the landing, his hand on the rail. Edith? A male voice drifted up, a faint echo in the hall. The devil take it. Christian stood utterly still. Leslie Sutherland walked out from beneath the stair, unbuttoning his greatcoat. Eighty? He said again, and smoothed his red sideburns as he looked up. 
There was a clock ticking in the hall. Christian had never noticed it before, but at that moment of silence it was like a brazen, irrevocable tally. One, two, three, four. At four it happened. The half-smile faded from Sutherland's face. His lips parted. Christian expected nothing to come out, and nothing did, only silence, and Sutherland's face going whiter and whiter, until his mouth clamped shut and color rushed up everywhere but in the carved lines beside his nose and around his lips. Six, seven, eight. Christian thought of several things to say, all of them facetious and directed at himself, except for the classic, home early, aren't you? He kept them between his teeth. Sutherland still looked in a state of shock. An unpleasant tingling numbness in Christian's right hand made him realize how hard he was gripping the stair rail through his glove. He let go, but the feeling of pins and needles grew worse and a strangeness seemed to wash over him. As if the stair beneath him shifted without moving. He flexed his hand, open and closed. The action seemed to focus Sutherland. He stared at Christian's hand. Jervalks, he said in an incongruously mild voice. I'll kill you for this. He even got the pronunciation wrong, the bumped-up CIT, too much J and X. In the eerie imbalance of the moment, Christian's mind absurdly revolved over the proper sounds of his own title, Shervo, Shervo, Shervo. He said nothing, spreading his hand and squeezing his fingers into a fist again which seemed something difficult to do. His arm felt heavy, somehow deadened, and his fingers itched and prickled down inside the bone. Your friends, Sutherland said, a little louder, more aggressively. Name your friends. Durham. And Colonel Fane. It was inevitable. But it surprised him that he felt so strange. The clock ticked down another ten seconds while they looked at one another. You blaggard. Get out of my house! The shout came out half strangled. Sutherland was so deep red, so throttled, that Christian thought he might burst and fall down in apoplexy. All right, Christian said quietly. He moved down the stairs, past the other man, deliberately passive and reserved in his motions. Sutherland might wish to kill him, as was his right but Christian had no particular desire to be the cause of the man dropping dead in his own hallway. Besides that, he felt himself in need of fresh air. He felt drunk. His right hand still seemed dead and clumsy as he pulled open the door. He dragged it closed behind him with his left and stumbled, staggering against the iron railing at the doorstep. The moon was full lighting a patch of fog that lay at the base of the street, a blue mist fingering against the black row of houses, rising slowly. Christian held onto the rail, staring down the hill. Something definitely was wrong with him. He felt sick. And dizzy and strange. A wild thought that he'd been poisoned took hold of his mind. Eighty? The chocolate. Would eighty poison him? What the deuce for? His heart beat at a great rate. He kept swallowing, trying to slow it, trying to think. After a few moments, he let go of the rail. The cool air seemed to brace him. He drew deep breaths of it and felt more himself. A dark shape lay at the foot of the front steps. He squinted at it and realized it was his own hat. He went down the steps and passed it and remembered again that it was his hat. The carriage waited for him two streets down. He stared uncertainly at the hat, then walked on. He couldn't think why Aidy would poison him. It rather aggrieved him. But he felt better now, walking. Things settled themselves. When he reached his brougham, his coachman got down quickly from the perch and held open the door. Cass and Devil tumbled out, plume tails wagging in. Elation. Christian leaned against the side of the carriage and allowed the dogs to jump a piece on him. He fondled their ears with one hand, called Devil back from sniffing along the coal holes in the sidewalk, and climbed inside. Cass lay down primly at Christian's feet, but Devil inserted a spotted nose beneath his glove and insinuated himself onto the seat. Christian stroked the setter's head. 
As the carriage pulled away, he reached up to take off his hat and found that he had. None. He rested his head back on the seat. Sutherland. Sutherland wanted satisfaction. Christian only wanted sleep. He flexed his right hand against the lingering, leaden weakness there. He thought drowsily that it was for once a convenient thing that he was left-handed, or he'd not be able to lift a pistol. Chapter 1 I V yet to fathom it. No doubt I never will. How canst thou expect any real consideration from a person of his? Archimedia Timms paused, searching for a suitable word. His ilk, Papa? Wilt thou pour me a cup of tea, Matty? Her father asked, in just the sort of amiable voice that left one with no room to start an effective argument. He is a duke, for one thing, she said over her shoulder, parting shot as she marched through the back dining room to locate Geraldine, since the parlor bell was in disorder. The time it took to find the maidservant, see water drawn and see to boil, and return to the parlor was not enough to make her forget the sequence of her thoughts. A duke can scarcely be supposed to care seriously for such matters, the square and above thy left hand, as must be perfectly clear when his integration has not been prepared for the past week. Thou shouldst not be impatient, Matty. This sort of thing must be done with infinite care. He is taking his time. Admire him for it. Her father's searching fingers found the carved wooden numeral two and slid it into place as an exponent of S. He is not taking his time, nor a bit of care. He is out and about the town, engaged in creaturely socializing. He has not the smallest regard for thy credit, nor his own. Her father smiled, gazing straight ahead as he searched out a multiplication sign and added it to the sequence of wooden. Letters and numbers on the red baize tablecloth in front of him, his fingers floating over the blocks to check each by touch. Knowest thou certain sure about the creaturely socializing, Maddie? One has only to read the papers. There is not a worldly function which he has not attended this entire spring. And your joint treat is scheduled to be introduced on third day evening. I shall have to be the one to cancel it, I know, for he won't think of it. President Milner will be most aggravated, and rightly so, for who is to take Jervox's place at the podium? Thou shalt write the equations upon the slate, and I shall be there to answer questions. If friend Milner will allow it, she said broodingly, he'll say that it's most irregular. No one will mind. We delight in thy presence every month, Matty. Thou hast always been welcome to attend. Friend Milner himself once told me that a lady's face brightens the meeting rooms considerable. Of course I attend. Should I let thee go alone? She looked. Up at the maidservant as the girl brought in the tray. Geraldine set the tea down, and Maddie poured her father a cup, touching his hand and guiding it gently to the saucer and handle. His fingers were pale and soft from all the years of indoor work his face still unlined in spite of his age. There had always been an air of abstraction about him, even before he'd lost his sight. Truthfully, the set habits of his life had not changed so much after the illness that had blinded him years ago, except that now he leaned on Maddie's arm when he went for his daily walk or two. The monthly meetings of the Analytical Society and used carved blocks and dictation in his mathematics instead of his own pen. Thou wilt he call on the Duke again today about the differentials? He asked. Maddie made a face, safe to do so when Geraldine had left. Yes, Papa, she said, keeping her vexation from her voice with an effort. I'll call on the Duke again. The first thing Christian thought of when he woke was the unfinished integration. He threw back the covers, evicting Cass and Devil from the bed, and shook his hand vigorously trying to rid himself of the pins and needles sensation caused by sleeping on it. The dogs whined at the door, and he let them. Out. The uncomfortable itchy numbness in his fingers was slow. To fade, he worked his fist as he poured chocolate and sat down in his dressing robe to leaf through the pages of Tim's ciphering and his own. It was easy to tell the difference. Tim's had a small, 
refined hand, a third the size of Christian's inverted scrawl. From his first day in the schoolroom, Christian had rebelled at the insistence on right-handed cursive and used his left, enduring the regular beatings across the offending palm with sullen silence, but it still embarrassed him to write when anyone could see him. This morning Tim's writing appeared so small that it even seemed hard to read. It swam on the page and gave Christian a headache trying to focus on it. Obviously, he was a little the worse for whatever brandy he'd consumed last night. He took up a quill, already trimmed. By his secretary to the special angle that Christian's ungraceful, upside-down hand posture required, and began to work, ignoring what had been written before. It was easy to lose himself in the bright, cool world of functions and hyperbolic distances. The symbols on the page might slide and quiver, but the equations in his head were like unfailing music. He blinked, screwed up his face against the pain that seemed to have settled around his right eye, and kept writing. By the time he'd calculated the last differential and thought to ring Calvin for a tray of breakfast, it felt as if he were waking from a trance to look up and recognize his own bedroom with its palladian columns flanking the bed, its plaster frieze and wainscoting, and the blue-patterned wallpaper selected by some lady whose name he did not at the moment recollect. Thinking of ladies, however, brought a pleasant thought of eighty, and he told Calvin to have a single orchid sent to her before tea. As you say, Your Grace, the butler bowed slightly. Mr. Durham and Colonel Fane are below. They've been waiting to speak to you for some time. Shall I tell them that Your Grace is not at home this afternoon? Do I look as if I'm not at home? He stretched out his legs and sat back in the chair, crossing his ankles as he glanced at the clock. By God, it's already half past one. How long have they been down there? Send em up, man. Send em up. He didn't bother to make himself presentable for Durham and Fane, two older and easier friends he couldn't have. Rubbing his head against the persistent sharp pressure, he just lay back in the chair, closing his eyes for a moment. Egad, what v we got here? Hen scratching again? Durham's lazy voice sounded faintly surprised. At a time like this, you're a regular iceberg, ain't you? Christian opened his eyes and closed them again. Lord save us, it's the clergy. Just in time. You look as if you're ready for the last rites, old fellow. Oh, do you actually know them? Christian lifted one eyelid. I could look em up. Anything for you, Chef Durham still affected Brummel's style in voice and clothing eleven years after the beau had fled his creditors to France but with blonde hair and decided movements as a burnished counterpoint to the die-away ears. The morbid dress was his only concession to his reverend calling, and Christian his only sponsor in it the Dukes of Gervalk's holding, among twenty-nine other clerical appointments, the advowson for the living at St. Matthew's upon Glade, a bounteous ecclesiastical benefice which Christian had seen fit to bestow on his friend. And a particularly obliging favor it had been, too, considering Dome's diverting lack of the character attributes generally required of a rector. Fane and the dogs followed him in, devil squeezing past. Fane's boots as the guardsmen entered blazing in gold lace and scarlet regimentals and twirling a top hat on his finger. He tossed the hat in Christian's direction. Sutherland conveys that to you. Christian caught it. He pushed Devil's forepaws off his lap. The deuce you say. Sutherland? They claimed you left it on his doorstep last night. Who claimed? Well, who do you think? Fane dropped himself into a chair, scowling. His bloody seconds, that's who claimed. Christian grinned in spite of his headache. What ho, is he back in town? He's called me out already? Plague take you, Chev. Nobody thinks it's funny, Durham said. Sutherland's the very devil of a shot. Fane stroked Cassie's head and then picked a black dog hair off his red coat. He wants it tomorrow morning. Up to you, of course. Pistols, we reckoned, but you might consider sabers, in Sutherland's case. Christian closed his eyes and opened them. The headache was drowning him, 
he couldn't even think properly. Damned unlucky, meeting him in his own hall that way, Fane added grimly. I'll swear he didn't have a clue about you. And L.A. Sutherland. Just plain dumb dog luck, that's all it was. You'd think this silly bastard would want to keep it quiet, wouldn't you? Just what does he suppose is to come of killing you if he can manage it? A long trip to the continent, or a hanging if he's slow to bolt. By God, Chev, I'll rat on him myself if he kills you. Christian frowned at Fane uneasily. He thought this must be some elaborate jest, which he was in no mood to take. But... Nobody was smiling, and Fane looked downright ugly, his jaw set hard. Sutherland seconds called on you this morning? Christian asked tentatively. Cards came at eight. Durham waved his hand. Nine o'clock, they were on my stair at Albany. He's frothing at the bit, Jervalks. He wants blood. They said I was in his house. Weren't you? Christian stared at his toes. He could not, when he thought of it, recall much of anything about last night. God. I must have been roaring drunk. Durham blew a harsh breath. Egad, Jervalks, do you say you don't remember? Christian shook his head slightly. He didn't feel as if he'd been drinking. He didn't remember starting to drink. He had this headache, and his hand, he just felt strange. Hell, Durham said, and sat down in a chair. What a bundle. Doesn't matter. Christian pressed his fingers against the bridge of his nose. Tomorrow, he wants it? Tomorrow's too soon. When? I'm giving a paper tomorrow night. It'll have to be Wednesday morning. Giving a paper? Fane echoed. A mathematical paper. The colonel just gazed at him. A paper, Fane, Christian said patiently. With words on it, by which a message of importance is conveyed. Do you ever read in the army? Sometimes, Fane said. Chev's a regular Isaac Newt, you know. Durham leaned back and crossed his legs. Though you'd never think it to see him, would you? You look like hell, Jervalks. I feel like it, Christian said. He caressed Devil's throat with his left hand and sighed. Damn it all. And I just sent her a bloody orchid. Asterisk, 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 the white, elegant, new-built town house in Belgrave Square was an affront to Maddie. Everything about the Duke of Jervalx was an affront to her. As a born and raised member of the Society of Friends, she supposed that she ought to have a concern for his state of grace, casting his life away upon dancing and gambling and leisure, as he was doing. But in honest truth, her divine inner light did not seem to be much interested in his spiritual condition. Rather, she felt an all-too-earthly antagonism toward the man. Under commonplace circumstances, she would not have expended any thought at all upon him. Indeed, Maddie had never so much as heard of the Duke of Jervalx until he had begun, for his own perverse reasons, writing letters to the Journal of the London Analytical Society, and hence come to occupy such a large and invisible place in the Tim's little house in Chelsea. She had always read every word of the journal to her father, and of course it was she who had written out, to dictation, the reply to the Duke's published letter inquiring into Papa's monograph upon the solution of equations of the fifth degree. That had been in first month. It was now almost sixth month, with the window boxes full of sweet peas and late tulips making a scarlet splash against pale walls, and Maddie had long since become a regular caller in Belgrave Square. Not that she ever saw Jervalks himself. She had not once laid eyes upon the man. The Duke would not, of course, wait upon a Quaker female of plain and modest standing such as herself, nor attend the meetings of the Analytical Society in person. He had much more aristocratic and questionable ways of spending his time than that. No, Archimedia Timms presented herself at the door of his noble house with a copy of her father's latest work, lettered with painstaking accuracy in. Maddie's hand, upon receipt of which the butler Calvin escorted.
her into an alcove off the breakfast parlor and offered her chocolate, took away her papa's careful proposals, and left her sitting there, sometimes for three hours and a half at a time, waiting to see if the butler would return with a note and several sheets covered in casually luxurious slashes of the pen, rows of equations written as if the letters and numbers and arcs were an aesthetic rather than a mathematical effort. Much more often than not, all that Calvin returned with was the Duke's promise that his contribution would be ready the next day. And when she called the next day, the promise was for the next, and the next, until she lost all patience with the man. On top of that was Papa's quiet but rising excitement over what he and Jervox were working toward. Mathematics was her father's entire life, the irrefutable proof of a theorem the whole goal of his existence not for the personal fame of such an accomplishment, but for the love of the science itself. He thought the Duke a miracle, an amazing blessing upon his life and geometry and the earth in general, and anticipated the man's irregular communications with endless patience. In truth, Mattie feared that she was a little jealous. The way Papa's face lit up when she finally returned with one of Jervox's new sets of equations and axioms, Papa's look of shock, and then deep nodding pleasure when she would read them out to him, and he discovered some particular innovation, some calculation that displayed his special finesse, well, it would not do to begrudge him that happiness, just because to her it was all nothing but an endless series of symbols, like a foreign language that one could read and pronounce, but not really understand. Some people were simply born to it, and Maddie, in spite of the felicitous hope that her father had expressed in naming her after Archimedes, was not one of them. The Duke of Jervox, however, was. He was also dissolute, reckless and extravagant, a gallant, a gambler, a womanizer, a patron of creaturely arts, painters and musicians and novelists, transparently referred to as the D. of J. in the scandal sheets, where he and his various exploits appeared with frequency. She had made it her business to find out about him. Not to put too fine a point upon it, he was a rake hell. It wouldn't have made any difference to Papa if the man had been a cowherd. The talent was all that mattered. But Jervox was a duke, a fact of which Maddie was reminded much more frequently than her Papa, to be precise, every time she sat awaiting Jervox's royal convenience in his breakfast alcove. And now, Having agreed two months ago to co-author this paper with her father and even condescending to offer to make the preliminary presentation himself at the monthly meeting of the Analytical Society, Jervox had apparently forgotten all about it and couldn't even be bothered to finish the last crucial step in the calculations. At least, she hoped he had forgotten, for she had a niggling fear that he might be playing some horrid joke upon her papa. Her worst nightmare was that Jervox would come to the analytical society with some of his shocking friends, perhaps under the influence of drink, bringing along unsavory women. To make her father and all the members of the society the object of public ridicule. She had no real reason to suspect that he would do so, but at best her papa was going to be painfully disappointed and embarrassed in front of his mathematical fellows by the duke's absence all on account of an aristocrat who was too indolent to live up to his commitments to anything but debauchery. For Jervox, this was a mere pastime. For her father, it was lifeblood itself. She marched up the steps beneath the portico of the white town house, almost of a mind to send in, along with her father's. Polite and diffident inquiry, a note to the duke containing her own sentiments. Despite the fact that she had never once discovered in her soul the boldness to stand up and speak out in the silence of her own meeting, she was quite certain that it would not frighten her in the least that he was a duke. It would not bother her at all to speak to him, an indication in itself, she felt, that what moved her met with God's full approval. On the grounds of the biblical spiritual equality of man, she felt that anything which might lay the duke's iniquities before him in a calm and convincing manner must only do him good. But Calvin was smiling as he ushered her in, and picked up a flat leather case from a table right in the hall. He held it out to her. To be presented to Mr. Timms, by means of Miss Archimedia Timms, with his grace's compliments, he said. The Duke has instructed me to impart to Mr. Timms that his 
Grace will be attending the meeting of the Analytical Society. Tomorrow night in the company of Sir Charles Milner, and looks with anticipation upon the forthcoming introduction. Maddie took the satchel into her hand. Oh, she said. He finished. Calvin made no sign of noticing her surprise, but stood with his head tilted expectantly toward the breakfast room. Would you like chocolate, miss? Chocolate? Maddie gathered her thoughts. No. Indeed, I won't be stopping. I must convey this to my father directly. As you say, Mississippi. Such a sudden and unexpected attention to his promise by the heedless duke left Maddie rather at a stand, and somehow more vexed than pleased. Odious man, to tumble everyone into a topsy-turvy state of suspense, and then think that he could put all to rights merely by consorting with President Milner and finishing the differentials at the very last moment. Plainly I tell thee, friend, she said in the stern accents she'd prepared to use to the duke himself. I hope that Jervolks has sufficiently prepared his discourse. I'm afraid there won't be time now for my father to offer any help. Calvin gave her a bland look. His grace made no mention of anticipating Mr. Tim's counsel. He put an emphasis upon the honorific, as he always did, which Maddie understood perfectly well was meant to convey his disapproval of her plain speech calling of Jervolks by the title of his temporal office. Maddie didn't give a fig for that she would have gone further and called him by his surname as an unpretentious Quaker. Would call anyone else had she happened to know what it was. She stood still a moment, tapping her foot silently and quickly beneath her skirt. May I speak with him? I regret to say that his grace is not at home. Maddie's foot tapped harder. I see. How unfortunate. Thou mayst convey my father's thanks to him, in that case. She took the case under her arm and turned down the steps. Christian lay on the bed, with the cloth saturated in some evil. Smelling camphor across his eyes. He grunted when he heard Calvin's scratch at the door. Miss Archimedia Timms has called, your grace. She took the papers with her. Good. There was a moment of silence. It would not require the physician a quarter hour to come, Calvin said, if I were to send for him, your grace. I don't need a dash sawbones. It'll go off in a minute or two. Christian swallowed. His butler made an assenting mumble. The closing door clicked behind him. Christian dragged the musty cloth off his face and tossed it to the floor. He pressed his arm over his eyes and arched his head back wondering if he was going to die of a damned headache before Sutherland ever got a chance at him. Chapter 2 The third day evening meeting of the Analytical Society was a thundering success. For the Timses, it began early in the afternoon, with the arrival of a powdered and liveried footman at the door of their modest house in Upper Shane Row, bearing a note penned in that arresting style of handwriting favored by the Duke of Jervalks. He would send a vehicle to convey Mr. Timms to the meeting rooms, if that would be agreeable, at the hour of half-past eight o'clock. And at the conclusion of the meeting, he would be honored if Mr. Timms and his daughter would join him and Sir Charles Milner for late supper in Belgrave Square, after which he would see that they were delivered safely home in his own carriage. Papa! Maddie said in horror, keeping her voice to a fierce whisper in order that the footman outside the parlor door should not overhear. We cannot. Can we not? Her papa inquired. I shouldn't think it. Would be possible to attend the meeting at all, in that case, for. What excuse can we offer to refuse to sup with Jervalks afterward? She flushed a little. It will be nothing but vain leisure and idle talk. He is a bad man. I know thou admirest his science, but his moral character is, it is abysmal. I suppose so, he said reluctantly. But shall we be the first to cast stones? I rather doubt we would be the first. With a little flick, she tossed the duke's note toward the fire. The fine, heavy paper fell short, making a faint chime as it hit the brass fender. It is not throwing stones, merely to wish not to associate with the... 
Ma'am. Her father turned toward the sound of the note, and then focused on her voice. It's but one evening. Thou mayst go. I shall come home as soon as the meeting is over. Maddie? Papa had a half frown upon his face. Art thou frightened of him? Indeed not. Why should I be? I thought perhaps he has done nothing to impose upon thee. Maddie gave a delicate humph. Yes, he has. He has kept me waiting for hours at a stretch in his silly breakfast alcove. I can describe the wallpaper to thee in exquisite detail. It is a trellis pattern of green on white, with a rose mallow pictured at alternating intersections, consisting of sixteen petals and three leaves, with a yellow center. Her papa's brow cleared. I feared he might have said something untoward to thee. He has never said anything at all to me, for the simple reason that he has never seen me. But thou mayst take my word that he is all that is worst in the aristocracy. Profligate. Licentious and godless. We are plain people who have no business dining with him. Her father sat silent for a long moment. Then he lifted his brows and said wistfully, But I wish for us to dine with him, Maddie. His fingers toyed with a wooden Y, twirling it round and round on the red baize. The oil lamp at his elbow was unlit in the dim north light of a cloudy afternoon the lack of illumination irrelevant to her father. She pressed her fists together and rested her chin on them. Oh, Papa! Shouldst thou mind very much, Matty girl? She sighed. Without saying more, she opened the door to inform the lingering footman that they would accept the Duke's invitation to supper. In order to hide her discontent, she left her father to go upstairs and lay out his meeting coat and shirt and arrange the items necessary to shave him. Then she went to her own wardrobe. Before Jervox's message, she had planned to wear her gray silk, as befitted a special occasion. She was torn now. Between the corrupt desire to dress up in a manner that would demonstrate that she and her father dined out regularly with dukes and the urge to dress down and appear as if supping in Belgrave Square held no more appeal to her than did rooting about in a dustbin. In addition to the depravity involved in dressing as if one commonly consorted with noble rakes, certain material restrictions made themselves apparent as she perused the dark recess of her clothes closet. Her family was not of the gayest orders among friends. They had always kept to plain dress and plain speech. The steel-gray silk, with its wide, stark, white cotton collar, comprised the zenith of her wardrobe. Fashioned as the gown was upon strictly pious lines, with the elevated, out-of-date waistline, it held little hope of masquerading as anything more than what it was, a simple Quaker lady's best morning dress for years old. She eyed her black, the one she kept for tasks such as nursing and marketing. It was neat and proper, but visibly shabby at the elbows. It would not do to have Papa's associates at the society think that she cared nothing for the importance of the occasion. In the end, she decided on the silk. And to emphasize her personal opinion of the duke's licentious behavior, she removed the white collar, leaving only the unadorned V-neckline. Although there were no looking glasses in the house, she was satisfied when she held the altered gown up before her that, with its complete lack of ornament, it was of sufficient austerity. What to do with her hair presented another dilemma. The Starch sugar scoop bonnet she always wore seemed too ordinary for the occasion. Her mother, having undergone convincement to the friend's faith and forfeited contact with her own family upon marriage, had still passed along to her daughter a few of the ways of society. Maddie thought that some little acknowledgement of the special nature of the mathematical meeting was really a requirement. She decided to rebraid her hair. Just combing it out was no small task. It had never been cut her mother's, and now Maddie's, only worldly vanity, growing as long as the back of her knees. After she'd braided it and coiled it around the top of her head, on a whim, she searched out a small box from the bottom of her chest and held up her mother's pearls. She could not bring herself to be quite so daring as to wear jewelry openly around her neck, 
but after a little thought and some experimentation, she found that they just circled the base of the crowning braid, an exact fit. She rather thought that the jewelry didn't show at all, which seemed a comfortable compromise between heathenism and zealotry. But as she came downstairs at quarter past eight after seeing her father suitably dressed, she had a sudden loss of nerve. She was afraid the pearls must look silly, and there was no one to ask but Papa or Geraldine, either of whom could reasonably be expected to give any dependable advice. Maddie was holding up the silver teapot, trying without success to see herself in the rounded reflection, when her father's slow steps sounded on the stairs. A brisk knock came simultaneously at the door, and she had to rush to the top of the kitchen stair to call Geraldine, as the bell was still in disorder in spite of the landlord's express promise to have it repaired by this afternoon. Then, between seeing that her father descended safely down the stairs and keeping an eye on the footman as he helped Papa into the shining black town chariot, ornamented only by a crest on the door, consisting of a white phoenix surrounded by six golden fleur de lis on a blue ground, she found herself suddenly confronted with the footman's bow and offered hand. She had nothing to do but take it. The lecture room of the Royal Institution in Albemarle Street, a vast semicircle with rising, cushioned benches able to seat nine hundred, was not often very well filled for the meetings of the Analytical Society. Those interested in and able to comprehend the philosophy of pure mathematics espoused by the society were passionate but few, tending to cluster in the first four rows in the center, around the podium, leaving the rest of the room to echoing darkness. As the carriage drew up in Albemarle Street, however, the pavement was quite crowded with gentlemen waiting to enter the institution. Maddie had a horrible moment of fearing that they had arrived on the wrong night. But no, here was President Milner himself rotund and cheerful, stepping up to the carriage door, giving her papa his support down to the curb. Maddie followed, and the crowd on the sidewalk and stairs nodded and doffed their hats, stepping aside to allow passage. Your servant, Miss Timms. We'll just pop into the reading. Room, friend Milner said, looking over his shoulder as he guided her papa into the hall. The Duke's there. He's very anxious to meet you both. Maddie suppressed a snort, doubting very much whether the Duke felt any emotion of the kind. She fell behind a moment in the crowded hall, hesitating amid the disorder outside the cloakroom until a polite gentleman, one of the regular society members, took her wrap for her. Who are all these people? She whispered to him. I believe they've come to see the mathematical Duke. Maddie made a quick face. Is that something like the learned pig? He chuckled and took her hand. Convey my best wishes to Mr. Timms. I'm looking forward to this lecture. Maddie nodded and turned away. It would be just like Jervalk's, she thought, to turn everything into a circus. She should have expected it. Her poor papa was going to be a laughingstock. At the closed door of the reading room she paused, thinking for a distracted moment of the pearls in her hair. No one seemed to have taken any particular notice of them. She put her hand to the braid, to make certain they hadn't fallen loose. They were still there. She felt as if they must make her look a rather foolish and eccentric old maid, which she supposed that she was, actually, a Quaker, one of the peculiar people, made even more so by the vain addition of pearls to her tightly braided hair. The thought gave her an odd spurt of amusement. At herself, what a picture she must make to this dissolute duke. Well, so be it then. She'd give him a shock. He'd probably never had to dine with the likes of Archimedia Timms. With a faint smile at the corners of her lips, she pushed open the door. At the far end of the dimly lit room, her papa sat in his low round, broad-brimmed hat at one of the tables where the day's newspapers had been shoved aside to make a large space. President Milner was absent. The other man seated there in the pool of candlelight was bent over a sheaf of papers with an intensity that Maddie had last seen in the students she helped. Teach at the first day school. His elbows were spread, straining the tailoring of his midnight blue evening coat across broad shoulders, and as she came closer, he pushed back his dark hair impatiently with one hand 
giving an excellent impression of some wild poet laboring in a garret over his art. Suddenly, before she reached them, he threw down the pen and rose to face her in one swift motion, for all the world as if he wished to hide what he'd been doing. He looked at her for an instant, and then smiled. The fervent student, the impassioned poet, both vanished in that seasoned gallantry. Miss Timms, he said in just the way a duke would say it, calmly, with a slight bow. His eyes were dusky blue, his nose straight and strong, his clothing perfectly tailored and his bearing well-bred, and somehow, in spite of this polished veneer, he managed very well to resemble a complete and utter pirate. Precisely as one had expected, although somewhat less decayed, in a physical sense, by his way of life than might have been supposed. He gave the impression of a firmly controlled energy, with nothing dilatory or degenerated about him, no softness at all to his solid and imposing frame. Next to him, her father looked fatally pale, as if he might dissolve into a wisp and vanish at any moment. My daughter Archimedia, Papa said. Maddie, this is the Duke of Jervalx. He pronounced it entirely differently from the way they'd been saying it, as if it began with an S-H and didn't rhyme. With talks, at all, but instead with a sound like, Ho! She felt exceedingly provincial, realizing that their habitual, Jervox, wasn't even remotely correct and recalling with mortifying clarity the number of times she must have mispronounced it to his butler. She sincerely hoped they had friend Milner to thank for the information, and not Jervox himself. She offered her hand to shake, abstaining from a salutation or curtsy, or even a nod, as befitted a plain person and a friend. She'd been brought up to shun such mumbling customs as saying, Good evening, for to wish someone a good day when he was in an evil day was to offend God and the truth. Nor could she say that she was happy to make the Duke's acquaintance as that would have been another untruth, so she settled for the universal address of Friend. His greeting was not so spare. It's my wholehearted pleasure to be at your service, mademoiselle. He caught her. Hand and lifted it briefly, lowering his eyes, then released her. I must apologize to Miss Archimedia for all the hours I find I've kept her cooling her heels in my house. I've been cursed with a headache these past two days. Maddie wondered what his excuse was for all the days before that, but Papa only said, I hope thou hast recovered, with every evidence of real concern. Her father always told the truth, so of course he would believe the man, poor naive Papa. Quite recovered. The Duke grinned and winked at Maddie as if they were some sort of conspirators together. Miss Archimedia had her doubts, I know. Her father smiled. Yes, she's in a great quake over whether thou lt shame me beyond holding my head up on third nights ever again. Papa! At that moment, President Milner scratched at the door and came in, spreading his arms and whisking his hands like an enthusiastic shoer of chickens. Miss Timms, Mr. Timms, it's time. Come and be seated, and then the Duke and I shall take our places in front. I'll need Miss Timms the duke said, catching her arm as she started toward her papa. If you would. He looked into her eyes. It was, Maddie knew instantly, the kind of look he must use on those women who fell willingly under his influence and into his arms. Even she, who at twenty-eight had only been courted once, by a very conventional doctor who had accepted her refusal with painful regret and then engaged himself to a Jane Hutton and left the Quaker meeting within the half-year. Even Maddie could identify that intense and faintly questioning. Glance and sense the kind of power it was meant to wield. Therefore, when he only held out the sheaf of papers toward her and asked if she would transcribe the equations on the slate for him as he spoke, it was something of an anticlimax. She looked down at the papers. Thou dost not wish to do it. The slate is just behind the podium. Most of the speakers, I don't, he said flatly. Come, come. Mr. Milner had the door open, admitting the low rumble from the lecture room. Let us all go at once, then. Mr. Timms? It was Jervox himself who took her father's arm, 
guiding him into the hall and down the steps to the first seat. The president waved Maddie on up to the row of stiff-backed chairs on the podium. The duke followed her, their steps loud and hollow on the wooden platform. He made a gentle adjustment of her chair as she sat and flicked back his coattails in an elegant, relaxed way as he took the place beside her. The hall quieted as President Milner stepped up to the lectern, turning the shade of the little gas lamp and clearing his throat. Maddie gazed out at the wash of faces, each one underlined by a white collar that seemed to float in a background of uniform black. She'd attended many meetings, of the analytical society and the friends both, occupying a seat in the back benches with her papa, but never had she sat in front of any sort of audience before, let alone one so large. She told herself that everyone was attending to the president, who'd called the meeting to order and begun introducing the paper and describing her father as co-author, but it was easy to recall how one's mind and eyes wandered as a spectator. Several of the gentlemen in the first few rows were most definitely looking past President Milner, at herself or the Duke, she couldn't be certain, but she felt agonizingly exposed in her plain silk and pearls. She felt acutely aware, too, of how real and solid and inescapably large Jervalk seemed sitting next to her, in Midnight Blue, his white-gloved hands clasped in his lap, not a bit of quiver or restlessness in them, which made Maddie force herself to stop the squeezing and unsqueezing of her own fingers. He seemed very certain of himself quite easy and oblivious of the weight of attention focused on him as President Milner expressed the honor felt by the gathered company in having such a luminary as Christian Richard Nicholas Francis Langland, his grace the Duke of Jervaux, Earl of Langland and Viscount Glade, condescend to address the London Analytical Society this night. The Duke rose to applause. He carried no notes, having handed the papers to Maddy. She might have known that he would have a talent for speaking in a pleasant, relaxed voice, which nevertheless carried as he announced gravely that this lecture was dedicated to the memory of his late tutor, Mr. Peoples, an estimable, learned man, a credit to his profession, worthy of his pupil's everlasting regard and respect, and the Duke really was sincerely sorry about the dead smelt in the lesson book. They all laughed, even her papa. It pained Jervalks, the memory of that smelt, and somehow the smelt led to the page of the book it had adorned, and that page led to the parallel postulate of Euclid, and differential geometry, and then amid the lingering chuckles from some obscure jest about his passion for examining into the allure of certain irresistible curved surfaces, he was turning to nod expectantly at her. Maddie jumped to her feet, took up the chalk and began filling the big slate. She was accustomed to the Duke's handwriting, but it was difficult to decipher at the best of times. She dared not make any mistakes now, bending her entire concentration to transcribing correctly the order of equations and copying the circles and the lines that transected them. Endless hours of work with her papa had given her a knack for following the sequence under consideration. She listened for certain series as Jervalk spoke of them, judging when to proceed to the next formula and erase the last to gain more room. She only faltered once, lingering too long on a page, until Jervox's pause when he turned toward the slate cued her to her error. She hastily scrubbed off five equations and scribbled out the top half of the Duke's next page. When she reached the last of his notes, she was ahead of him. He was still describing the progression of the proof several steps back. But as Maddie finished copying the final equation, adding a flourish to the integral between zero and R out of pure relief, and immediately sat down, a rustle began to grow within the audience. Jervox kept speaking. Slowly, gentlemen in the audience began to stand up, one, then another, then by twos and threes and fives, all gazing at the slate. Someone started to clap. Others took it up. A rumble developed into a reverberation as more and more stood. The clapping became applause, and the applause rose to a roar, drowning out words. The Duke stopped speaking. Amid the resounding acclaim, he looked back at Maddie with a grin and made a little motion. Behind the podium toward her papa, 
but Mr. Milner was already escorting him up onto the floor. The vigor and sound of the ovation doubled. The gentlemen began stamping their feet, making the room vibrate with noise. Maddie stood up, taking Papa's hand to squeeze it in delight. He patted the back of her palm, and the little quivering smile at the corners of his lips, the exhilaration in his face, was something Maddie had not seen since the day her mother had died six years. Ago. Pure energy boomed around them, a tangible throb of. Tribute. Jervalks reached out and shook her father's hand, holding on to it when Papa refused to let go. The Duke inclined his head a little, with a half-embarrassed smile. A look, if Maddie could have brought herself to believe it, that spoke almost of shyness. For an instant one might nearly imagine him an eager and awkward boy, full of innocent enthusiasm, and then he turned to her and lifted her hand, bending over it with a glance into her eyes that was completely a schooled and experienced man's, a suggestive intimacy that would mark a rogue at fifty. Paces He leaned close to her ear, using her hand to hold her so near that she could feel the warmth of him and breathe the faint whiff of sandalwood. What do you think, Miss Archimedia? he said, just loud enough to be heard above the din. Maddie took a step back, pulling away. What have we done? What have you done? President Milner bellowed. Proved a geometry outside Euclid, M. girl. Burst the parallel. Postulate. A whole new universe. By God, if this is as flawless as it looks to be. He clapped Papa and the Duke both upon the back shouting amid the clamor. The pair of you are wizards. My men! Wizards! The credit must all go to thee, friend. Papa repeated yet again. Maddie had counted six times. This one was the seventh. Verily it must. Jervalk shook his head and took a sip of wine. Nonsense, Mr. Timms. He smiled wickedly. You're going to do the hard part. Write the paper. The four of them sat at a round table in the bay window of a lovely, cozy room overlooking the darkened square. Maddie had never penetrated this far into the Duke's house before. The blue chintz and comfortable chairs surprised her. She had not thought a bachelor would be able to make such a warm home for himself. He looked bachelor enough, though, having pushed his chair back from the cleared table for room to stretch his legs dangling his wine glass by negligent fingers at the rim. Maddie sat primly in her seat, taking only indirect glances round the room to see how it was fitted up. Papa was flushed and contented, a little abstracted, as if he still could not believe that the peak moment of the evening were true, when the Duke of Jervalx, over an exotic and delicious creation of fish and asparagus, had casually asked if her father would consider taking the mathematical chair at the new college that he and his political associates were organizing, where there would be no religious tests for entry, but only the express purpose of educating adult students in the whole field of modern knowledge. It came as something of a jolt to realize that the Duke might actually be a supporter of a worthy cause. But indeed, he was so intelligent and persuasive upon the topic and so committed that even friend Milner, who was a high church Tory if Maddie had ever seen one, and who had initially been quite cross when the Timses had addressed him as friend, instead of Sir Charles, although he had grown used to it in time, even friend Milner had his initial doubts turned to enthusiasm and recommended Papa consider the proposition seriously. Papa, Maddie could see, had gone far beyond consideration and plunged ahead into cheerful daydreams. And indeed, when the Duke mentioned the endowment that he had already pledged in support of the mathematical chair, Maddie herself felt a bloom of encouragement. It would be unwelcome to have a gazetted rake as a patron, but there need not be more than restricted intercourse, if any at all. She entertained visions of a house large enough to have a garden, and a parlor bell that was always in order. In the midst of these pleasant fancies, friend Milner excused himself to smoke. He left the door ajar. Within moments, the brisk clip of dog paws on a polished floor heralded the entrance of a setter, its silky white coat flung about with black spots, as if a can of dark paint had been scattered over it. 
with no more than a sideways glance at the duke, the animal bounded straight to Maddie and cast itself upon her lap, four legs spread across her skirt, and spotted pink nose stretched to lick her chin. Devil! The stern command caused the dog to look inquiringly round at Jervalx, wagging its tail without removing its feathered front legs from Maddie's lap. She smiled and rubbed its ears. What a bad dog, she murmured under her breath, as if it were a secret between them. What a very bad dog thou art. Devil returned adoring brown eyes to hers, grinning widely at this accusation. Another growled order from the duke made the spotted head sink. With an apologetic wrinkle of his brow, Devil subsided backward onto the floor. Jervalx gave the animal a protracted stare. After a moment, Devil's tail drooped, and he took himself from the room with the most dejected and dragging aspect. His master, Heartless, stood up and shut him out. The eviction of Devil left a lull in the room. Maddie stared. Ahead of her at the snowy tablecloth as the duke receded. Himself with a brief apology. She had a notion that Jervalks would think the Timses very unpolished. There were so many silences that he and friend Milner had been obliged to fill up. Maddie was not accustomed to idle talk. As a child she had labored too hard to school herself in the biblical injunction. Let your words be few. To find it easy to chatter now. She enjoyed dogs, but had never owned one, nor known any but mongrels, so she had no discourse to offer on the topic to someone like Jervalks who most probably was a famous breeder or some such thing and would think her sadly uninformed. She would have liked very much to inquire into the expense of the pretty fabric that covered the chairs, but held her tongue on that. Plain Quaker homes had no such creaturely baubles as printed chintz upholstery or paintings on display on all the walls. The only picture in the Tim's house was a rather awkward painting of a slave ship approved by the elders as a reminder of the sufferings of their fellow man. As she was gazing at an ornately framed still life hung over a music stand, with the surprisingly demure theme of rough-cut lilac stems thrown down beside a clutch of robin's eggs, Jervalx spoke. How long ago did you lose your sight, Mr. Timms? he asked. Maddie stiffened a little in her chair, surprised by such a pointed personal question. But her papa only said mildly, Many years. Almost fifteen, would it be, Maddie? Eighteen, Papa, she said quietly. Ah. He nodded. And thou hast been my blessing every one of them, Maddie girl. Jervalk sat relaxed, resting his elbow on the chair arm, his jaw propped on his fist. You haven't seen your daughter since she was a child then, he murmured. May I describe her to you? She was unprepared for such a suggestion, or for the light of interest that dawned in her father's face. Her objection died forming as Papa said, Wilt thou? Wilt thou indeed? Jervalks gazed at Maddie. As she felt her face growing hot, his smile turned into that unprincipled grin, and he said it. Would be my pleasure. He tilted his head, studying her. We've made her blush already, I fear a very delicate blush, the color of clouds, I think. The way the mist turns pink at dawn, do you remember what I mean? Yes, her father said seriously. Her face is dignified, but not quite stern. Softer than that, but she has a certain way of turning up her chin that might give a man pause. She's taller than you are, but not unbecomingly tall. It's that chin, I think, and a very upright, quiet way she holds herself. It gives her presence. But she only comes to my nose, so she must be a good five inches under six foot one, he said judiciously. She appears to me to be healthy, not too stout nor thin. An excellent frame. Rather like a good milk cow. Maddie exclaimed. And there goes the chin up, Jervalk said. She's perhaps a little more the color of a light claret now that I've provoked her. All the way from her throat to her cheeks, even a little. Lower than her throat, but she's perfectly pale and soft below. That, as far as I can see. Maddie clapped her hand over the V-neck of her gown, 
suddenly feeling that it must be entirely too low cut. Papa. She looked to her father, but he had his face turned downward and a peculiar smile on his lips. Her hair, Jervalk said, is tarnished gold where the candlelight touches it and where it doesn't. Richer, more like the light through a dark ale as you pour it. She has it braided and coiled around her head. I believe she thinks that it's a plain style, but she doesn't realize the effect. It shows the curve of her neck and her throat, and makes a man think of taking it down and letting it spread out over his hands. Thou art unseemly. Her father chided in a mild tone. My apologies, Mr. Timms. I can hardly help myself. Shall we proceed to her nose? That we shall call a nose of character. I don't think we can call it perfect. It's a little too aquiline for that. A decided nose. A maiden lady's nose. It goes with the tilt of the chin. But her eyes. I'm afraid her eyes ruin the spinster effect again, most emphatically. And her mouth. She has a pensive, a very pretty mouth, that doesn't smile overly often. He took a sip of wine. But then again, let's be fair. I've definitely seen her smile at you, but she hasn't favored me at all. This serious mouth might have been insipid, but instead it goes with the wonderful long lashes that haven't got that silly debutante curl. They're straight, but they're so long and angled down that they shadow. Her eyes and turn the hazel to gold, and she seems as if she's looking out through them at me. No. He shook his head sadly. Miss Timms, I regret to tell you that it isn't a spinster effect at all. I've never had a spinster look out beneath her lashes at me the way you do. In his house, at his table, she felt that she could not say precisely what she thought of him and his spinsters. Besides that, her father appeared enraptured. Maddie, he whispered, Thou hast thy mother's look. Of course, Papa, she said helplessly. Has no one ever told thee? No. No one ever did. He said it without any particular emotion. But by the candlelight she could see that his eyes had tears in them. Papa, she said, reaching for his hand. He only brushed it and then lifted his fingers, touching her face. He explored her slowly, intently, over her cheeks and across her eyelashes. She held her hands locked tight, embarrassed and suddenly close to foolish tears herself. She had never thought of it. She could have sat and let her father envision her with his touch in this way any time. He looked so happy. It was just that life went on, an everyday thing, and one never considered that Papa had not seen her face for eighteen years, or might wish to. I thank thee, friend, her father said, turning his face toward the duke. I thank thee, for one of the finest days of my life. Jervalx didn't answer. He didn't even seem to have heard, but sat gazing into the shadowed folds of the tablecloth, his dark blue eyes meditative, and his pirate mouth turned grim. Chapter 3 No pink tinged the dawn fog in the way he described last night. Rather poetic of him, Christian had thought, but in reality everything was only whitish gray, the grass wet and dark, voices uncanny and sharp in the early silence. He could hear his own even breathing as he took the pistol from the case Durham offered and sighted down the slender barrel. He didn't think he was going to die this morning. He wasn't going to kill anyone that was certain. Being guilty as the devil in this affair, his only honorable course was to stand fire and then delope. He'd shoot into the air. So, Sutherland might hit him. Likely would. But Christian didn't think he was going to die. He found it distantly amusing that he was so sure of that. He was old enough to know better. A decade and a half ago, the first time he'd stood up at the fire-eating age of seventeen, he might have been excused for believing himself invincible. But now he looked around at the brightening sky and the new leaves, and still his heart said it was impossible that this was the last moment. 
wounding was nothing to look forward to. He chose not to think ahead about it. He could feel his heart's rhythm rising as he walked out onto the ground without looking at Sutherland beside him. They stood up and paced off. Christian held the pistol in his right hand, there being no need for accuracy. It gave a better. Appearance. Those who knew him would see that he'd had no intention of firing on Sutherland from the start. Durham's languid voice called halt and turn. Christian turned. Sutherland had his pistol raised already. Christian realized that there was murder in his opponent's face. The man intended execution. He had the skill to do it. Christian's pulse increased suddenly, a fear stud in his ears. Gentlemen, Durham said, lifting his handkerchief. Pain burst through Christian's skull, agony and strangeness. He stared at Sutherland, blinking twice, wondering why he hadn't heard the shot that hit him. Durham spoke again. Christian couldn't understand the words. Sutherland's face contorted. He was shouting something at Christian, and Christian couldn't understand that either, but Sutherland was holding his gun at level ready still. Christian tried to lift his right arm. He squinted at Sutherland, trying to see through the way his vision seemed clear. And blurred at once, turning his face to the side to find his opponent. Durham spoke one word. From his fingers, the pale cloth dropped to the ground. Christian heard the shot and whistle, saw the drift of white from Sutherland's pistol and knew the man had missed. But Christian was falling while he was still standing up. His pistol dropped out of his hand. It went off with a blast as it struck the ground. Christian stood swaying, staring down, trying to see it. He'd been hit. Had he been hit? Durham and Fane came striding toward him. He felt that he was falling, over and over, but he never reached the ground. Their words babbled around him, meaningless. He tried to put out his right hand to lean on Fane's shoulder, but he couldn't lift it. When he looked down, it didn't even seem part of him. He could barely see. He tried to find the blood, couldn't find it, and gazed in bewilderment at his friends. What's wrong? he said. It came out, no. No, 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 no. Fane shook his head and grinned, thumping Christian on the back with a look of triumph. Durham was smiling. Christian grabbed the colonel's arm with his left hand. Fane, he said. What happened? No, 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 no. He heard himself. He closed his mouth in horror tried to form the right words, breathing hard through his teeth. Fane! he yelled. And they stared at him, because he still hadn't said it right. He gripped Fane's arm. Half of the other man's face seemed hazy to Christian, blurring off into the gray fog. His heart was a huge drum pounding in his ears. He wanted to let go of Fane, to press his hands over his eyes, but he couldn't command the move. He couldn't say anything at all. He could only pull himself close enough to put his weight on his friend's shoulder, with the world tipping and sliding away from him, the darkness. Rising up over his brain, coming in from the edges of his vision, taking it all, taking everything. The fineness of the morning could only add to the pleasure Maddie felt in the day. She strolled briskly along the King's Road and past the new construction in Eaton Square, even finding it in herself to admire the architecture of the mansions under construction, designed as they were in the style of the Duke's house in Belgrave Square. This morning, over breakfast, she and Papa had talked of nothing but the chair at the university to be. Jervalx had said it was to open its doors next year, under the admirable name of the University of London, but the professorships and preparations must begin much sooner, possibly as early as ninth month. A premises had already been taken in Gower Street, and Maddie thought that after she called in Belgrave Square, she might go on to Bloomsbury and look into any houses available there. For this call, she carried no sheets of figures, only a letter. That she and her father had composed together, thanking Jervalks for their supper and his kind attentions, 
and expressing unqualified praise for his excellent address before the society last night. After some debate, they had agreed on the proper degree of gratitude and enthusiasm to convey about the mathematics chair, Maddie being inclined to somewhat less effusion than her father, but well aware that an apparent lack of delight in the offer would be fatal. She turned the corner into the square and paused. Normally there were a few ragged persons loitering about the luxurious houses in hopes of stray coins, but just now a regular crowd of bystanders, very mixed in their appearance, milled around a green cookle in front of the duke's house. Maddie pressed her lips together. There was straw strewn in the street and the cookle, with its neat pair of greys, had much the look of a physician's rig. As she stood hesitating at the corner, a large coach, drawn by a team of blacks and emblazoned with a raised medallion sporting the full heraldic bearings and crest of the family, motto and all, came dashing round the far side of the square. The cluster of onlookers scattered, and the boy holding the cuckoo hurried the pair forward to make room as the coach rumbled to a halt before the door, even before the footman had jumped down off his perch to lower the steps. The carriage door was being pushed open from inside. An elderly lady groped for the footman's hand and came swiftly down, lifting up her black skirts and advancing with an agitated thrust of her cane. Maddie saw Calvin rush down the stairs to her side. He held her arm up the stairs, as a younger woman descended from the carriage. The footman supported her to the top of the stairs, where this second lady appeared to lose her strength entirely. She faltered and seemed to wilt against the servant. His arm came around her, bracing her into the house. The door slammed shut behind them. The little crowd stood about, murmuring. Maddie could not seem to think what to do. Her feet took her slowly forward. Step by step, as if her mind had relegated the decision to her body. At the edge of the group, leaning against the wrought iron. Rail that flanked the house, the crossing boy who usually swept the corner looked up at Maddie and gave her a nod of recognition. She stood uncertainly, and after a moment, he came up to her. Morning, Mississippi. Has you heard? She glanced up. The windows were all shaded ominously. And straw was spread in the street to muffle carriage wheels, as if there were serious illness in the house. No. I haven't heard. It's his grace, Mississippi shot. Shot? Maddie whispered. The boy nodded toward the coach. Family's been called, he said succinctly. Too late, Tom says. Tom's in the stables, saw. M go out before first light, saw his grace sprung back on a hurdle. Duel, Mississippi. Gone and killed him, Tom says. Dead when they carried him in. He shrugged. Still, there's the medical man here yet. Waiting for the family, I expect. Maddie stared up at the house, beyond words. The murmur of gossip subsided suddenly. They all stood listening to what? Had stifled it, the distant sound of a woman's shriek, a tearing. Rising note, the high-pitched keening moan of denial, cascading down to anguish. Maddie's throat went dry and closed. The wail broke off abruptly as if someone else had hushed it, and the people outside gave one another knowing looks. She gripped her hands together. She couldn't think. She didn't believe it. Last night, just last night, she had never seen anyone more fully alive, more vibrant with spirit and substance. A duel. A senseless, Futile exchange of shots. An instant, and all that life was gone. How could that be? Her mind balked at it. She had known him to be what he was, a rake, a reprobate. Before yesterday she would have said, Yes, I believe it, the Duke of Jervalx was shot and killed in a duel this morning. But now it shocked her into suspension, so that when she turned away, she didn't know where to go or what to do. She walked along blindly clutching her hands together. He'd known last night, of course. He'd sat there smiling at them, talking of geometry, describing her to her father. All the time, 
he known he was to go out and face this in a few hours. It was beyond the capability of her mind to grasp. She'd lost her mother and some friends, all to illness, all much older, not this sudden dizzying turn in reality. And his own mother, dear God, what she must feel. She was the second of the two ladies, Maddie was sure in her heart, remembering that faltering collapse at the door. Oh, she had perceived it already, had known before they told her, had given that terrible cry when she was sure. The other, in black, the elderly one who had gone in as if to a battle, it would be she who would show nothing, stand stiff and proud, grieving silently. Maddie felt somehow as if she should be there, offering what help she could to them. She found herself instead inside the door of her parlor, in her own little house. Her papa lifted his head, smiling. Home already, Maddie girl? Oh, papa, she said. His smile faded. He sat up. What is it? I hardly know, I don't. She gave a little dry moan, holding on to the doorknob. He's dead, papa. He was killed in a duel this morning. Her father sat very still, his hands poised over his wooden symbols. After a long, silent moment, he said, Dead. The word had a hollow sound. Maddie sank to her knees beside him, leaning her head in his lap. It is such a shock. His fingers rested on her hair. She hadn't put on her bonnet today. She wore her hair in the same braid she'd worn last night. He stroked lightly up and down the nape of her neck. He touched her cheek and caught the single tear that had escaped. Maddie lifted her head. I don't know why I'm, why I should be weeping. I didn't even like him. Didst thou not, Maddie girl? He asked softly. I did. He went on stroking her hair. She rested her cheek against his leg, staring off into the corner of the room. I can't believe it, she whispered. I just cannot seem to believe it. Chapter 4 Blythedale Hall looked to Maddie like a handsomely decorated cake, with soft salmon-colored bricks set off by straight pilasters and arched curves of pale stone frosting. Cousin Edward's new retreat included a large piece of Buckinghamshire countryside, with a rose garden heavy in tenth-month blossoms, a herd of fallow deer roaming the open park, and black swans gliding serenely on the lake, all legacies of the impoverished baronet who had sold it, and now carefully maintained for the calming and beneficiary effects upon Cousin Edward's patients. Papa's cousin Dr. Edward Timms supervised Blydale in the most modern and humane manner. Each of his charges had his own personal attendant. A wholesome restraint was imposed only in the most intractable cases and removed as quickly as practicable. He was dedicated to his work, describing the therapies and management in enthusiastic detail in between. Cutting up bacon for himself and inviting Papa to take another. Kipper or more coffee. Maddie could hear a woman crying, a most disturbing and audible sound, but Cousin Edward seemed not to notice it, and after a while it faded away. She sipped at her coffee, trying to arm herself for the tour ahead, her first view of the place and people, and a description of her position. Cousin Edward had assured her that the duties were of a supervisory nature, rather than heavy work. There would be an experienced attendant to serve Papa while she was occupied, and altogether it had seemed impossible to refuse Cousin Edward's invitation to come and assume his wife's managerial functions while she was confined with her third child, on the expectation that if all went satisfactorily, the post might become Maddie's permanently. The offer appeared especially propitious after the disappointment of the letter regarding the mathematical chair, from one Henry Brougham, regretting that the funds pledged by the Duke of Jervalks had been withdrawn and the chair endowed by another source, a gentleman who wished to remain anonymous but who preferred a different candidate to Mr. Timms. And verily, Buckinghamshire and Blythedale seemed perfect in the autumn morning, with sunlight warming the newly painted marigold yellow walls of the dining room sparkling off the silver and fine porcelain plate that had been surrendered by. 
the penniless baronet along with the paintings and furniture. The house smelled of fresh wax and new hangings. Nothing dismal had been allowed to remain, Cousin Edward pointed out. Everything was peaceful and pleasant, it far too sumptuous for Maddie's notion of Quakerly virtue. But the surroundings were fitted up to the well-bred tastes of Cousin Edward's patience. There was only that distant sound of weeping to mar the opulence, coming again through the closed doors like some lost and grieving daylight ghost. Shall we begin, cousin? The doctor wiped his mouth and lifted the bell at his elbow. Janey, call Blackwell to escort Mr. Tim's to the family drawing room. The maid curtsied, spreading her apron, and vanished. Papa's aide arrived a moment later, the whole procedure a clockwork silence. After Maddie had seen him off, Cousin Edward escorted her to his office on the first floor. The mail. He nodded toward a basket on his desk. Cousin Edward had the same soft, comfortable, placid features as her father, but his dark eyes were quick and intelligent, his mouth pursing often. He did not strictly adhere to plain dress or plain speech. Though there was no collar on his coat, it was made of visibly costly fabric. If he seemed pleased with himself, Maddie supposed that he had a right to be, as the most successful member of the Tim's family, with a flourishing practice in his medical specialty and his fresh, enlarged and luxurious premises at Blythdale. That will be one of your duties, he said, sorting the post. Directly it arrives. Open mine and leave it in the basket. Whatever is addressed to the patients must be added to their files. She looked up at him. Copy das thou mean? No need for that. Simply open and file the letters themselves. Or if you feel that the contents are important or unusual, bring them to me. On occasion, an edited version isn't amiss. Excuse me, I'm not certain. She touched the pile of mail. Dost thou intend that the patients aren't to have their letters? It's imperative that we maintain our clients in a state of complete tranquility and quiet at all times. Close communications with families is bound to overexcite. We recommend that the relatives not write at all, but as you can see, they will insist. Oh, Maddie said. And I remind you that none of the patients presently under care are of our persuasion. I must request that you refrain from using the plain speech. Some of them find it offensive to be addressed so familiarly. He flushed slightly under Maddie's grave stare. We may use it among ourselves, of course. There is no question of that. But perhaps it would be best to have a policy of restricting it to the private rooms. I shall try, but I'm sure you can do it. Take your cue from me. Just let me get my casebook. We'll introduce you to everyone first. We're like a family here. It's important that you always think in that way. I feel myself a father to every poor soul who comes to Blythdale. And you'll find the patients very like children. Think of them as such, and you won't go far wrong. Yes, she said. Somewhere in the house, several tenors had taken up a cheerful rendition of some song, while a man began. Shouting unintelligibly, hysterically, over the notes. You'll grow accustomed to it, her father's cousin said, smiling a little. Some are recovering, but some are very ill. Yes, she said and drew a breath. I understand. There were, at present, fifteen patients at Blydale Hall, fifteen unfortunate ladies and gentlemen who were yet fortunate enough that their families would pay for their residence and treatment at the most lavish private lunatic asylum in the country. With the excellent reputation of Dr. Edward Timms for moral and medical therapy, Blythdale was even more exclusive than Dr. Newington's Ticehurst House in Sussex. Families were not encouraged to visit at Blythdale, but anyone without a personal connection to a patient was welcome at any time to tour the asylum with the attendance of an aide. The house had nothing to hide behind its walls, nothing inhumane or degrading. The most up-to-date treatments of wholesome diet, cold baths, calming routine and rehabilitating. Entertainment were practiced in an orderly atmosphere at Blythdale. The ladies sewed and walked in the rose garden, played battledore, 
took soothing herbal teas, sometimes were allowed to sketch outdoor scenes. The gentlemen followed the same regimen, except that in place of sewing, they had gymnastics and chess and the selection of books provided in the library, and might walk as far afield as the home would to collect flowers and leaves for the ladies to sketch. Everyone who was capable could attend weekly scientific lectures and play cards, and there was an Anglican vicar who conducted services for all but the most unruly. Blydale was singular and forward-thinking among asylums, cousin Edward informed her, and that a particular effort was made to mix the sexes in a normal social atmosphere, which the one-to-one -one ratio of attendance made both plausible and safe. He took her first to the drawing room, where the singers were gathered around a flutist. The terrible shouting had stopped, but one of the tenors wore a straight waistcoat, its white sleeves tied behind his back. His attendant, a wiry, muscular young man with a look of the farm about him, stood close by. As Maddie and Dr. Timms entered, the patient gazed at her hopefully. Have you come to take me home? The man in the straight waistcoat asked her. I'm supposed to go home today. This afternoon, Cousin Edward said, Kelly will take you for a walk. His face began to color. But I must go home. My wife is dying. Cousin Edward glanced at the attendant. Kelly said, Let's sit down and rest, Master John. She's calling me. I am the redeemed of Jesus Christ. The man flung himself forward. Kelly caught him deftly by a strap on the back of the waistcoat, hauling him reeling off balance. I am the redeemed of the redeemed of the Lord. My wife died for me. She sacrificed her life for me. I'm saved, do you hear me, sir? I tell you I'm. His voice kept rising, going faster and higher as Kelly tugged him toward the door. The rest of the patients, three other men and five ladies, appeared unconcerned, except for one. Of the tenors, who began to laugh. A girl young and quite lovely, dressed in an elegant gown, sat staring out the window without emotion, while next to her a woman bent over her sewing, rocking and whispering. The tenor's laughter died away, and he bit his lip with an apologetic look at Maddie. The wild shouting went on, growing distant, but Cousin Edward began to introduce her to each patient, whether or not he got a reply, and then to the patient's attendant. He made notes in his book, and handed it to Maddie to read the details. Miss Susanna's illness is melancholia, he said. It troubles her very deeply. How do you feel today, Miss Susanna? I'm fine, the girl said listlessly. Do you care to sing? No, thank you, doctor. Mind is full of apprehensions, Maddie read. Suffers torments from the most trivial thoughts, poor appetite, restless sleep, talks of suicide, attempted to destroy herself by drowning, formerly was happy and willing in. Common Feminine Pursuits Melancholia Followed Upon Disturbances in menstruation brought on by overstimulation of the mind with excessive schoolwork and intellectual endeavors, diverting blood flow from nourishment of female organs. He smiled and patted Miss Susanna's shoulder and moved on. Maddie was introduced to Mrs. Humphrey, who suffered from dementia and progressive idiocy. The lady smiled cheerfully and asked Maddie if she were one of the Cunninghams. No, Maddie said. I'm Archimedia Timms. I saw you in India. Mrs. Humphrey had about her the slightly sour tang of an unchanged baby. You took my clothes off. Oh, no. Thou art. You're mistaken. At half past six. Mrs. Humphrey nodded. That would be hats. Does not recognize husband or children, the casebook said. Dementia and progressive deterioration of intellect precipitated by onset of the climacteric disease of women. Please help Mrs. Humphrey to her room for attention, the doctor said to her attendant. He had a little frown between his brows. I must ask that you be more vigilant of hygienic concerns. The patients in the drawing room represented the most manageable of Blydale's inmates, Maddie found. Master Philip, the tenor, felt fuzzy 
and his food tasted strange. He laughed whenever he heard something sad, he told Maddie, which was very upsetting to him. He giggled as he said it. Lady Emmeline roundly insisted that she was an orphan, a foundling who had lost her family to the guillotine, in spite of Cousin Edward's gentle suggestion that her parents were Lord and Lady Cathcart, who resided in Leicestershire very much alive. But her navel was disappearing, Lady Emmeline informed him stoutly, as if that proved her case. Beyond those in the parlor, other patients were confined to their rooms behind double doors, the outer of heavy wood, the inner of iron bars. Most of the furniture had been removed except for the patient's bed and a cot for the attendant. Mania, read the book, dangerous and destructive, derangement and breakdown precipitated by the overstudy of religion. And in another case, violent epileptic, restraint required at all times. And another, dementia, confused speech, hallucinatory, incontinent, atrophy of the emotions. Yet even with these patients, Cousin Edward spoke personally, and repeated to Maddie the advantage of strict daily routine, plain, wholesome food and habits of discipline in re-establishing self-control and diverting weakened minds from unhealthy preoccupations. Maddie tried to believe him. She tried to absorb his matter-of-fact and optimistic humor, but mostly she wished she might curl up in her own bed in Chelsea and weep for these poor creatures. She'd thought herself strong-minded, an experienced sickroom nurse, but the accumulated introductions of the day made Blythedale Hall seem a very comfortable and ghastly sort of purgatory. Ah, uh, we're having ourselves shaved, Cousin Edward said, looking through a set of the open bars that replaced doors on the rooms of the most violent patients. He paused before unlocking the door and leaned over to murmur to Maddie. This is one of our most tragic cases, I fear. An example of moral insanity which has blossomed into mania. She bit her lip, wishing that he hadn't told her. It made her even more reluctant than before to lift her face and look at the next unfortunate inmate of the asylum. Good afternoon, the doctor said warmly as he moved inside. How do you do today, sir? The patient made no answer, and the attendant said, not a bad day, doctor. Not too bad. Maddie finally forced herself to step into the doorway and lift her head. The burly attendant dropped a razor. He looked like a prize fighter, with his hair cut close as fuzz to his head. A few feet away, in pale breeches and white shirt sleeves, manacled by one arm to the bedstead, another man stood silhouetted, staring away from them out the window. Friend, she compelled herself to say in greeting, in as normal a tone as she could muster. He turned around suddenly, the motion caught halfway with a sharp steel clangor, his dark hair falling wildly over his forehead, the deep blue eyes intense, frozen cobalt rage, a caged and bound pirate, a brute at bay. Maddie lost her voice. He stared at her, silent. No flicker of recognition. Nothing. Thou! Maddie whispered. He lowered his face a little, looking at her from beneath his eyelashes. Weariness, anger, a deep and powerful passion, they were all in his face, in his stance, in the concentrated and uneven exhalation with his jaw shut hard and his unbound hand flexing open wide and closed, over and over again. Dost thou not remember? she asked hesitantly. I'm Maddie Timms. Archimedia Timms. Why, are you acquainted? Her cousin asked in surprise. Maddie looked away from the barbaric figure at the window. Well, yes, Papa and I. It is the Duke of Jervalx, is it not? The words would hardly come out. Well, well. Indeed it is. Master Christian has come to visit us for a spell. Master Christian stared at Cousin Edward as if he would like to tear out the doctor's throat with his bare hands. Her cousin smiled benignly at his patient. This is a cheerful coincidence. He gestured toward Maddie. Do you remember Miss Timms, Master Christian? Jervox's glance nicked from Cousin Edward to her and back again. Then he leaned on the windowsill, resting his head back against the barred panes. His understanding is limited.
cousin Edward said. In the scope of a two-year-old child's. As I say, it appears that he has a history of moral insanity with a sudden onset of degeneration into dementia and mania, most particularly when crossed. The apoplexy left him in a state of unconsciousness for two days, and early in the coma his vital signs were depressed to the degree that he was thought lifeless. Yes, Maddie said in a constricted voice. That is, we had understood that he had been killed. It's an interesting story. This is entirely confidential, of course. You must not speak of it abroad. But the event that excited this state in him was an engagement of honor, fought. With pistols. He wasn't injured, but the sensation of the moment appears to have precipitated the seizure. The doctor had literally declared him deceased and ordered the body to be laid out. But the duke's dogs created such a frenzy that the mortuary attendants couldn't touch him. Cousin Edward shook his head. One shudders to think, if those animals hadn't acted as they did. But the noise seems to have reached him in some way, produced enough movement and pulse that life was seen to be preserved. And of course, over time he regained consciousness and the motion of his limbs. But he was left in this state of maniacal idiocy. Cousin Edward made a note in his book, looked up at Jervalx consideringly, and wrote again. He closed the casebook with a snap and handed it to Maddie. Of course, you know that indulgence and a lack of moral discipline predisposes the mind to irrationality. He doesn't speak, and his primitive emotions rule him. This is very common in such cases, where the prior foundation is laid in vice. And perversity, there's a breakdown, a loss of moral sense that gives free rein to instinctive appetites and desires in utter violation of former refined habits. Physically, he's quite strong. Am I right, Larkin? The attendant gave an assenting snort. Aye, that he is. Barring the right hand. You see I've only got the left tied up. That's the one you have to watch for. He laid down the razor. Minimal restraint. Cousin Edward said, nodding in approval. Physically he's vigorous, but otherwise reduced to the animal nature. Larkin went to pull the bell. We'll see how he feels about shaving today. Yesterday we had to go to the waistcoat and a cradle both. Maddie lowered her gaze, unable to bear it. To meet those potent, silent eyes. She felt flung down, beaten, miserable. That he would be here. He would rather be dead. She could look at him and know it. She held the book against her skirt. Will he be cured? Ah, her cousin drew his lower lip over the upper. He raised his eyebrows. I won't pretend the case isn't grave. His mother is a very good, benevolent Christian woman, active with great seal in charities and evangelism in her church. She has suggested to me that her son has a long history of unsubdued self-indulgence and rebelliousness. With such passionate and ill-regulated habits, he sighed. Well, what I'll say is, that if we cannot cure him at Blythedale, it cannot be done. Maddie clutched the book. And what treatments does, do you follow? The regulated schedule is the most important, of course, to instill a habit of self-discipline and evenness of mind. Complete quiet, frequent exercise to calm him, a progression of therapeutic baths, a course of reading aloud, the subject matter selected to stimulate the sluggish intellect and inspire temperance. No drawing. Pens and writing instruments seem to provoke him to the most violent excitations. Nerve tonics he'll ingest only by force. I'm afraid we haven't seen any progression toward the point at which he can be trusted in the drawing. Room with the orderly patients but he is soon to take walks with the other maniacs in order to prevent him from feeling isolated. Jervox crossed his arms, the chain rattling upward. Maddie lifted her face and looked at him. His expression had relaxed, gone from suppressed savagery to a hint of cynicism. He looked back at her with a half-smile, tilted up on one side. It was startling. He appeared himself again, 
the self-possessed aristocrat. She almost expected him to speak or nod, but he did either. He only smiled at her, with an interest that reminded her of the roguish way he'd observed her that night he'd described her to her father. She felt suddenly certain that he did remember her. Jervalks, she said, taking a step forward. My papa is here also. John Timms. Thou, you work together with him on the new geometry. His smile faded slightly. He looked at her very intently, his head tilted a little to one side, the way a dog would look as it. Tried to penetrate the mystery of some human behavior. She. Noticed that he watched her mouth as she spoke, but he wasn't deaf. He turned instantly toward the sound of a voice. Wouldst thou like Papa to come and call on thee? She asked. He inclined his head politely in assent. Maddie felt a spurt of excitement. He had responded with perfect intelligence to that, certainly. She glanced at Cousin Edward. The doctor only shook his head. He's trying to please. You. Maniacs can be rather sly, at times. Ask him, in that same tone, if he's the king of Spain. She would not do that. It seemed too cheap a trick. She could not believe there was only a two-year-old's mind left behind those eyes. Instead, she said, Thou never looked to discover me here, didst thou? The chain rattled faintly as he shifted. He considered her, and shook his head. As he did it, she realized that she'd put a negative tone in her question, and cued him to answer no. Thou dost not understand me, she said in disappointment. He hesitated, with a penetrating look, and then only stood silent, his mouth a sullen curve. I'm sorry, she said impulsively. I'm so sorry this affliction has come to thee. He gave her that cynical, one-sided smile. Standing straight, he reached out his chained hand, as if to lift hers and bow. Maddie automatically took it. He bent over, and suddenly jerked her up toward him, whirling her into his chest, his chain hand at her throat, his other arm crushing her back into his chest. The razor! her cousin shouted. Good God! Larkin! The attendant spun around, holding the water he'd just taken from the maid at the door. He dropped the pail, cascading liquid over the woven rug, and lunged toward them. But Jervalx made a blood-chilling sound, a guttural snarl, as he held the razor blade at Maddie's jaw. Larkin stopped short. Maddie could see Jervox's thumb against the blade from the corner of her eye, see Larkin and cousin Edward and the maid at the door, all in a suspended moment. Jervox held her, his arm pressing into her waist, ruthless, his breathing a hiss through his teeth at her ear. Don't struggle, cousin Edward said evenly. Don't do anything. Maddie had no idea of struggle. It hurt, the way he held her. She could feel herself no match for the strength of his grip. He was tense, a hard, hot, shifting wall against her back, his wrist digging into her as he forced her with him as far as the chain reached and hooked his foot around the shaving table. He drew it toward them, maneuvering carefully, pausing when it threatened to topple and then nudging it closer again. Cousin Edward began talking in a soothing voice, but Jervalks ignored it. He took the razor from Maddie's throat, in one wide. Swing he sent the copper shaving bowl clattering to the floor. With his fist. The chain babbled along the edge of the table as he dragged the razor blade in a straight slash up the center of the varnished top, creating a pale incision. He held Maddie tightly. She felt his muscles move and work as he inverted his wrist and crossed the first line with another. When Larkin took a step toward them, the blade came up instantly to her throat. She listened to the harsh breath at her ear, felt the heat of it on her skin and the pump of her own heart, and his. Let him, Cousin Edward murmured. Let him finish. Jervalx waited, holding the razor just touching her skin. Cousin Edward nodded toward him. You may go on, Master Christian. After a moment, Jervalx's fist curled harder on the razor handle, and he placed the end of the blade at the intersection of the cross. 
With an effort that Matty felt all through his body, he drew an even, sinuous S-curve along the axis of the line. He dropped the razor. It made a loud clump as it hit the table. He put his hand behind her head, forcing her to look down at the carved figure. His arm loosened. He let her go. Maddie stood still, gazing at the table. She turned. The intensity of expectation in his face, the concentration, he depended on her to understand. He wasn't looking at anyone else. She didn't know the figure. But she knew it was mathematical. Wait here. She gripped both of his hands. Wait. She turned to Larkin and Cousin Edward. Don't punish him. Don't. Do anything to hurt him. She exclaimed as she rushed from the room. She found her father in the family parlor, being read to by his aide. Papa! She ran to him and caught up his hand. What is this? Guiding his forefinger, she made the cross on the parlor table's polished surface, and then the sinuous line along it. It's a periodic function, her father said. Maddie released a breath and grabbed up pen and paper. What's the definition? The infinite series dost thou mean? Anything. Anything about it. If it were given to thee, thou wouldst answer back what answer? Given to me? What, Papa? I'll explain, but I must go back as quickly as possible. Just tell me, a periodic function, like Monsieur Fourier's? How is it written? Beginning with sin x equals? The sine function series. Or is it the cosine thou t have? And the graphs are different, aren't they? For this one. She bit her lip and closed her eyes, conjuring the scars and the varnish. The curve begins at the intersection of the axis. That would be the sine function. Sin x equals x minus x cubed over the factorial of 3 plus x to the 5th over the factorial of 5 minus x to the 7th over the factorial of 7 and so forth. Yes. Yes. Maddie scribbled down the familiar symbols, making them large and clear. Oh, Papa. Thou alt he never imagine. I'll be back to tell thee. She ran through the Baroque, marbled front hall and up the staircase. The carpeted floors creaked and thudded beneath her feet. When she came to his barren room, she found that her pleas had been ignored. Larkin and another attendant had Jervox shoved with his face up against the wall, holding him there as they finished tying off the sleeves of a straight waistcoat. As Maddie stopped in the doorway, they let go of him. He didn't turn or move or struggle, only lowered his head, resting it against the wall, a white figure in the shadowed corner. I wish thou hadst not, cousin Maddie. Edward turned. Are you quite recovered? Do you wish to lie down? What a calamity! Inexcusable for Larkin to leave that razor within his reach. When we're using minimal restraint, absolute prudence is required at all times. I should never have allowed you in here. It's all right. It's a sign function. Oh, I wish thou hadst not put that on him. Jervalx leaned his shoulder on the wall, turning, and Maddie felt that there was accusation in the look he gave her. The figure he drew, she said, flourishing her paper. It's a sign function. Yes, as I told you, instruments of writing, of any sort, overexcite his brain. You mustn't expect to wring sense out of what he's done. But it is sense. This is the infinite series that signifies it. No. No, I must insist that we leave him to a tranquil atmosphere now. Don't, Cousin Maddie. His voice became stern as she started past him with the paper. He plucked it from her hand and crumpled it. Do not show him anything that will cause him further distress. She stopped. Jervox watched her. It's a sign function, she said to him, in defiance of her cousin. If she had expected a reaction, or understanding, she got none. He just looked at her as if there were a wall of glass between them, and he couldn't hear her voice. Chapter 5 
Gone away. Gone. All gone but ruffian shave dog out the doors. Sleep room. No privacy. Throw down floor. Made stuff food throat. Eat or no. Cuzmad. Cuzmad. Bed. Tied hand for trust. Trust like pa. B.A. Animal. Fat pink. Curly tail. Word vanish. Vanish. Always just. Far. His head hurt to chase the name. Cuzmad. He tried to say it silently, get his tongue around the sounds. He was afraid of how it would come out aloud. No, no. No, that was how it would come out. Not speak, refuse. The rage and fear went endlessly around inside him. They all talked too quickly, that was what. They mumbled, they babbled, they wouldn't give him a chance to understand. Lay hands, me. By God, no right. Dumb beast, proud force, scheme bath blood, manacles garden strangers watch, fury, fight, shame, tide chair, revolting, noisy, ranting madman, robbed of his friends, his own house, his life. He lay staring at the dim shadows of the finely plastered ceiling, following the oval pattern to where it met the wall, and was sliced rudely off by the partition that created this cell from what must once have been an elegant chamber. Across the hall, one of the madmen was groaning, a sound that terrified. Christian somewhere far deep in his throat and chest, because it was the same sound he wanted to make, the despair that only pride and cold fury held inside. Lock here long enough, long enough, lunatic. Sometimes he tried to reckon it, to identify who held him here, who it was who wished to drive him past the brink of sanity. He remembered faces. Sometimes he could put names to them, and sometimes he could think of the same faces, but the names weren't there. That had happened with Cuzmad. He'd looked at her, starch white, thing, the word for what she wore on her head danced away. Talk thee, thou. No, no. Listen. Listen hard, hard, hard. Cuzmad seemed right and not right. Truly, the more he considered it, the more bizarre it seemed. But when he tried to think about it too much, tried too hard to drag the answer out of the emerging and dissolving maze in his head, he felt nauseated. Footsteps creaked in the hall, a familiar sound, alarming. When he never knew what they were going to do to him next. The light bobbed, casting the barred shadows from the door in wild swings across the ceiling. He heard the sound of the lock and the thick noises of his warden waking up. A feminine whisper, then her profile in the candlelight as she leaned over the cot in the corner. She spoke to the shambling form that sat up there. The two of them prattled incomprehensibly for a minute, then the ape got up and shuffled out of the room. She set the candle on the windowsill, turning toward him. It was intolerable to be seen by her in this state of abject humiliation, this utter enslavement. He closed his eyes and feigned sleep, willed it all away, wake bedroom. Dogs, name, self, words. Words understand, words speak. This crazy dream. Would be over. Ervo, she murmured. Wilthwack? She touched his shoulder. Shame made him set his jaw and turn away from her. Pride made him clench his fists and jerk once, hard, at the bonds. The ringing noise startled her. She pulled her hand back and looked down at him nervously. He felt a certain satisfaction in her alarm and stared at her with insolent malevolence. She smiled tentatively. Wayzine function, she said. Brotanafidi series. She held up a paper. In the candlelight, the ink was dark and clear. Yes. Yes, 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 he wanted to shout. You heard me, you understood. I'm here. But he did nothing. Suddenly he was afraid to move, afraid that he would frighten her away after trying to do it an instant before. She became precious, priceless, a jewel beyond measure. He could not, could not hazard doing anything wrong now. He realized he'd begun breathing too fast. He corrected that, contained himself. With a conscious effort, he relaxed his arms and opened his fists, resting his bound hands back against the bed. He looked into her eyes and risked a short, emphatic nod. 
sighed Fuchsia, she said with a little stress. Yes? Yes, he thought. Yes. He thought he might say yes, and then didn't chance it. Cautiously, he nodded again. Sign, she said. Sign Fushan. Sign Fushan. Fushan sign. The words went around in his head. Sign fun, fun sign, sign funsenshin, mixed tumble, two dice, wheel, dizzy. Sign fun shun, she said again, kneeling beside him, rattling the paper. He looked at the symbols. He knew what the series made, he understood its meaning, and the revolving words fell, dropped into the cup, settling. Sign function. Of course. Sign function. He gave a faint, bewildered chuckle. The candlelight guttered, casting pulsing shadows on her face as she knelt, prim cap, siren lashes, virtue, Mississippi. He wet his lips. Sign he said hoarsely. Yes. Yes. The word came explosively, as if he had to push it through, to break a wall. Sign yes. She smiled. It was like morning in the shadows. It raised his heart. He found himself in love, in an agony of passion. Sign funk tyant, his beloved said. Child, not child, silly prim, not child repeat. Secant, he grated. Cosecant. No. Sign. Tangent. Cotangent. Angle. Easy. Mathematics, trigonometry. Parallel axiom, congruence, coplanar lines, perpendicular lines. God, geometry was easy. Why hadn't he remembered how easy? He tried something hard. He gripped the chains above his wrists, fighting to say it. Ah. It was so painful. He knew it. It just wouldn't come. Ah, she. She. Cosmad. He loved her. He didn't want her ever to go away and leave him alone in this place. She tilted her head quizzically. Who? His open fingers barely brushed hers. He moved his hand to the limit of the chain and stroked his thumb gently up and down the side of her palm. He gazed into her eyes, trying to say, It that way. Every word was agony to accomplish, cling twist. Slide away silvery fish grab, shoved through the wall. Name! It burst out of him. Name! She? He gripped her hand, squeezed it once. She smiled again. Maddie. Yes, that was it. Maddie. Maddie girl. Maddie. Mmm. It came out, and he gritted his teeth in frustration. Maddie, she said. He nodded. He was afraid that wasn't enough, that she wouldn't know he'd understood. Sign yes. He repeated his one success. Cosine. Tangent. His fingers caressed her hand. He wanted to say, Don't go, and instead it emerged. No, no. She gave a little sigh and started to stand up. He realized she was leaving and shook his head violently. Don't. Stay here, don't leave yet, not now. No, 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 was what he heard himself uttering, and cut it off, tilting his head back and yanking at the bonds in wrath. Peace down, said he. Cliet Cliet. She put her forefinger up to her face, the tip just beneath her nose. He gazed at her. It meant something, that gesture. He knew it meant something, but he couldn't think what. The echo of the noise he'd made died away, a mere ripple of disturbance in this house full of howling beasts. Her hand lay on his shoulder. He shifted his head, pressed his cheek against the back of her palm. Stay here, Maddie. Don't leave me. All that got out was, No. M-N-N-H. No. He groaned, turning from her. She took his face between her cool fingers. She stroked his hair back from his forehead. He closed his eyes, shuddering inside, holding back the tide of feeling. He lay still. 
Weeb well, she whispered. Wreath and will be well. Will well. Will well. Breathing will well. Everything will well. He hadn't really comprehended it. It came after his mind seemed to sift down through the sounds, settling finally on an intuition. But it was something anyway. It was something to keep as she turned away and took the candle and paper. One small glass ball to float when he was drowning. She thought everything would be all right, and he'd almost understood her when she said it. Maddie pursed her lips, carefully folding the brochure about Blythedale Hall into the letter that Cousin Edward had dictated to a lady skull, describing in glowing terms the kind and loving treatment that her sister might expect at Blythedale, referring discreetly to a rate of six guineas a week, and inviting Lady Skull for a visit at her convenience. On the brochure, the engraving of the house looked completely serene, with couples strolling beside the willows and the lake and the swans. Nothing in the letter or brochure hinted at the pounding. Sound of metal that reverberated through the halls, that had woken everyone this morning and lasted throughout Cousin Edward's stiff and angry lecture on Maddie's folly in sending Larkin away on a made-up pretext and visiting the Duke of Jervolks in secret, that went on while Cousin Edward read his mail and she filed letters, that went on still while Maddie wrote out her dictation with trembling fingers. The sound and fierce shout that went on and on and on, crash, tangent, crash. Distance, crash, squared, crash, minus, crash, yon. Crash, x2, crash, mashi, crash, mashi, she, 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 outraged, desperate, on and on until the echoing voice was hoarse and grinding, pleading, plaintive corroding down to an inarticulate syllable between each smash of the barred iron door. She had not thought him mad last night, but she thought him mad this morning. The truth of Cousin Edward's warnings was patent. She should not have disturbed him, should never have gone to see him in that way. Everyone in the house was agitated, the other patients unnerved. Maddie had heard Cousin Edward instruct Larkin to explain to Master Christian that he would be restrained taken to the seclusion room and left there if his conduct had not improved by noon. Maddie already knew about the seclusion room. It was an essential part of the moral therapy practice at Blydale, the management of the patient's behavior by an appeal to their dignity, the subtle balance between encouragement and intimidation as the situation demanded. Cousin Edward had given her a copy of Mr. Took's description of the retreat the famous Quaker asylum at York that had pioneered the humane and moral treatment of lunatics. She'd only had time to read parts of it, but everyone had heard of the retreat. The brochure about Blydale emphasized the extensive training and priceless experience Cousin Edward had gained in his eight years of work there under Dr. Jepson. Lunatics were to be spoken to at all times as much as if they were rational beings as possible, in order to cherish the spark of reason. They were to be treated gently and kindly, but made to understand that their circumstances and freedom depended largely on their own self control. Like children, they were to be secluded if they would not behave after having been given ample chance to do so. At half past eleven, when Cousin Edward retired to visit with his wife, the hall still rang with the steady crash and savage voice that had gone completely wordless now, just a guttural, broken, animal noise in time to the clang of the bars. Maddie felt she could listen no longer. It was her fault. If he was to be punished, she didn't wish to sit in comfortable ignorance of what she'd caused. With no real purpose but to chasten herself for her foolish trespass, she asked a maid to point out the seclusion room. The girl led her to the cellar stairs. It's the third door on the right, Mississippi. Just past the new bath. Maddie descended the stair. As she turned each corner, the violent sounds from above faded until she stepped into a silent corridor. The air was cold, but the passage had been whitewashed and a lamp burned steadily at the far end, giving ample illumination. The third door on the right stood open to a small, windowless room with a wooden floor and a bench built into one wall. It was not the horror chamber that she had expected. 
It was only a room, quite clean, dry, chill but not cold. A Bible lay on the bench, as if inviting someone to read and meditate in the silence. In the little chamber, Maddie suddenly saw the Quaker and Cousin Edward, the heritage from which he seemed to have drifted so far away in his daily life. This room was like a meeting house. A place to be quiet and listen for the still, small voice, the indwelling light. As she stood in the middle of it, she thought that Jervalks would be all right here. And yet, the silence of it troubled her. She'd spent a large part of her life in the silence of meetings and had never felt uncomfortable with it. She'd listened, and waited, and felt at times what she believed to be a true experience of the inner light, though she had never been moved by it to speak out or minister in meeting. And in spite of the blasphemy of presuming to predict such things, she found it difficult to imagine that she ever would feel so moved. She wasn't poised and self-confident, as the Duke was. As poised as Jervalx had been. She thought of him now. The manacles, the fury in his face. The broken sound of what was left of his voice. Last night, she had not slept at all. She'd lain awake, as... She'd lain awake the night her mother had died, trying to will. Acceptance out of something that it seemed would never be acceptable. Silence. There were all kinds of silences. The open, waiting silence of meeting. The warm silence of home and family where words were unnecessary. The bird and flower-filled silence of an empty garden. For months he'd said nothing. Not one word. The written record so meticulously kept by Cousin Edward repeated it every day, mute, sullen, uncooperative, violent. Cousin Edward called it dementia. Moral insanity, reduced to the animal nature. She looked at the Bible but didn't touch it. She'd been brought up to think of the scriptures as a divine word, a useful and necessary word, but never greater than the leading of God in her heart. In the hush of this spare room she felt the slow prickle of truth growing in her, the dawning realization that a charge was being laid upon her, that the man above stairs who crashed against his cage was calling out for her, that to him this room would not be a spiritual place, but a prison, a threat to be used against him. He didn't understand silence. He didn't know it as she knew it. She lifted her head. He wasn't a two-year-old. He had not lost his reason. He isn't mad. He is maddened. The thought came so clearly that she had the sensation someone had spoken it aloud. She felt that something left her, a presence that she had not. Even known had been there until it was gone. The room seemed grimmer, less like the clean interior of a meeting house and more like a little empty seclusion chamber in the cold depths of a cellar. Jervalx had not lost his reason. His words had been taken away. He couldn't speak, and he couldn't understand what was said to him. His banging shouts, his rage and despair, came to seem appallingly rational, not the work of a maniac reduced to lunacy by the sum of his vices, but of a sane man frantic with frustration. He had found no other way to reach out but by violence, this reckless duke who knew periodic functions and Fourier's infinite series who could create his own geometry, who had been free and eloquent and even generous in his autocratic way, and was now locked up and driven to distraction by it. Maddie felt humbled. God had never spoken to her in quite so clear a way. She was no minister, not one of those men and women who had the gift of speaking out in meeting and marketplace. She only went about her life as it seemed she ought to do from day to day. But this was an explicit obligation laid upon her. What witness it was that God wished to implement by visiting Jervalks with this affliction, she did not presume to know, although it didn't take much divine insight to hazard a guess. She was not asked to preach to him or judge him in his hardship. What was required of her was only this, that she not abandon him while he suffered it. Cousin Edward, Maddie knew full well, would not like it. He had expressly forbidden her the violent corridor. There were all sorts of sensible arguments against what she meant to do. She thought of a multitude as she walked up the stairs, 
drawing near Jervox's cell, the rhythmic crash growing louder. She was mistaken. She was inadequate. She was unfit for such a task. What did she know of madness or medicine? There was no human voice at all with the crash now. The rest of the asylum seemed strangely quiet, the mumbles and mutterings of yesterday absent as if everyone else hung on the savage clash of metal against metal, listening bewitched. She turned the corner. Halfway down the hall, Larkin sat on a chair tilted back on two legs to the wall, his skull gleaming beneath the short stubble of hair. He had his pocket watch out and propped on his knee, flipping the chain idly in time to the clanging. Three minutes to go, he declared loudly, to no one in particular. The crashing cadence went on without a pause. He glanced toward Maddie, and the chair came down with a thump that was half lost in the din. Friend Larkin. She raised her voice to be heard. I've come to talk to Jervalx. The crash of the bars fell silent. The startling lack of noise seemed to ring in her ears. Larkin looked to the door of Jervalx's room and back at Maddie. He scowled. You're not to be here, Mississippi. His voice sounded strange and hollow, surrounded by imaginary echoes of sound that had already died away. Nevertheless, I am here. Now, you got me into wonderful trouble last night. I won't be having any more. Thou mayst go and speak to my cousin, if thou wilt. Certainly I don't wish to make more trouble for thee. I can't do that, Mississippi. In a minute I'm to take him down to seclusion. You'll have to leave the corridor. Thou wert only to take him down if he was not quieted by noon, wert thou not? She made a little gesture toward the door. He is quiet. As if to prove her, the clock in the hall below began to strike, sending slow chimes echoing up the stairs. Larkin did not appear pleased with the turn of events. Maddie started forward, and he held up his hand. Don't, Mississippi. Do us all a favor and don't get him stirred all up again. Ah, miss, if you please. Jervox was standing behind the barred door, his hands gripping the iron. The instant he saw her, the rigid clench of his fingers and jaw relaxed. His lips parted as if he would speak, and then clamped shut again. He stood back from the door in the dim room, making a formal bow, offering his hand through the bars as if she were a lady and there were no metal door between them. Don't! Larkin stepped forward. He could kill you, miss. He could strangle you in a minute if he got hold of you. Through the bars that way. Maddie could see very well that this was so. And in the moment of hesitation, she saw Jervox recognize her fear. His open hand closed. He drew back and turned away from the door, moving like a ghost, a silent figure that drifted to the window and stood there, gazing out. And Maddie realized that she had failed. Larkin's voice had been the voice of the reasoner, of evil, that would whisper arguments and proofs and make her resist her own truth. The first test, and already she'd stumbled. Maddie watched him for a moment, and then turned to Larkin. Please go thou and ask my cousin to come here. Thou mayst say to him that I have had an opening, and it is necessary that I speak with him. An opening? The attendant gave her an exasperated look. I don't know what you mean, miss, but I'm not going to leave here and let you do something silly. I will sit there, she said, nodding toward his chair. I promise thee, no more than that. And what if he gets started again? He's quiet now, you'll agitate him. Jervalks. Maddie went to the door and lifted her hand, offering it through the bars in spite of Larkin's furious protest. If I stay here, will I disturb thee? He looked over his shoulder at her. It's on your head, miss, Larkin warned. On your own head be it. After what he did yesterday. Jervalx gave the man a look of utter scorn. He gazed for a moment at Maddie, and then he turned away, turned his back on her offered hand in a brusque and disdainful rejection. A slap across the cheek could hardly have been more pointed. 
Maddie dropped her hand. Please go thou and fetch my cousin, she said stiffly to Larkin. You won't try nothing while I'm gone? Maddie seated herself. I will not. I can't believe you'll last here long, miss, the attendant muttered with a shake of his head as he turned away and strode down the hall, disappearing around the corner. The silence settled. Jervalks remained staring out of his window. Ape, he said, with that explosive inflection, a discharge of absolute loathing and contempt. Then, without turning, he slanted a sideways look back at Maddie, speculative, one eyebrow lifted in subtle challenge. Yes, she said, nodding emphatically. A perfect ape. He crossed his arms, resting his shoulders back against a barred window in his insolent pose, a pale cavalier imprisoned in silence and dusk. A slow smile curved his mouth. If he was mad, she could not trust him. Yesterday he had leaned back his head on the bars and watched her with just that relaxed and arrogant posture, then a moment later held a razor to her throat. Be careful, the reasoner murmured. He's strong. He's intimidating. He is not sane. Maddie looked back at Jervalks. She allowed a very faint answering tilt of her lips. Ape, she repeated decisively. His one-sided grin seemed a light in the dimness of his little cell. Ape, he said with vicious relish. Maddie folded her hands. Twould appear that we're in agreement. He said nothing more, but watched her through the iron barrier with that mute and ironic smile. I'm afraid that must be out of the question, Cousin Edward said to Maddie. Leaving aside your inexperience and the impropriety of you acting as the Duke's personal attendant, it is simply absurd. Think of the danger to yourself, Cousin Maddie. You cannot have forgot yesterday's incident. I haven't forgot. I have had an opening. Yes, very well, I understand that, but this isn't meeting, my dear. This is a lunacy asylum. She looked at him gravely. Is God not here too? Larkin gave a snort. Cousin Edward flushed slightly and frowned at the attendant. Certainly God is here. I have had an opening, she repeated in a level tone. I am led. Cousin Edward pursed his lips. I hadn't thought you. Would prefer it, but if you truly wish to work with the patients in a direct way, I can assign you to assist the ladies' matron in the afternoons. There, the reasoner whispered. Do that instead. It would be safer. Easier. More proper. I would gladly assist the matron in other circumstances, she said, but I am required to support Jervalx. The doctor began to grow pink. I'm astonished that you even think of such an improper situation, Cousin Maddie. It isn't fitting in you. I've attended to nursing duties for much of my life. I'm experienced with patients of both sexes. Maddie kept her voice quiet. But it's of no moment even if I were not. My leading is concerned with Jervalx himself. Come now. Cousin Edward shook his head and smiled. Wherever have you got such a fantastic notion? In the seclusion room, she answered simply. The light and the truth were shown to me. I'll tell you about light and truth, miss, Larkin exclaimed. When he breaks your neck, I'll tell you. He will not hurt me, Maddie said. Little you know about it, miss. He hits out regular, nearly snapped my arm more than once, and I'm a big fellow as ye can see. Slip of a gel like you, he could scuttle in a moment. Best listen to him, the reasoner warned. He knows whereof he speaks. And yet, she said, when he saw that I had come to speak to him, he was quiet. Larkin scowled. There's nothing in that, Mississippi. You don't know his sort. You ain't been here but a day. You can't never turn your back on a maniac. I'm sorry to say that's true, Cousin Maddie. You must not be deluded by an apparent show of wit in a patient of this type. We do our best to encourage reason and civilized behavior, but in sober truth, 
The Duke is not in a state to be relied upon or viewed as a human being. There was a female minister in Maddie's meeting, the one who had told her about the reasoner, and how sensibly and subtly he argued, who had the gift of gazing steadily and with great effect into the eyes of the misguided. Maddie looked just so at Cousin Edward, unblinking. That is to say, he cleared his throat. Perhaps I misspeak myself. He is a human being, of course, one of the Lord's children, as are we all. But I'm charged with your welfare. Thou art charged with his welfare. My dear, you cannot attend him. It is preposterous. I cannot allow it. She did not disagree. Reason and debate would not be what would convince him. She had not thought ahead of what she would say. If God willed, the proper words would come. Under her silent gaze, he set his shoulders back and shifted his feet, as if she made him uncomfortable. It's impossible. I fear that you just don't understand. Cousin Edward, she said, thou art the one without. Understanding. He pursed his lips and frowned at her. Mind the light within, she said gently. Hast thou forsaken it? He kept frowning at her. But he wasn't looking at Maddie, not really. I don't know about all this, like Bosch, Larkin said with belligerence, but a sillier notion I never heard, doctor. I'm sorry to be taking up your time with it, but she wouldn't hear nothing. But that you come up here and talk to her about this. Opening of hers. Cousin Edward glanced at his attendant. When he looked back at Maddie, she met his eyes steadfastly. Larkin grumbled on about lights and openings and ignorant nonsense, and with every idle word offended a friend's beliefs to the core. Cousin Edward stood in the corridor without moving. She saw the moment that he ceased being a lapsed Quaker annoyed by casual contempt for his background and began looking, and listening, elsewhere. Larkin's comments finally rambled down to an exasperated grunt. Inside the cell, Jervalks was a shadow watching them through the bars, white and still. The silence filled the house, a very great and waiting silence. Cousin Edward turned to Larkin and asked him for the key. Chapter 6 What say, argument assertion back and forth prattle rattle gibber the ape red-faced and matty imperturbable. Christian followed none of it. He was surprised when the one who ran things, the pudgy pale manicured one, unlocked the door and opened it, astonished when she stepped inside alone. She looked a little scared. Perhaps she had reason enough, but he didn't like it. Not hurt never hurt female dam. After a moment's hesitation, she walked across the cell. Her hand startled him. As she held it out it seemed to come from nowhere. Things did that. Jumped up at him from nothing. Blast sound sudden make noise didn't know. Hide things. Pop out there not there why. It made him furious. It frightened him. He wanted things to stay in place. He looked at her. Handshake, like a man's right hand to right hand, but his wouldn't move. He stood helpless, feeling muddled and mortified, opening and closing the fingers of his right hand. He looked down into her eyes, witless not move. Unable to explain, breathing harshly, taut with the effort to make his body obey his intent. Then she grasped his hand firmly and lifted it up and down. He felt her fingers in his, soft and cool, and like a fog rising from a vista, he knew what he wanted to do and could do it. Something more gallant, he brought her hand to his lips and pressed a light kiss there, squeezing her fingers gently. Puritan spinster blushed prim pretty eyes. He smiled at her. She moistened her lips. The ape muttered ominously. Christian. Looked up beyond her in the bars and saw the expression, saw that he'd goaded his keeper past endurance now, and that the time would come when he would pay for it. The other, medical blood master bone, blood, the other, only stood there, looking learned and paternal. Christian realized that he was being tested. He transferred his attention back to Maddie, watching her intensely, determined not to botch his chances. The ape was outside, she was in. It was an improvement he couldn't afford to lose. 
When she gestured to him to sit, he sat. When she offered him water, he drank. When she spoke to him, he stared at her mouth and tried to make sense of the collection of sounds that fell from her lips. It angered him that he could not do it. Everything infuriated him, and had done since he'd come out of the dark and exhausted confusion without words, without himself. He was just barely in control. Moment by moment, he leashed the urge to grab something and hurl it. But there was nothing to hurl. They'd stripped the cell of anything he could move. Maddie Girl looked at him with gentle expectation, and he remembered in time that he must not boil over now. When the tray came with the same intolerable mutton broth and plain rice, bread pudding and barley water, he sat there glaring at it for long moments, rebelling inside, raging. She stood beside him and finally picked up the spoon. No. No, that he would not bear. He almost sent the tray and soup and everything across the room. Almost. Instead he reached for her and caught her wrist and held it still, just held it, and then as calmly as he could pressed it downward, until the spoon rested on the tray. She let go of the spoon. He picked it up and ate their plebeian slops watch animal zoo dam. Degraded to the bottom of his soul, so full of anger and loathing that every swallow was a battle. But he did it. He did it to keep her there and to gall the ape in the only way he'd found yet to do it. And that was the test. He passed. For the first time since he'd woken from the drugged stupor in which they'd brought him here, he'd sat down voluntarily and eaten like human being. That was how they would look at it. He thought of his table and his chef at home, of dishes with names that slipped strangely through his head, less fillets. Voleil a la Merkel, of chocolate, of la darn salmon. Soufflés d'abricots. He looked at the greasy mud and soup and could have gagged. On his hate. But Maddie beamed, which made him feel surly and pleased at once. He could forgive her, he supposed, Plainly thou can't know better rye bread beer pudding. Quaker. Quaker, yes, but he could not say it out loud, nor cared to try. He passed their bloody test, and they let her stay with him, sitting outside his cell. Shaky muscle weak. The exhaustion overpowered him, bound him. He leaned on the bars, unwilling to let her out of sight. Talk, can't, say Matty girl, stay. Stay. Until night at least, when the ape came back. Christian was wary of him, offering no cause for coercion, lying down on his narrow bed like an obedient dog. Biding his time, and he and the ape both knew it. In the morning she came again with the blood man talk gibberish right book. What's inside book? Lies. Lies. Consult book. Bleed? Bath? God save me. Two more keepers came, and he knew it was to be the bath. He looked once at Maddie, just once, putting everything he had of entreaty in his eyes. She gave him a reassuring smile. She didn't know. He had to believe that she had no notion, and when he thought of it, he didn't wish her to know what it was they could do to him. There were three keepers to take him, but this time he controlled his reaction, mastered himself. He allowed them to. Tie his hands together into leather sleeves. Usually it was the jacket, but if he stayed calm they had no excuse for it in front of the manicured medical man. Christian knew. He'd become a connoisseur of bindings, an esthete, discriminating black degrees of mortification, least down to worst, leather sleeve, manacles, chair, straitjacket, cradle. He didn't look toward Maddie again. He took himself out of this place in his mind. That was the only hope, the only way to hang on. He went with the keepers down the stairs to the Cellars, let them put the full leather mask over his face, undress him, lead him blind and make him stand endlessly, waiting, never knowing when it would come, until they shoved him backwards into the bath. Ice Freeze cold hot agony ice. They pushed him down, more than once, using a metal bar across his neck to force his head under. 
The third time, the bar held him down until his chest began to grow tight, until his hands clenched and real fear surged through him, just that long. And when he came up, the ape bent over and looked through the isolates in the mask, through the frigid water dripping down, and grinned. Christian stared back. The mask was tight against his mouth and nose, wet. He panted with the cold. His body shuddered in uncontrollable seizures. They pulled him out and he stood there shaking, listening to them talk around him, shut out, streaming water, unable to see anything but a slit of light in front of him. The ape said something from just behind Christian and threw a towel over his shoulders. Christian stepped back hard, half-turning, driving his shoulder and elbow against the ape's body. The calf-high lip of the bath worked just as well on the ape as it did on Christian. His keeper grabbed at Christian's shoulder in a scramble for balance, fingers slipping on wet skin as Christian stepped away, and then a yell and a splash that sent water flying. Icy drops splattered over Christian's legs. The other two keepers found it hilarious. The cellar room echoed to their laughter and the sound of oceans of water sloshing. Christian stood still, unsmiling behind his mask. Huge slick flop whale blunder out. He held his place as he heard the ape come after him, water pouring and splashing over the stone floor. The metal bar smashed him across the back, exploding pain, stealing his breath, making him stumble for balance. But the other keepers hauled the ape off and managed to prevent a real bludgeoning. They constituted a certain check on one another, the keepers. They had their own crude code. They knew the ape had held him down too long. And Christian was, after all, a lunatic, allowed his little jokes. So the ape had gone to dry himself, and Christian, back in his cell in a blue dressing robe that didn't even belong to him, that disgusted him, had Matty for his valet. Dressed like peasant. Christian glared at the vulgar clothes laid out for him. What? he said. He crossed his arms and set his mouth, clamping his teeth to keep them from chattering tensing to prevent the shudder that overtook him and sent pain shafting through his back. The ape would have gotten help, tied him up and forced the lunatic's jacket on him instead. Christian waited to see what Maddie would do, trying to hide the shiver that came with every deep breath he drew. His hair was wet. He was cold to the bone. He had no intention of carrying any battle of wills far enough to chance getting the ape back. He wanted Maddie Girl desperately, her calm and straight spined figure sitting in the chair outside his cell, white stiff, cap, peace. Juan? she asked. He scowled at her. Wrong? Wrong, did she mean? Decent clothes. He wanted to snarl. No wretched raw bad so rubbish. He grabbed up the coat, meaning to point out the awkward stitching the ill-matched buttonholes, but he couldn't do it. He just held the coat, muddled again, stuck between the intention and the action. With a hot sound in his throat, he threw the garment down. A heavy shudder went through his frame. S.H. Bo? she said. She touched his hand, caught it between hers, and he couldn't hold himself still, couldn't conceal the cold tremors or contain the catch in his back on each indrawn breath. He pulled his hand away and went to the window, holding on to the bars that seemed hot beneath his freezing palms. She was silent for a long time behind him. He knew she could see the shaking. What difference did it make? He put his forehead against the bars and let it have him. The brass lever that controlled the bell creaked. No bell pull here. Too easy for a man to hang himself from the velvet rope. Christian had already thought of it, but they were well ahead of him. They had it all designed they'd been at it for. Years. A bumpkin keeper like the ape had a preternatural ability to anticipate resistance and counter it. Christian was taller, faster, younger. God knew. He hoped he had more brains. But the ape knew all the tricks. The razor and that incident in the bath had been the first real victories Christian had managed and his back ached and throbbed where the iron bar had struck him, sparking sharp agony whenever he turned. He heard the ape's voice in the hall intensed, 
starting another shiver in the depth of his muscles. But there was no sound of the barred door opening. Maddie spoke, the ape hesitated and then made a grunt of assent. His footsteps thudded away. Christian turned around. Maddie girl was looking at him, frowning a little, chewing her lower lip. As she met his eyes, she smiled briefly. I've Ruckholes, she said. Ruckholes? She pointed at the empty grate, hugged herself, and shivered. Coals. Coals fire, yes. They'd never done that before, only lit the grate at night. He wished to say thank you, and could not say it. He nodded briefly. She picked up the coat where he dropped it and offered it to him. As she held it out, he put his hand on the badly made. Collar ran his finger down it, pointed at the clumsy buttonholes. Donderstan, she said, looking up at him with a helpless expression. He gritted his teeth and shivered. All right. Try again. He touched her sleeve, moved his forefinger up the underside of her arm, where the tiny stitches were invisible, neat and elegant, if plain, as her black dress and white collar were plain. Then he traced the same seam on the coat. She looked from her own arm to the coat. She shook her head. I'm sorry, she said. Dunno. He gave it up, pulling the coat out of her hand and gesturing for her to leave, so he could dress. She just stood there. He took her by one shoulder, turned her, and pushed her toward the door. No. She set her feet against him and turned back. Famous dress. Coarse dress, yes, remove she, any female respectability, understand. But she stood stubbornly. The ape came clattering in with a pail of coals. Christian drifted back a little, away from him, prudent. The fire lit, they jabbered together, the ape shrugged and nodded at whatever she said, gave Christian a carefully neutral glance, and closed the solid door as he left, blocking out the hall. Christian stared at her. Not think. God sake, not suppose dress here full view she. But she did. She walked right up to him and took hold of the buttons on the robe and began to flick them open as if she'd done it every day of her life. Christian grabbed her wrist and thrust it away with an indignant sound. He gestured at the door and gave her another light shove. The schlark? she asked. He took a deep breath, straining for words. Han. She didn't seem to realize the depth of his disposition toward her, that he would go so far as to try to speak, to allow her to hear it. Lark? She said again, with her hand on the bell lever. He realized suddenly that she meant to call the ape. No! He shook his head. No! Sacrinus! She laid her hand on her breast. Verperience! A deep shiver went through him. He kept himself at a guarded distance from her. News, she said. Though. Nez. Nurse. Oh, dash nurse, was it? His nurse. And she supposed that just because she imagined herself a nurse, he would let her undress him as if he were some invalid child, did she? Maddie was secretly relieved when that familiar ironic smile appeared at the corner of his mouth. Clearly he was probing her position. If Larkin and Cousin Edward came back and found him still in the dressing robe, she would look as if she had no authority over the situation. While Cousin Edward's approval of her new responsibility was so precarious, she desperately wished to avoid any impression that Jervalks was becoming more unmanageable rather than less under her influence. It was more difficult than she'd expected to keep plainly in mind that he acted out of adult reasoning which might not be obvious to her. This interest in the seams on her dress and his coat, while he stood shaking with cold, baffled her. She wished to get him into good warm clothing, with his hair drying in front of the fire, and then later this evening, after Larkin took her place, she intended to examine into the true nature of the therapeutic baths. This time, when she picked up the shirt and went forward, Jervalk stood still, allowing her to approach him. 
Maddie had dressed her father a thousand times. She had her own routine, a system that required him to sit down, which Jervalks did docilely enough when she motioned toward the bed, though he grimaced a little as he did it. She began again to unbutton the robe. By the time she had released the first button, she was aware that he was watching her intently, his face near hers as she bent over. By the third, she had become very conscious that this man was not her papa, that the solid shape of shoulder and muscle beneath the dressing robe was nothing like. By the sixth, the perception of his breath, soft and steady on her hands as she worked, seemed intimate beyond anything proper or acceptable. She lifted her eyes. His one-sided smile deepened. He lifted his hand and drew his forefinger down the line of her jaw, catching her chin, raising it a little. Their eyes were at level, inches apart. His were dark blue. Maddie pulled herself back. She stood straight, her shoes making a loud sound on the wooden floor as she shifted. He rose. Without a word, he declared himself ruler of the moment. He lifted his eyebrows a little, as if to ask if she wished to continue. Maddie looked at the open gap in the dressing robe and away from it, having stumbled into something unexpectedly beyond her competence. He shrugged. The robe slipped from his shoulders and fell at his feet. He held out his hand for the shirt. She really was very experienced, as a nurse. She bathed and dressed a number of patients, not all female. She was frequently called upon when a member of the meeting needed attendance. And of course, she'd always cared for her father. He was not her father. He was not a child, nor elderly nor ill. He was something she had never in her life seen before, a man in the full, she could only call it glory, of height and bone and strength of adulthood, standing without a stitch upon him, his hand open for his shirt. Every fiber in her wanted to shove the garment at him and rush out of the room but she saw the mocking smile and the anger in it. His body was imposing in the small cell, broad-shouldered and powerful. Imposed on her, and he knew it. He meant it to frighten her. It did. At least, it felt something like fear, this mortified agitation. She saw the strength, but she saw too the symmetry, the superb length and shape of muscle. Her flustered alarm was mixed up with a dash of plain creaturely admiration that anyone could stand so, tall and straight and insolent, just the way God had made him. And God had made him in a striking and brilliant way. A miracle of life breathed into clay. It seemed no more wrong to take note of it than to take delight in the flight of a hawk over the fields outside. That hawk had seemed a marvel to her, a city. Dweller all her life and the unclothed figure of a man no less novel and dramatic. She laid the shirt in his hand. He swept it up and pulled it on, with a faint hiss between his teeth, jerking his head to settle the fabric over his ears. The white cotton fell free down to his thighs. He took a step past her as if she didn't exist and reached for the folded stockings and breeches. Maddie turned away to the window, having understood his message quite clearly. She gripped her hands together, working her fingers, feeling impelled to apologize but too chagrined to try. Worldly arrogance and wickedness were not things she'd been brought up to respect, but it was somehow fine that in spite of this place, his affliction, in spite of everything, he asserted his disdain for the circumstances. He was not only a human being, he was a duke, and not about to allow anyone to overlook it. Certainly not one plain Quaker nurse. She waited until she heard no more sounds of movement behind her. Just as she was about to turn, he startled her into a jump when he laid his hand on her shoulder. He was dressed, more or less. The waistcoat, breeches and coat hung unbuttoned, and the shirt cuffs seemed to be lost somewhere up inside the coat's sleeves. He stood scowling at her ferociously, his jaw working. Then he took a step back and held out both his hands. It was a strangely vulnerable gesture, abrupt and reluctant. He looked, not at her, but down at his wrists, as a monarch would look at unruly subjects, offended and enraged at once. 
Maddie reached out and slipped her fingers inside the sleeves, one after the other, pulling the shirt down and buttoning the cuffs. She looked up at him. No, he said with a brisk nod, which she took to mean yes, she'd done right. The breeches buttoned on two sides of the fall. Maddie waited to be asked this time, having learned her lesson. He made a brief attempt to close one button on the left side with his left hand, then gave a harsh exhalation and caught her wrist. She took a step closer under the imperious tug and quickly did up the buttons on both sides, closing the breeches over the ample tail of the shirt, stepping back as soon as she'd finished. For her service, she received another nod. His easy hauteur dismissed any hint of personal intimacy. He picked up the cravat off the table and handed the neckpiece to her. She tied it on tiptoe, while he stood with his chin lifted. When she'd finished, he felt the knot, which was the simple style that she tied for her father, and shook his head impatiently. I don't know another way. She lifted her open palms and gave a helpless shrug. For a moment, she feared that he would grow angry. His frown deepened ominously, but then his mouth flattened. He cast a glance of amused exasperation at the ceiling. With a little flick of his hand at the loose waistcoat, he demanded that it be fastened, too. Maddie did so. The garment didn't fit him well. It was ill-made and too tight. The buttons pulled in an unsightly manner. She wondered that he tolerated it, as fastidious as she knew he'd been in his tailoring. He seemed to accept it, though, turning away from her and taking up the damp towel to dry his hair. Next to the metal washbasin, a comb lay, that he used with no hesitation. Having combed the left side of his head with his left hand, he stopped. He put the comb down on the table and stood still a moment, looking at it. He glanced at Maddie, opening and closing his fingers uneasily. Then he shut his eyes, felt for the comb, and picked it up with his right hand, finishing the other side. The only sane aspect of this strange little ritual was that he seemed embarrassed to have done it. He glanced at her again, making a defiant jerk of his chin as he tossed the comb with a clatter onto the table. Warned off so clearly, Maddie behaved as if she'd seen nothing in the least odd about his action. She pointed to the fire which had finally begun to cast effective heat. Wilt thou sit down and warm thyself, friend? After the small hesitation that seemed to characterize his every response, he went to the chair, pulled it up to the grate, and hoisted his leg over the seat, facing the back with one elbow propped on the top rail like some bored and moody porter awaiting orders in a hallway. Maddie opened the wooden door and went about straightening the room, what little there was to straighten. The clean bed linens lay in a stack just inside the door a daily amenity that was one of Blythedale's choice services. Maddie made up the bed, embarrassed by the straps and manacles that had to be draped aside while she changed the sheets. She was aware of him watching her. Instead of laying the restraints neatly over the bedclothes, as she'd seen they were usually left, she lifted the mattress and shoved them underneath, not without some twisting and stretching and ungraceful heaving to manage it. When she stood up, breathless, pushing back a strand of Hair that had escaped her cap, Jervox's smile derided her effort. His jaw tightened, he gritted his teeth and said, Ape! Then he worked to speak again, uttering half-sounds, unavailing beginnings of the same syllable. Finally he gave a frustrated exhalation, made as if to pull hard with both his arms from the direction of the bed, and exclaimed, Out! Maddie plumped herself down on the mattress. She shrugged. Let him work for it then. He tipped an imaginary hat to her and grinned. He looked very unprincipled and rakish when he did that. Wouldst thou like tea? Tea, he said. Thou wouldst like. He wasn't looking at her. Tea, tea, tea. He closed his eyes. Tea. Tea. Lines in the inversive plane. A point is that which has no part. A line is a breathless length. The extremities of a line are points. A straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself. T, T, T. 
He opened his eyes, wet his lips as he looked at her. His jaw tensed again. Hun, ah. He blew air out of his cheeks fiercely. From some room down the hall, a patient began yelling at the top of his lungs, clashing metal, demanding that Dr. Timms and the Holy Ghost come and wrestle with him. Jervaltz grasped the rounded finials on the chair and put his forehead down on the top rail. He is sane, Matty told the reasoner stubbornly. He is perfectly sane. She gathered up the bed linens with the dressing robe and damp towel and went to the door. The mortise lock made a loud clunk as she turned the key. The bars rang as she closed the door behind her. He didn't move or raise his head, but his fingers were dead white with strain where he gripped the chair. His portfolio contained fifteen letters from a lady de Marley and sixty-one from the Duchess, his mother. Maddie skimmed most of these. The Duchess wrote to her son each and every day, and appeared to find that words flowed from her pen with copious ease. She wrote of her evangelical work, and her reverent thoughts and prayerful hopes of his recovery. She expressed complete confidence in Dr. Tim's moral therapy and told of how very much it comforted her to know that Christian was under his care at Blydale. She begged her son to consider the consequences of his wickedness, to walk in the paths of righteousness, to repent the sins of pride and vanity and idleness, to repudiate the weakness of the flesh, and considerably more along these lines, sentiments which could not in any way be faulted and which succeeded in making Mattie feel quite cross. She found Lady de Marley more sensible. Her letters were directed not to Jervaux, but to the doctor, requesting clarifications of his reports and prognosis. In the fourth one that she read, Maddie found what she'd been searching for, a reference to the accompanying trunk and an attached list of the autumn wardrobe that it contained. She took the list to Cousin Edward where he was completing his daily notations at his desk in the inner office. He's quiet, the doctor said with no need to explain of whom he spoke. I looked in while you were at dinner. He leaned back in his chair with a sigh. What am I to think? It may only be coincidence, you know. I can't feel at ease to leave. You exposed to his temper. Maddie felt it prudent to ignore the vacillation in his tone. I've finished the filing and the accounts. Wilt. Will you require any dictation? And that is the other thing. What of the post that you're to fill for me? I shall do whatever is necessary. I shan't mind working into the evening, while Papa doesn't need me. I don't like it. I don't like it. Maddie stood silently. I'm surprised, shocked, that your father has agreed to allow it. Deeply shocked, considering the impropriety and the hazard to your person. Papa is fond of Jervalks. I'm afraid that the Jervalks whom he knew is gone. Dead. I've tried to explain it to him, but he's as stubborn as you are. Maddie had only silence for this, too. And Blydale's reputation. If you were to be injured by a male patient, imposed upon, do you know what I mean? His face grew crimson. He pulled a key from his waistcoat pocket, examining it closely. Cousin, it could ruin me. I'm sorry, Maddie said sincerely. But I, how can I turn away from a concern? I never thought. I've never had a leading before, but this one is so deep and strong that everything before it seems. Spiritless. He unlocked a drawer, reached into his desk and drew out a pipe, filling and lighting it. The sweet smell blossomed in the neat room. Well, here then. Take this notebook, he said roughly. I want you to write down your observations on a daily basis. We shall give it a little time. But be careful, Maddie. Be so careful. I promise thee I shall. He took a deep draw on the pipe. He's to go up to London soon for his hearing. Hearing? Maddie asked diffidently. Competency hearing before chancery. It's a common thing with this class of patient. They have property. They're men of affairs. He has to be declared non compass have a guardian appointed. Confounded nuisance it is, too. 
never fails to get them tumultuous beyond any mastery, taking them out into public that way, having questions thrown at them, stood up before a jury and such. I don't look forward to it with him, I'll tell you that. I hear he tossed Larkin into the bath this morning. He ought to be disciplined for it. Tossed? Maddie bit her lip. Art thou certain? Of course I'm certain. Do you think the attendants fabricate these things? Jervalks was very cold when he was brought back upstairs. He was shivering. That is the nature of a cold bath. I can't think that such an extreme measure can be good for his health. Cousin Edward thumped his pipe on the table, emptying the bowl. And when did you receive your physician's? Certificate, Cousin Maddie? She decided that it was not in the interest of her ultimate objective to answer that. There were times when the injunction to let one's words be few was most fitting. He cleaned the pipe with a silver hook and looked speculatively at her. Perhaps if all goes well, you shall accompany us to London. Do you think you can keep him in order? Yes, she said, and hoped the word came from somewhere and someone else, out of power and knowledge greater than her. Own. We'll take Larkin anyway. She held out the list she'd found in the file. His family has sent clothing. What he's wearing now doesn't fit him. We don't give the violent patients expensive clothes. They're too inclined to tear them off. Perhaps because they don't fit. Cousin Edward shook his head. You'll learn, my dear. You'll learn differently, I'm afraid. Put his valuable clothes on him. Chapter 7 In the silence of the deserted family parlor, Maddie found it strange and impertinent to open Jervox's safe box, as if she were rifling through someone's home when they were out. Strange, and somehow painful, to touch these things that she never in her life would have conceived of touching. The box accommodated the key to his trunk, a gold watch with a heavy official seal and magnifying glass hung upon its chain, a massive gold signet ring, an ivory-handled razor and a pair of spurs with buckled straps. Maddie squinted down at the ring, and then held it up to the candle with the magnifier. The metal band was thick, the edges smooth with wear. It fit, without catching, right over her thumb. Beneath the fleur de lis and phoenix crest, the carved banner read a bon chat, bon rat. To a good cat, a good rat. Even Maddie's schoolroom French was up to that, and if the meaning were not clear enough, it was spelled out in English, too, retaliation in kind. A vigorous and rather pugnacious sentiment. She slipped. The ring into her pocket with the trunk key. She took the spurs, also. In town, gentlemen wore spurs about everywhere, all the time. They seemed to be a sort of fashionable ornament. In the attic, among the other boxes and valises, Candlelight immediately caught the gleam of the elegantly black lacquered chest with the Duke's card inserted in a brass holder. The trunk was packed full with the finest made clothes she'd ever handled, shirts of choice linen, warm under waistcoats, soft as the skin. Beneath her chin, silk-lined coats laid between silver tissue, the buttons mother of pearl, the braces embroidered all up and down their length. It didn't seem so personal to rummage through the trunk as in the safe box. He never touched these things. They were all new, smelling of dye and the herbs packed with them. She tried to recall what he'd worn the night she and Papa had dined with him, and searched out a dark green coat as the most similar color. She'd never dressed in colors herself. Doubt in her choices kept her conservative. She discarded an overwaist coat embroidered in the most lovely purple and gold hues, deciding that a striped combination of wine and rust and tan was more inconspicuous. Finally she took up the most informal looking of the pairs of boots and carried it all downstairs to her room. Having copied out and posted the patient's schedules from Cousin Edward's notes, she knew that no one was to undergo the therapeutic baths because of an outing plan for the Orderly patients. After their departure, each of the remaining male patients were listed to be shaved at quarter-hour intervals. In Cousin Edward's notes, 
Larkin had been written beside the Duke's name for this operation. Maddie had substituted her own. Since the doctor was going on the outing, she felt safe to do so without precipitating a lengthy and unpredictable conversation on the matter. However, when she arrived at Jervox's room after helping to see off the carriages, Larkin was already there with the basin and towel. He looked in need of a shave himself. Maddie took. No notice of his sour mood, but simply lifted the basin from his hand. The razor in it made a metallic sound as it slid against the side of the bowl. You'll want help, miss, he said. I warn ye. A drop of water wet her finger. She looked down and saw a sheen of soapy iridescence in the basin. This is dirty, she said. Indeed it ain't. The doctor won't have that. I wiped it clean after Harry finished. She glanced from the towel slung over his shoulder, visibly damp, to the razor blade. The handle was worn with use, the blade sharp but nicked. Inside the cell, Jervox was already in a straight waistcoat, held by straps around both his upper arms that were tethered to bolts in the wall. His eyes when they met hers were like a wolf's in a cave, blazing, unblinking, silent. Maddie held herself still. Very still. Then she said in a painstakingly calm voice to Larkin, Fetch the hot water, if thou wouldst. I shall return in a moment. The man-man's jacket made him frantic, and the ape knew it. It touched off a nightmare dread Christian had never known he had inside him, a fear that went past reason and pride. Straight to a well of primeval impulse that made him fight it. Every time, long after he knew himself damned, long after he'd learned he could not win. His throat ached where the ape had used something new this time, an India rubber garrote, adept at his little murders while Christian was still shackled in bed, driving him down to unconsciousness, pure horror, an instant black and he came up gasping, reflexive struggling, with the side of his face pushed into the floor, a knee on his neck and lancing pain in his back, three keepers leaning over him while they talked to one another in cheerful, ordinary tones. They hauled him up bodily while he was still trying to find himself an heir. He discovered the jacket, that involuntary terror, utter helplessness, no way to balance and no way to save himself, an easy push from behind and he was falling whichever direction they shoved him because with his arms bound across him every move was strange, bewildering. His body lost proper connection with his mind, his limbs defied him, his legs refused to take the step to steady him, a keeper. Caught him before he fell, with a short, half-laughing exclamation, and shouldered him against the wall. Christian locked glances with the man, and the keeper instantly looked away. He patted Christian's cheek and said something in a fatherly fashion as the others strapped him into place. While Christian stood in humiliated, imprisoned frenzy. Breathing like an enraged bull, the extra help left and the ape went about the morning routine. It defiled Christian near to madness. He wished desperately for Maddie and was sick with fear that she would come now, before it was done. But the ape finished and wrote his loathsome things in a book and went away and left him alone. Christian was going to kill him. Someday. Someday. He didn't think of how. He thought of the look on the ape's face, the relish of terror, the time it would take. He'd once seen two men hanged and quartered, the expression of the second condemned traitor as he watched the executioner cut down and butcher the first. That was the fear, that was the struggle, the prolonged kicking and spasms. That was the cringing, weeping, purple-faced, swollen-tongued, bloated, sickening, twitching, entrails, sliding agony he was going to inflict. He thought of that with berserk pleasure until Matty Girl came. She jarred him yet, the transition from night to day, from nightmare vengeance to daylight purity. It was almost more than he could bear. He'd thought himself driven to the limit before, but with each morning she brought reason, then left him to the dark and the ape whose mood took a deeper turn now every night. Christian began to see that he'd had it easy. His throat throbbed from the garrote. 
he prayed to God that his family hadn't forgotten him, that his name protected him, because it would be so simple to keep that stranglehold an instant too long, so easy, and he felt deserted, discarded, disowned. He had no reason to believe there was anything left of the universe but this cell and the hallway, and what he could see from the window. And Maddie. Maddie girl. Standing in the hall in the white scoop bonnet, holding a shaving basin, gazing at him in his shackles. The ape hated her. Christian saw it in his eyes when he looked at her from behind, saw it deepen with each small confrontation, the half of them over things Christian couldn't even follow. He was afraid for her, wished her to stay away and craved for her to come, without words to caution her or warn her off, in the end, not brave enough to hope to be left alone here. She looked shocked, as she had when she first seen him. And then her whole figure seemed to grow hushed and motionless. He already dreamed about her voice. It was like a river talking, sliding between serene banks. When she spoke, the sounds made him close his eyes and imagine he understood. Water? Woods? Ritter? He opened them, and she was gone. The ape looked at him through the bars. Just looked, without smiling, without. Frowning, one long knowing moment. Then he winked and. Whistled low, as if to a dog, and walked down the hall. When she came back, she would not let the ape in. She unlocked the door, opened it only far enough to slip inside and pulled it hard out of the ape's hand as he tried to come behind her with the steaming water bucket. The bars shut with a ringing crash. Christian saw the ape's expression as water splashed on his leg and the floor. Maddie Girl set the copper bowl on the table, turned and faced the keeper. Her hands were at her waist, her back rigid. She added. The ape's ferocity had vanished before she turned. He gave her a hurt look. Lee there, she said in a voice so still and controlled that it even impressed Christian. Fast her dutes. The ape's mouth worked in an ugly way. He dropped the bucket, splashing half the water over the floor, and left. Without an instant's hesitation, she came to Christian and began to work at the straps that held his arms. She didn't look up at him, but released each one with a sharp pressure and yank. Freed from the wall, he stood balanced over his feet, unable to step forward in the jacket. Can I do buckle? she said tartly, still not looking up at him. The angry color was very high in her cheeks. He closed his eyes. Because it was the only thing he could manage, he lowered himself, bending both his legs at once. He rocked forward onto his knees on the floor, drawing in his breath against the pane where the ape had hit him, and waited. His shoulders back, staring straight ahead. She did nothing for a moment. He knew what she must think, how strange he appeared. He gritted his teeth together. Off. Vile foul loathsome thing off. Untessery the duat, she said, as she knelt behind him and unbuckled the jacket, releasing the taut pressure that held his arms bound across him. She pulled the restraint forward off his shoulders, leaving him bare-chested. It took several seconds before he could command his hands. He flexed his arms wide, until he hit the shaft of agony in his back. The ringers at the end of his limbs seemed to become his. Again, instead of objects without purpose, things that had nothing to do with himself or his intentions. As soon as he felt capable of doing it, he pushed up off the floor, wincing. Maddie stood, too, dusting at her skirt with the jacket. He took her by both shoulders, pulled her close to him, and kissed her mouth. It was short and hard. He pushed her back away and let go immediately so that the stiff reaction that sprang into her spine wouldn't turn into real fear. It was just surprise, he thought, watching her, watching shock and bewilderment and indignation and chagrin chase themselves across her face. Friend, she said in a confounded tone. Friend, he echoed. It just came, without volition, meaning nothing. But he looked at her, Maddie girl with her red cheeks her lifted chin, the narrow spinster nose with the stubborn bump in it, and if he'd lain down more times than he could count with women. 
more elegant and comely, he'd never seen anything as beautiful. As Maddie in her starched, thin, white head sugar, then Maddie in this prison cell. Love, he said. Love. He amazed himself and her. They stood looking at one another. The thin morning light fell down through the bars on the window, catching her cheek and sultry lashes. That serious, pensive mouth of hers took on a dry, uneasy curve. She swung the jacket on her finger. Easy conca style. Friend, he repeated, with a hesitant smile. Maddie. Friend? Only friend? She made a mock pout. Though toward bow. Though? That he couldn't say. Or preferred not to attempt. Her color was still high. Her teasing had an edge of nerves. He was offended that she'd make a jest of it. With a moody grunt, he turned away. Thy back! She exclaimed. A stood done? He sat down in the chair, facing the rungs. Every move hurt. He was fairly certain that his, his, what? Inside, white, hard, curved frame. He was injured. Crack. Bone. He looked at her defiantly, silently. D.I.S.T. fall? She demanded. Moving behind him, she reached toward his bare back. He tensed in anticipation, but her contact was featherlight, tracing the outline of what Christian imagined must be a flaming bruise. Hurt? She asked. He shook his head. No. Her fingers moved. The next touch made him flinch and expel a harsh sound through his teeth. Ah, she said, and touched again along the bone. Here? He nodded once. The probe came again, and he made a short, affirmative groan. He held onto the chair and endured the exploration, until one contact shot pain like a stake through his. Back. His head came up. The involuntary jerk was worse than the touch. Fracture, she said. Mercifully, she didn't touch him again. Cousin had been tonight. Fall? It dawned on him that he could understand her, enough to work meaning out of what she said. He labored for the word, and got it. Fall. No chance he was going to blame the ape. He could see easily enough where that would lead. How fall? She asked. He just looked at her. With a slight pursing of her lips, a little frown, she regarded him. Where? He shrugged, grimaced at the pain of the unthinking movement. That dissatisfied her, he could tell. She wished to do something, make some adjustment, remove some hazardous obstacle. That was fine. As long as she didn't go accusing the ape. He grabbed the chair back and tilted it beneath him. Miming, leaning over perilously. As he let it fall back with a thump that jarred him painfully, her face lit in comprehension. Oh, chair. Chair Felver? He inclined his head. Famous Kerf. She reached out and touched his shoulder. Move slow. Artipetuous. Impetuous. He was that. He shouldn't have kissed her. It embarrassed him now. Look at him. Look at him here, in this place, befuddled, as dumb as an animal, with grunts and manual acts for speech. Couldn't even button his own damned. What, what? Christ, he could look down at what he meant, these things on his legs, but the word just hung out of reach, impossible. Damn. Damn bloody hell shit damn damn damn. Damn. Those words he knew. He could have said them, too. He'd tried it, when he was alone, a whole list of curses in English and Italian and German and French. They were like mathematics. They were right there ready when everything else was inaccessible. She held out the shaving bowl toward him and ran her finger around it. Clean, she said. That was a change. He nodded. She went to the door and opened it, bending over to retrieve the bucket. Christian thought suddenly that it would be easy to stand up and shove past her. It would be easy to escape. And in the same instant that he thought it he was on his feet. 
She turned around, pulling the bucket into the room. The lock clashed shut. Christian stared at her, breathing hard. She didn't even realize it. She didn't know how simple it would have been. The ape had never, never, given him such a clear chance. And she'd do it again, because she didn't know. He felt dizzy with agitation. Excitement and a strange kind of fear thudded with his heart. If he got out that door, if he left this cell, what would he do? Where would he go? Run. Run. Yes, his body was ready, but his brain seemed an uproar of confusion. Left, right, which way would he turn? He couldn't even be certain of that, and it seemed vitally important. There would be stairs. Stairs, doors, corners, the gardens, walls. Damn. Maddie Girl was looking at him, her expression cautious, daunted. He realized that he was standing with his fists clenched, his whole body taut and explosive. S.H.V.O.? He would take her with him. He needed her. The thought of walking out into the world by himself seemed appalling, appalling and sweet. He wanted it so badly that he felt hot wetness burning behind his eyes. She watched him, waiting. With an effort that took everything he had, he put his hand on the chair and sat down again. He blinked twice, hard. She smiled. Christian let go of the breath that fought to. Leave his chest. He made his arms relax. Here, she said. Brought thy rays. He looked at her, confounded. Here. It appeared suddenly, almost under his nose. He started back. In her hand lay a razor, not the ape's dull butcher knife, but one like his own, precisely curved, steel and pearl. His own razor. And his own, finger, gold, family. Ring, she said. His ring. He took it from her in his left hand. He held it. Dost a member ring? Of course he remembered it. It was his signet, golden and heavy in his palm. He couldn't think what to do with it. Not member? She reached for it. No! His fingers closed hard. If she would just give him time, let him think. He started to put it on. His hand held it against the back of his other hand. That wasn't right. He spread his fingers out, as wide as they would spread. He kept losing the hand where it should go, and then suddenly finding it again. In his mind, he could see the ring on his finger. He just could not seem to reckon how to get it there. Perhaps he was mad. Maybe he only thought he was saying. It was like looking at a box, knowing there was a simple way to open it, and turning it over and over, unable to find a seam. He began to grow angry. His own goddamned ring. He closed his eyes. Sometimes that worked when he got... Confused, helped to clear his brain. He felt the ring, rolled it in his left hand, then put it between his palms. He turned his right hand over, and the ring slipped away and thudded on the floor. Christ. He stared at it, breathing hard through his nose. The pungent burn behind his eyes began to come back. Maddie retrieved the ring. She moved as if to put it back in her pocket. He stood up, seized the chair and swung it, sending it crashing against the table and the wall. A chunk of plaster flew free. The chair fell back, swayed for an instant on one leg, and toppled to the floor. No, he said. He held out his open hand. S.H.V.O., give! Her color was high. She put her chin up and pointed at the chair. The moose no throw. Set right. He blew out a hissing breath of fury at this impertinence. She held the ring behind her back. It was nothing to wrench her arm in front of her, and when he couldn't empower his other hand to take advantage of the access, he pressed her wrist between his fingers until she cried out and dropped both the ring and the razor. He swept the signet up and laid it on the table. He held the edge with his left hand, located his right and put it down flat, slid his fingers until the ring caught on the tip of the third and by working the band with his right thumb and the seal against the table surface, 
managed to shove it over his knuckle into place. That wasn't the proper way to do it. There was another way, but he had the signet on his finger where it ought to be, and he'd done it himself. He looked up at Matty Girl in triumph. She moved close to the door, holding her wrist, chafing her fingers up and down it. He turned toward her, and she backed away. That stopped him, held him frozen. It dawned on him that he'd hurt her. What was happening to him? He didn't know what to do. He stood there a long moment, working the underside of the ring with his thumb. She had that worry look, the worst look. He'd rather have her chin lifted and her meddlesome nurse roll than that. Humbly, he turned around and picked up the chair, set it right. He found the chunk of wall plaster and placed it carefully underneath the hole. He would have repaired it if he'd had the means. The razor lay on the floor where it had skittered off under the window. He picked it up. She made a faint sound and caught at the door behind her. She had the key in her hand. So naive. Two steps, he'd have her and the key in freedom. The ape never gave him such opportunities. Christian held the razor. She looked utterly terrified, but stood her ground. He didn't like the look. He didn't like it that she was so stupid as to be brave with him. What if he were really crazy? He could kill her in ten seconds. No way on earth she could get that door unlocked fast enough. The ape knew. The ape planned every move on that knowledge. That was the reason for the jacket and garrote and chains. All these madmen in this place. Why hadn't anyone told her to be careful? He frowned down at the razor. Then he put it beside the copper bowl on the table, poured lukewarm water and sat down in the chair, attempting to look contrite. It was not his greatest forte. If he'd had words, had himself, flowers, notes, diamonds, waltzes, he knew how to disarm a skittish female. She watched him for a long, long moment. Then she wriggled her wrist a little, as if testing it. With her small, dry smile, she said, Look pup dog, S.H. Vo. Well, hell. More like thou, she said. She actually laughed, and he realized his repentant expression had turned into a scowl. But her unease had vanished. She dropped the key in her pocket and walked to the table. He sat quite still as she shaved him. The good razor and her deft touch made it better than the ape's bloodbath, even with the water gone cold, which he supposed he deserved. Sitting backwards in the chair, he tilted his head for her, lifting his jaw, so that she could reach without bending so far. He began to smile inwardly. Her Quaker clothes, adorned only with a crossed white scarf at the neckline, weren't made to be viewed from this angle. With his lashes lowered, he could see down the front of her plain bodice, an enjoyable view, a school but pleasure, but he was reduced to such small satisfactions. He had no intention of foregoing this one. She finished all too expeditiously. He watched her clean the razor and the bowl with neat, practiced movements and knew how tigers in the zoo must feel, watching warm temptation pass. So close to their cage. Only this enticement was bolted inside with him, until she gathered the shaving utensils and carried them out, another clear chance, so easy, and the bars rang closed. She would do it again. Over and over again. He had to think. He had to get control of his clouded brain and think. Chapter 8 The instant that he saw the new clothes, Maddie could feel the swift rise of his mood. Though he did no more than look at them and touch them, pick up the spurs and hold them, the expectation in his face when he turned to her was something far beyond mere shirt and coat. She thought he was going to embrace her again. She stepped backwards, but he only pushed at her shoulder, a hint that she obeyed with alacrity, stepping into the hall and closing the solid wooden door behind her. After a few minutes, a single sharp thud from inside signaled her to unlock it. He held out his hands, impatient while she managed the cufflinks. She tied his neckpiece. He rested his boot on the chair and shoved one of the spurs onto his heel held the strap and jerked his head for her to come. 
She bent over, buckling the leather across the instep, tightening it down against pure black luxury. Supple, shiny, expensive, no months of blisters and dye. Stained stockings, no paper stuffed toes would be required to. Break in these boots. She felt his attention, intense and close on the simple task. As she found the tiny hole for the buckle, he touched her hands, a searching contact, the way her father felt over objects to identify them. She slowed her movement, opening her hands so that he could see what her fingers did as she tucked the end of the leather through its keeper. He changed legs, shoved the other spur home. His hand hovered over the dangling strap. He laid it across the boot, staring at it. Here. Maddie took his hands in hers, closed his fingers around the strap and buckle, guiding one through the other. It was awkward. Through five attempts with both of them leaning over his boot, Maddie tried to direct his hands and ignore the increasing rhythm of his breathing, the spiraling of frustration that she perceived in his tensing muscles. Bent so close to him, his size and strength felt substantial, an intimidating potential for explosion. At last the strap caught through the buckle. She grabbed at it before it slipped out, pressed the end between his fingers, bent it back, simple and complex, his hands like a child's, untutored, and like a man's, firm and powerful, too large for her to direct readily. She pressed his thumb against the catch. Miraculously, it found the hole on the first try. He made a sound, a noise in his throat of success and anger. Maddie guided his hands to finish the task, slide the keeper. Upward, push the strap through. Another try, another failure. He groaned beneath his breath. But he kept holding the strap and the keeper, a death grip that hindered more than helped. She nudged his finger onto the impeding upward twist at the end of the strap, holding down the curl. Now push it in, she said. He did nothing, just held them. She glanced up at him sideways. His face was close to hers, closer than any man she'd ever known but her father. He looked at her beneath black lashes. He closed his eyes and moved his hands. The strap slipped into the keeper. There. Thou hast it. She let go and stood back. He straightened, his boots still propped on the chair. They were both breathing as if they'd been running hard. Go, he said with difficulty. He grinned at her. It was only then, as she saw him there in top boots and spurs, leather breeches, vented green coat, as smart and rakish as any gentleman who had ever paid court to the ladies' carriages in Rotten Row, that she realized what she'd done. She dressed him to ride. And he looked at her, charged with anticipation, ignited in expectation of it. Go, he said again, the effort a sharp exhalation. Without speaking, she shook her head. She had nothing to say. It had been her own ignorant. Enthusiasm, thinking she knew anything about what he would. Wish to wear, thinking green would complement rust and tan. And where had she seen that combination and style every day of her life, pray, but among the gentlemen who rode their burnished mounts in the fashionable squares and streets? In the silence, his grin failed. He looked at her intently, as if by concentration alone he could find what he desired in her expression. She pressed her lips together, helpless to repair the blunder now. She shook her head again. Disillusion chilled his face, turned his aspect to dark ice. He gave her one look, one instant that asked why, and then turned away from her. His hand hovered over the buckled spur. He gazed down at it. With his right hand he worked it free. He propped the left boot up and yanked that spur free with his left hand. He stood holding the spurs, staring down at the chair. In profile, a still and intense emotion carved his mouth and cheek. He made no other move, just stood immobile, but Maddie found her feet moving her backward toward the door and safety. She reached for the key in her pocket. He looked toward her, and not even when he'd looked at Larkin had she seen that depth of venom and contempt in his face. A thread of terror formed and spiraled in her throat. She looked down sideways and fitted the key into the lock. 
apprehensive even to turn her back on him completely. She swung open the bars and slipped through. The iron door never shut softly. It always locked into place with a loud reverberation of metal on metal. He walked to the door. Without thinking, Maddie moved back, even though protected by the bars. One by one, he held up the spurs and dropped them through. They clanged on the metal and hit the floor with a dead thump. Christian lay on the bed, listening to the sounds of the madhouse. He hated her. False thee thou pious bitch. To join them after all, treat him to her own little crazy begetting games, nothing so crude as the ice bath, nothing he might have expected, have armed himself against. Oh, no, much subtler than that, but devastating. To make him hope. To make him believe in her. To make him look a fool, a child, a helpless, inept idiot. He thought they were going. Where, how, why, none of that had mattered. Only to go. Only his freedom. Out of the cage with her for assurance that he could manage in the outside. He hated her. Hated her. Hate, hate, hate her cold blood faithless bitch. Mixed up with it was the pain, a different rancor from the pure and honest malice he had for the ape. To the ape, he was a moving piece of meat, an ox to be trussed and prodded like all the other mad and dangerous dumb beasts in this place. It had been, Christian understood, nothing personal, until Maddie had come and toppled the keeper off his throne. It was personal. Now, and that too was her doing. He hated her. He felt ashamed. His back ached with the ape's punishment, bound now tight white hard to breath. That the humiliation of hope and disappointment could be more fierce than anything the ape had done to him was a bitter revelation. He trusted her, let her see his confusion and hear him speak, guide his hands in their awkward futility. She had brought him his own clothes, helped him strap on spurs, made him into a mirage of himself. Why, 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 Maddie girl? Why give him that hope? Just to take it from him? Just for the power to shake her head? Stand there with her key, so easy to conquer, and step out into where he could not go. Could not. Would not. Was afraid to go alone. He put his hands over his eyes and through his hair, defying the sharp agony in his back. He'd never known he would be a coward, afraid of what he wanted so intensely. He hated her the worse for showing him the reality of himself, that he preferred this animal cell to wrenching the key from her hand and walking on his own out that door. He rolled off the bed, breathing hard against the hurt. Up, he prowled the room, touched each of the few things in it. He found comfort in the table, precisely in its familiar place, the chair just a hand's width from the fireplace grate. Any changes in the room made him angry. He was afraid only a crazy person cared so much about such things, and tried not to care, and still. Did. He looked down at his feet in the top boots. A madman. Crazy, mute, imprisoned animal. He caught the bars on the door and shook them against the steel frame, filling the room and hall with clanging metal. No, Maddie girl. Hear this? Understand feel no self, no pride, sick shame dress coat boots spurs can't go. Understand? He jolted the bars violently. He knew she could hear him. He knew she was sitting in her straight-backed chair, just out of his sight. She didn't come. He sat down, stood up, walked the room again. A thought came to him, a man-man's thought the kind of thought he would not ever in his real life have entertained. But here there was no such thing as honor. Here there was only brute force and feeling, and he was going to make her understand. He was going to make her know how it felt to be broken down to the last depth of disgrace, to lose every rag of self-respect. Lure her to her own shame, make her bring it upon herself, as she had seduced him so easily into hot humiliation. Prim thee thou spinster Puritan, he knew exactly how he was going to do it. She did not come back. He spent the long day locked up and dressed as if he were a human being, bored and belittled to a passion. Not only a beast, 
but now a dancing bear complete. With waistcoat, pearl studs and embroidered braces. Near dark, the sounds of arrival in the courtyard drew him to his window. He watched three carriages being emptied of their occupants, saw Maddie and the ape and some other keepers divide and shepherd the group inside. The vehicles rolled away, but Maddie and a young man lingered in the drive. The fellow talked to her earnestly, the words distant and impossible for Christian. He leaned his cheek on the bars, watching her listen, seeing her nod and smile as the young man laughed in a giddy way between his sentences. Another lunatic. Christian despised her patronizing politeness. She would have smiled and nodded just so at him, wouldn't she? Indulging crazy children and animals. Not him. She wasn't going to think of him that way. Instead of Maddie, it was the ape who brought his dinner. The keeper was in a hurry and appeared to take no note when Christian didn't resist the evening routine. Only when he allowed himself to be shackled without defiance did the ape pause and frown at him. Christian met his speculative glance with cold neutrality. Choke got think, eh? The ape grinned and gave him a push, almost friendly. Christian thought of all the methodical and bloody ways to kill him. He stared at the keeper, unblinking. The ape, no fool, grunted and took his hand away. They understood one another. To lie chained in the dark and plan a seduction required a potent bend of reality. A twist of ferocity and humor, too. Swallow his affliction whole, to face the truth of himself, and... Then proceed as if it were merely an inconvenience, a husband or a lover, a perverse floor plan of widely separate bedrooms in a country house, an inquisitive aunt or cousin, something to be worked around in pursuit of the ultimate goal. A challenge. Christian knew women well. He'd frightened her. That would have to be redressed. And he was an inmate. She considered herself his nurse. As to that, he thought of the way she'd looked at him when he'd stood before her naked. Quaker spinster prudish nurse agog. No shriek run, not her. Shock. Scandal. Curious. He looked up through the darkness with a slow smile. He could do it. Damn him if he couldn't. And enjoy it too. We shall take him on a trial outing tomorrow. Up to the village and back in the carriage. Did you put the new clothes on him? Maddie stood in front of Cousin Edward's desk. Yes. He glanced at her meager sentences in the notebook. Don't overlook details. Always write down such things and how he responds. Did he tolerate them well? She put her hands together, squeezed them, and pulled them. Apart. What dost thou mean? His reaction. Any attempt to remove them? Tear them? No. Oh, no. Nothing, nothing of that sort. No reaction at all, then? He was, he has difficulty dressing himself. I believe that makes him angry. I helped him to buckle the spurs. Spurs? He sat back in his chair. Why on earth spurs, dear? With the boots, I thought, all the gentlemen in town, it seems they always wear them. Do they? He grunted. That's the fashion, is it? He looked down again at her notes. Shaved. Dressed, nothing else? He was calm all day. Yes. Except that, he was a little, she searched for a word, restless in the morning. He banged on the door briefly, but he didn't shout. Cousin Edward flipped the notebook closed. I believe you. Maybe starting to exert some calming influence. We're seeing a little of his former personality here, I think. He has more pride at stake in the presence of a lady. We can use that to encourage self-control. Dress him tomorrow to go out. I dislike to restrain him for the entire trip to London, but we'll see how he conducts himself on a short jaunt first. Tell Larkin we'll leave at eleven. In the morning, Maddie entered Jervox's room with her head bent, 
stepping aside for Larkin to leave. She'd selected the clothes and taken them down early, leaving them in a neat stack on the chair where Larkin would pass in hopes that the male attendant would manage the task of dressing Jervalks. She'd decided, after long prayer and meditation, that she'd overstepped the true bounds of her opening, exceeded the divine direction of her inner light. She must have, for clearly she was goading Jervalks to deeper. Frustration, less acceptance and patience in God's will instead of more. Part of her wish to stay away entirely, and part of her wish to persist, offering what she could of friendship. Half a night of prayer had not convinced her which part was the reasoner, and which a true leading. She was here because Cousin Edward had ordered her to see that Jervalx was ready for his outing, not because she had any certainty anymore about what she was ordained to do. Larkin stopped, turning back as the bars rang closed. You put this on him, miss? He held up the heavy signet ring. Maddie nodded. If he hit out wearing this, Larkin said, he'd mark me for life. And you, he'd crack your jaw like an egg, Mississippi. She was silent. Don't put it on him, Larkin said. He walked away, carrying a bundle of linen and clothes. Maddie turned to Jervalx. He stood in his place near the window, half silhouetted. She'd chosen a gray coat this time, with a purple and gold waistcoat, trousers of a darker slate, and shoes instead of boots. Larkin had already fastened the buttons, tied the neckcloth in a common, utilitarian square, but Jervalx had looked an aristocrat even in the asylum's cheap, tight-fitting clothes. Mundane neckcloth or not, he was an absolute duke now. He gazed at her stoically. Then he made a slight bow, as if she were a lady. Friend, Maddie said in greeting. He smiled a little. She came further into the room. When? He moved, however, she stopped at a safe distance from him. Unexpectedly he knelt, a slow and careful move, reaching beneath the bed, drawing something that looked like a rough white stone from the dark space. Maddie prepared to dart for the door, but he only stood up, unthreatening, and held out the raw object toward her. It was the chunk of plaster that he knocked from the wall. When she hesitated, he took a step closer, lifted her hand and set the broken piece in it. He made a soft sound, touching the flat surface with his finger. The substance left chalky dust on his hand. Maddie looked down and saw the scratches on the plaster face. A tilt toward the light revealed them, barely, as words. In spite of the crude abrasions and awkwardly pitched letters, though, she knew his handwriting well enough. She could read it. Pretty matey sorry she gazed down at the crumbly offering. All right. Yes. Thou art sorry. She kept her face hidden as she spoke. She pressed her lips together, holding the chunk of broken wall between her hands, and whispered. Not as sorry as I am. He touched her chin, lifted her face on his hand. I'm so sorry, she said. About the clothes. Do you understand? She couldn't tell. She looked into his eyes, into that dramatic pitchy dark blue. A faint, faint smile seemed to come into his face. He let her go, with a light hint of a caress along. Her cheek. Maddie moved back uncertainly. Wouldst thou wish to go to the village today? She asked. His face changed indefinably, lost the faint smile. He stared intently at her lips. Go, she said. A drive. The village. Go. She nodded. Drive to the village. Maddie girl, go. Thou. You. Jervalx. You go. He nodded. He touched her arm. Maddie girl, go? Oh. Yes. I'm to go, too. If you like. He smiled at her openly. Maddie curled her fingers around the piece of plaster. It was quite a vivid experience to be the single center of that smile. She returned it with a brief and nervous one of her own. Escorted between the ape and the medical man, 
Christian walked outside. He kept his gaze locked on Matajiri's chaste figure in front of him, her black dress and white collar, the absurd sugar scoop on her head. He felt the cold sun on his face and shoulders, heard the soft blow of the horses, the creak of harness, the sound of feet on the gravel drive. He felt overwhelmed by the outside, all the light and open distance, lawns and lake trees. He thought that the moment he ever got the chance, he would break and run, but it was all he could do to keep from turning and retreating to the house and his cell. Maddie and pride kept him moving forward. He would not be a spineless lunatic, not here, not now. The carriage waited. She climbed inside with a servant's help. Christian followed. Pain lanced through his back as he hiked himself up. He caught a groan between his teeth. The interior smelled of pipe smoke and stale lavender water, a massive vulgarity of rich damask and velvet-trimmed purple. Christian felt panic overtaking him, for no reason but that it was the outside. He was afraid someone would see him. He'd be required to understand jabbering strangers. He'd be expected to talk. He grabbed the balance strap on one side and Maddie's hand on the other, gripping both. She turned and looked at him. As the ape and the medical man took the forward seat, Christian held her hand harder, with no intention of letting go. The medical man smiled benignly. Bit free to you, he said. No down gay. Say fuzz. Christian met the pudgy simper with disdain. If he chose to hold on to what seemed solid to him, it was none of this jumped-up commoner's business. The man was ridiculous in a gentleman's breeches and spurred boots this morning, as if he'd ever in his miserable provincial life got out of his country dogcart and mounted a blood horse. Amid the sounds of harness and the low resonance of the team's hooves, the carriage made the familiar lurch and began to roll. Christian let it press him back against the cushions, creating a dull ache in his injury. He concentrated on controlling himself, watching the landscape, not trying for words to name the things he couldn't name. The driveway was long and smooth. Of everyone in the carriage, he was the only one hanging. Onto the balance strap as if to a lifeline. He made an effort, commanding his hand to let go, trying to remember that this was all ordinary to him. A carriage, the outside, the grass, the trees just beginning to turn bright for the autumn. The carriage reached the gates of the property, passed through and began a winding tour among hedgerow lanes. Against the pale gold of grain fields, the pastures were still brilliant green. He stared out the window, feeling uneasy. Harvest, work, tenants, day men, swinging metal things, steady rhythm, not there. He had a shock, a terrible intense recollection of Jervalk's castle, the Welsh marches and wild country, nothing like this manicured view. He should have been there. He'd forgot it. How could he have forgot? Sheep wool, work, tenants, tenants, tenants. The harvest at Jervalk's. Who was managing it? They came upon the village suddenly, a few red-roofed and plastered cottages, a church, a public house under the sign of a black bull. The vehicle slowed. It stopped before the tavern, swayed as the footman climbed down to open the door. Christian felt taken by surprise, flustered, still trying to follow the new thought of his home and the harvest. He caught the balance strap again, squeezed hard on it, and Maddie's hand. The medical man got out. He stood at the steps and looked at Christian with that bland and expectant smile. The landlord came to the door of the taproom, wiping his hands on his apron, good-humored with his easy greeting, as if he'd expected them. Christian didn't move. He wouldn't get out here, expose himself as a lunatic in public. Come, the medical man said. Christian glared at him. Get on, the ape said and stood up, bent beneath the low ceiling. He motioned to Christian to go in front of him. Christian braced back in the seat in spite of the pain of it. He hung onto the strap and to Maddie, made a low growl in his throat. He didn't want to get out. He didn't want to start a fight. That would end in worse humiliation for him. He looked desperately at Maddie. 
She smiled at him, just that sort of reassuring smile that she'd given the laughing young man and the day before, like a patient nursemaid for her children. Christian saw abruptly what it all was, a charade, a little play in which everyone knew their part. The landlord awaiting the carriage, the quiet village, the ape standing by, a pretense of the real outside when Christian wasn't outside at all. He was still locked in the madhouse. They had only expanded the walls. There was no public to humiliate him here. They already knew he was a lunatic. They expected it. He could burst into howls of insanity, and they would only smile those gentle smiles at him and wrestle him into the chains. Maddie's hand worked restively in his, in spite of the encouraging expression she maintained. Christian knew she was afraid of what he would do, she wasn't overly good at hiding it. That, of anything, made him release her hand and stand up and let himself down from the carriage like a civilized man, because he didn't want her afraid of him. He wanted her afraid of herself, little patronizing patient the Thouspinster. Outside the carriage, she smiled at him again. Christian bore it. He was the prize pupil, subdued and compliant. He was calm. He was a very, very good boy. Maddie slowly relaxed as the occasion seemed to be proceeding smoothly. Jervalk's initial tension had vanished. He looked about the village with casual interest, as if he'd never been wrought up at all, though her hand still held the afterache from the strength of his grip in the carriage. Shall we take a walk? Cousin Edward asked. Her grace requested that Mr. Pember have an introduction to Master Christian. The vicarage is across the common. As Maddie gathered her skirt and reticule in preparation to follow, she saw the moment of panic in Jervox's eyes. He hesitated, with an intense, sweeping glance. Then in one of the uncanny alchemies she was coming to recognize, he controlled the confusion and held on to himself. With an ironic look toward Cousin Edward, who was already moving away, Jervox walked to Maddie and offered his escort. She felt oddly bashful to have this courtesy expended on her. He took her hand on his arm as if it were utterly natural. Perhaps it was, to him, but Maddie had never walked arm in arm alongside any man besides her father, excepting only briefly in and out of meeting when the doctor had been courting her. Of course, Jervox only did it because he was what he was, a duke and a gentleman, and intended cousin Edward not to forget it. Maddie understood that much. When Jervox put his other hand over her fingers, not allowing her to slip them away, it was a demonstration for the benefit of Cousin Edward. Still, a maiden Quaker lady could feel rather complimented, and perhaps imagine just a tiny sinful hint of what it must be like to be a duchess, even if she was one of the peculiar people and her duke a lost and disordered spirit. With Larkin trailing them, she walked with Jervox across the common. Somehow it wasn't awkward. She didn't have to shorten or lengthen her steps to match his, as she'd had to do in her fleeting strolls with the doctor. She didn't have to watch her feet. The little beaten path through the grass was hers, while Jervox kept to the more uneven turf. How many ladies he must have escorted in this way, to be so pleasant and easy at it. When they came to the lane on the other side of the common, he paused, just as if it were a busy London street and he her dependable escort across. At the vicarage gate, he gave way for her to precede him, leaning forward to hold it open as it began to swing closed behind Cousin Edward. She passed through. Jervox released the gate to the weight of the suspended ball and chain that caused it to fall rapidly shut. At the sharp bang and Larkin's grunt behind them, Maddie glanced aside at Jervox. He lifted his eyebrow and looked down at her with an expression of aristocratic languor. Mr. Pember was already in his hallway to greet them, primed for the occasion by the note cousin Edward had dictated to Maddie in advance. He was a vicar of the sort she'd been brought up to think the very worst of his breed, obsequious and comfortable, his home full of stuffed sofas, carpets, dishes of sweetmeats, and too many beeswax candles and lamps. A few minutes' conversation, and she decided him to be amiable, kind, and perfectly disagreeable. 
It was no wonder that the Dowager Duchess had found him worthy of an introduction. To her son, he was full of just the sort of pious sentiments that the lady had discoursed upon at such length in her letters. Mr. Pember began talking at Jervolks about the wages of vice and moral turpitude from the moment that everyone had been introduced, speaking of a just punishment in the most genial and mild voice, looking at Jervolks from behind square spectacles, with frequent resort to a handkerchief between pinches of snuff. Matty hoped that Jervolks understood none of it. She hoped that he thought it was only country gossip, which was precisely the tone in which the vicar delivered his sanctimonious pronouncements of divine judgment. She didn't think Jervox comprehended Mr. Pember's words. The Duke merely looked at his host with an expression of polite boredom, as if he'd been through this sort of thing many times before. He accepted tea from the housekeeper, glancing over his cup and the woman's plump shoulder as she poured for Cousin Edward, giving Mattie a secret smile. Perceptive and subtle. Sitting in the front parlor between the vicar and her cousin, Maddie felt closer to Jervolks than she had felt alone with him in his barred room. There, she was the stranger, miles and lifetimes different from him, unable to understand or be understood. Here, communication between them seemed perfect, an instant agreement on this little society and its annoyingly pious mummery. Jervolks picked up his cup and saucer and stood, looking out the window into the back garden. The vicar's sermon paused. Apparently even he was unable to go on in the face of such obvious indifference. In the little silence, Jervalk said, Cat. The expression on Mr. Pember's face was almost comical. Maddie could see him rapidly revising his estimation of Jervalk's intelligence downward. The vicar nodded and chuckled uneasily. Oh, yes. A pretty kitty, isn't she? Jervalk looked at Maddie. He set his teacup on the windowsill and made a gesture with his hand for her to come. Oh dear, is it quite the thing? Mr. Pember asked, as Jervolks walked to the door. Does he wish to go outside? The Duke stopped beside Maddie's chair. He turned to Mr. Pember and in the sort of tone that could command regiments uttered. Cat. His hand fell on Maddie's shoulder. He gave her a hard nudge. It's all right. Go outside with him, cousin Maddie. Let him. Look at the cat if he wishes. Just stay inside the garden wall. She rose, happy to comply. The housekeeper led them to the back door that opened into a pleasant kitchen and cutting garden. Inside a high brick wall, asparagus was going to feathery yellow and seed. Carrots had been planted in short, even rows. It wasn't until Maddie had stepped outside a few feet that she saw around the corner. There, against the side wall, a bushy plot of dahlias made an amazing sight, brilliant huge platters of blossoms, red. An orange and pink-hued white, staked full seven feet tall and blooming at their autumn peak. It was just the sort of garden Maddie had always wished to have herself, mostly practical, but with a corner saved for something vivid and wondrous something not at all useful save in its own joyous fantasy. The vicarage cat, a plain yellow tabby with a crooked tail, disappeared behind the dahlias. Maddie hadn't thought Jervox really interested in the animal. She'd supposed that he'd only used it for an excuse to escape the parlor, but he walked away from her, following the cat into its shadowy alley behind the flowers. Maddie stood waiting. His passage rustled the plants. The top-heavy blooms swayed cheerfully, moved by an invisible hand. The cat appeared suddenly atop the wall, balancing from the leap. She hissed back at where Jervox was hidden, then jumped off the other side. The garden grew quiet. Maddie tilted her head, expecting him to come out, having lost the tabby. She could hear muffled laughter from the group in the parlor and a strange, faint, squeaky noise beneath the light breeze. She moved forward cautiously, not quite sure of Jervox. He wasn't above leaping out to grab her, she was perfectly certain of that. She held her skirt up above the dirt path and leaned forward, 
peering around the back of the thick bush of dahlias to the space in the shadow of the wall. He stood leaning against the bricks. In his hand he held a spotted tortoiseshell kitten, while another three or four crawled and kneeled and tumbled over his feet. He stroked the tiny creature's head with his thumb. From the hidden corner, he looked up at Maddie with a beckoning smile. Chapter 9 She hesitated. In the narrow aisle behind the dahlias, he bent down to scoop up another kitten, holding them together in the cup of one hand, a spotted puff against a black one. They hissed tiny hisses at one another, and then fumbled together, settling in his palm. Maddie moved closer, careful of the others at his feet. He held the pair as she stroked their plumy tips of fur with her forefinger. When he pressed the spotted one toward her, she took it into her own hand, feeling the tiny pinprick claws in the transfer. The space behind the dahlias made her think of when she'd been a child and crawled beneath the baize cloth on the parlor table, surrounded by folds that hung all the way to the floor, creating a dim room of her own. Here and now, the daydream room was built of plants and brick, not cloth. The green wall rustled. No man made sense, sweet and vain, but the smells of earth and earthy perfumes. She lifted her face, looking from beneath her bonnet to Jervalx. The duke stood leaning his shoulder against the brick, holding the kitten in one hand, moving his thumb rhythmically over the tiny creature's head. His face still held that faint, knowing hint of a smile. He lifted the black kitten toward her, held it within a breath of her cheek. His hand with its small burden drifted downward, so that the kitten's fur caressed her skin from her temple to her lips. She could feel the little animal shift in his palm. Its dainty nose touched her, exploring. The kitten eyes, wide and blue, stared into hers from an inch away. A paw came out, reached up, clung to the stiff brim of her bonnet, too weak to budget but ready to play. Tiny teeth and claws opened wide and tried to sink into the rigid brim. Jervalx made a soft sound of amusement. He lowered his palm. With a violent soprano mew of distress, the kitten hung suspended for an instant, pulling Maddie's bonnet forward over her eyes. The others broke into a bantam chorus of cries, but before the victim could fall, Jervalx caught it safely back into his palm. Maddie moved to readjust her bonnet. She pushed back the brim, settled it properly again, an awkward job as the kitten in her other hand began to try to crawl up her bodice. Jervalx reached out. She thought he was going to rescue her from the tortoiseshell kitten busily climbing her dress, but... Instead he caught her bonnet string. He curled it in his fingers. And tugged lightly. The tight constraint came free. He lifted the bonnet away and held it dangling in his hand. Maddie pressed the spotted kitten against her dress, looking down, avoiding the sudden awareness, the disarmed sensation. She reached to take the bonnet, but he leaned his shoulders on the wall and held the prize behind him. When she met his eyes, he began to smile. He lifted his arm, teasing. As he swept the bonnet upward, Maddie grabbed at it one-handed, unbalanced in her effort to lean forward without. Endangering kittens by shifting her feet. She missed. He held the bonnet high. Maddie stretched. With a flick, he tossed it over the wall. The spotted kitten gave a little cry as she almost dropped it and fell against him. He made no move to steady her. She pushed herself awkwardly off the solid brace of his arm and sighed, standing straight. He grinned, an instant of devastating dark blue eyes and humor slanted at her. A moment later, like a bad scoob, he composed his features to an earnest and virtuous gravity. My bonnet! Her stout censure met his mischief like a stone flung into mist, much effort and little effect. Thou art iniquitous! He flicked a glance at her. She saw the slight frown pass over his face and disappear into proud neutrality. He didn't understand the words, but wouldn't acknowledge it. Wicked, she added for amplification. He looked straight ahead into the green tangle of dahlias. He tilted his head, as if considering whether he would accept. 
that assessment. A scoundrel, she stated. A rogue. That pleased him, the frivolous wretch, she could tell it. He cradled the kitten in his hand, rubbing its black fur with his thumb. Maddie bent down and deposited her kitten on the ground, pulling the others free of her skirts. As she rose and took a step backward, he caught her arm. She should not have let it stop her. For the first instant of it, she could have simply turned and walked free of the touch. Out of the shadowy hidden place behind the flowers. But she hesitated, and the grip on her arm became something to break. It wasn't tight or hard, but it was real. He leaned back against the wall, his head turned toward her. The black kitten decided to climb his coat, crawling upward. Maddie gazed at that. She felt she could not look up, take her eyes from its faltering progress. He caught the kitten with his free hand and pulled it away from his chest. He let go of her, lifted himself clear of the wall. Maddie thought of stepping backwards and didn't. She watched him as he knelt and scooped kittens into his hands. The spotted one, the black, two yellow tabbies and a funny little fellow with silver tufts at the tips of its ears, five kittens overflowing his hands and clinging to his waistcoat with tiny frantic mews as he rose. A yellow tabby tumbled free. Maddie gasped and caught it in her skirt. As she straightened, he lifted the black kitten to her. Shoulder. Pins pricked through her dress. He raised the tortoise shell to her other shoulder, put the second tabby beneath one ear and the tufted silver beneath the other, plucked the kitten from her skirt and deposited it on top of her head. Maddie, half bewildered, half laughing, caught at kittens as they teetered and whimpered and fell. When she was too slow to save one, he did, replacing it, snuggling the warm bodies against her throat for the moment they would remain there. The one atop her head stayed put, but cried and cried, digging in claws that tickled painfully. Finally a tabby and the tufted gray retained their purchase on her shoulders. The black and the tortoiseshell capsized off, but he lifted the two, installing them like soft and ticklish mufflers against her throat, kept in place by his hands. He held them there. Rhythmic, energetic kitten laments filled her ears. The squirming bodies drove minute needles of pain through her dress and hair and skin. His mouth hovered near hers. Even if she had tried to step back, she couldn't have, without kittens toppling in all directions. She felt herself entrapped by it, frozen into place by him. He brushed his mouth against hers, so lightly and briefly. That it was a mere breath, a warmth, a touch, and then gone before her lips parted to object. He was smiling at them, at her, holding kittens at her ears caressing the protesting animals along her cheeks. She sucked in a quick breath as pins burrowed into her forehead and the kitten on top tried to scamper down her nose. Jervolk stepped back. He caught the falling tabby with a laughing sound in his throat. His hands washed over with wriggling fur. The others began to slip, dislodged by her startle, driving desperate needles through her clothes to hang on. Maddie ducked, scrambling to break their fall. A small shower of kittens overturned into the soft soil as she fell to her knees. Jervolks knelt beside her and let his handful tumble out. They picked themselves up and scampered with comical unsteadiness after the others, into the dark between the thick stalks of dahlias. Cousin Maddie? The doctor's call made her turn, instantly guilty, as she and Jervolks knelt behind the flowers. Cousin Maddie? The voice sharpened. Where are you? She stood up, brushing dirt from her skirt. Here. She walked quickly from behind the dahlias. We're back here. Cousin Edward came in haste, brushing past her to get to Jervalk's. Is it an attack? Is he having visions? No. Wait, it isn't. Maddie tried to hold him back from trampling down dahlias in the narrow space. Beyond him. Jervalk stood up, but she couldn't see his face. Irrational? Cousin Edward snapped, without turning from Jervalk's. No! It's nothing like that! Cousin Edward relaxed a little. He glanced back at her. 
attempting to escape? There were kittens. We were playing with kittens. Here? Her cousin kept Jervalx within the scope of his attention, obviously wary of his patient. You shouldn't have gone out of sight of the window. Come now, master. Christian, it's time to go home. Will you come? Maddie found herself repelled by the cajoling tone of his voice. She turned away, walking into the house. She retrieved her reticule from a chair in the parlor and stood waiting in the hallway with Larkin and Mr. Pember. Your bonnet, miss? The housekeeper asked. It blew over the wall. Oh. The housekeeper seemed a little puzzled. Should I send next door? It's no matter. If someone finds it, it can be conveyed to the hall, please. She kept her face lowered, her shoulders straight, the perfect, quiet, employed assistant. With cousin Edward close behind, Jervox came striding into the hall from the garden door. He picked up his hat and gloves from the side table, gave Mr. Pember a bow of flawless condescending authority, and turned to the front door. The housekeeper hustled to hold it open. Jervox paused next to Maddie. She hesitated between her role as attendant and his offered arm, between cousin Edward's justifiable and proper expectations and kittens at her throat, Jervox's face laughing silently so close above hers. He looked down at her now with an assumption that had rightfully belonged to him in another time and place, a gentleman in. Command of a lady's entire existence, her hand on his arm, her clothes and her amusements, her time and sentiment and livelihood. In a moment of revelation, Maddie realized that this was the devil looking at her out of gentian eyes, that her opening to. Serve Jervox was not without its real and dangerous temptations. She had been foolishly vain to think this affliction entirely a divine lesson for the Duke, with nothing in it to humble herself. It was easy to be virtuous, and deceitfully proud of it, across the abyss of their stations in life, the nobleman and the maiden. Quaker lady from Chelsea. But God had taken the Duke of Jervalx right down to the level of Maddie Tim's. From an equal vantage, the devil smiled at kittens and at her. And Maddie felt the prick of it on her heart like a tiny claw that seized at her for safety. She made no move to take his arm. The comprehension of that seemed slow to come to him. He stood there too long before he looked down and then placed his hat on his head. He held the gloves. Maddie knew he couldn't put them on alone. She reached to help him, but he stopped her with a murderous look gripped the elegant yellow kidskin in one hand, and walked ahead of her out the door. Cousin Edward stood at his desk, sipping noisily at his tea as he read over the notes Maddie had made on the day. He nodded, set the cup on his desk, and slapped the notebook down on the polished surface. Golden liquid spilled over into the saucer. I do believe we've stumbled upon something. I believe we have. He is much improved. I never thought we should have. Such a successful day on our very first attempt. Maddie picked up the book. Have I written it out properly? Very adequate. Better than yesterday. You need to add considerably more detail of how he conducted himself on your walk in the garden. It's clear that he followed the cat into the flower bed, but you might add a bit of description about his attention to the kittens. Was he aggressive or gentle with them? Did he try to speak at all? Did he seem to prefer a particular animal, and if so, describe it? That sort of thing. I see. The doctor took another gulp of tea. I have an intuition about this, Cousin Maddie. This trial of using you as his primary attendant. It's unprecedented but I'm beginning to see that it might be the natural extension of our social therapy. If a harmonious mix of the sexes is useful in promoting control in the nonviolent patients, why then should it not have a similar, perhaps an even more powerful benefit, in the treatment of the violent patient? His voice had begun to take on a sing-song quality. He looked off into the far corner, his chin raised a little, as if envisioning the paper he might write on the topic. 
He looked back at Maddie. We've had some aspersions cast on our policy of social mixing of the sexes here. I believe it's professional jealousy, but a case study of the usefulness of the technique with a truly intractable patient that should leave little room for doubt. Tomorrow, you may take him out and... About the house and gardens. He tapped rapidly on the edge of... His desk. And I think perhaps we'll keep Larkin's presence at a greater distance. We've had him within a moment's reach, but that might become too obvious outside of the Duke's room. Maddie wasn't so certain she was ready to do without Larkin nearby. She slipped her forefinger inside the pages of the notebook, squeezing them together on it. Perhaps, rather than the gardens, I might take him to visit my father. An excellent notion. Begin with that, a call in the family parlor. And try to make him understand what an award that is. Very, very few of the patients are ever invited into the family parlor, and then only the best behaved. If he responds well, you must continue right on to the outdoors. It's important to provide an immediate reward for good behavior. To take him back to his room too soon would counter the positive effect. Oh. He glanced up at her. Maddie was afraid that her expression must convey her doubt, for he paused and frowned at her. She thought of her opening and her duty to Jervalx. This was for his benefit. She could not turn away from it because she suddenly found herself afraid to be alone with him. Cousin Edward pulled open a desk drawer. He took out a silver chain and pushed it toward her. Just keep this whistle about you. His pride was in it now. He was determined. Christian saw that he'd made progress, not so much by her bemused reaction to the kittens, but in the way she wouldn't touch or look at him afterward. Just as well. He'd been tired returning, moving on determination alone. They'd all talked faster, garbling sounds. He'd felt his tenuous hold on comprehension slipping. He'd let it go, weary blurred transparent headache fade. Not care sometimes, just not. With the morning, he got energy back, and Matty Girl. From his chair, he watched her bend over his bed, smoothing it. To a pointless precision. He sat thinking of pleasures, his arms crossed over the rails. With satisfaction in reach, he permitted himself imagination, a luxury he not ventured to indulge in this place. Let her pretend to be the nurse offered to assist him with his gloves in front of the others. He'd allowed his temper to get the better of him in his reaction to that yesterday. He knew it was only native female defense, natural retreat from his first move. In a ballroom it would have been a tap with a fan and giddy flirting with other men, slow stalk and response, a pastime he knew down to his bone and sinew. She straightened up and turned to him. He smiled at her lazily, which had just the effect he wanted a flustered little transfer of her attention to some foolish task, in this case wiping her apron over the already dusted table. She wore no sugar scoop on her head today. The sun made a rainbow on the tight. Sheen of her ale-gold hair trapped in its thee thou spinster knot. He allowed himself one fantasy of it showering free across her bare shoulders. She smoothed down her skirt. Uds thou lick all Tim's is morn? The vision fell apart in frustration. He gripped the bars of the chair. Slow. He managed to get it out, scowling at her. Favor, she said. Tim's. Tim's, he echoed, damnably, when what he intended was to command her to speak more slowly. Mathematics. Tim's. Enlightenment dawned. He struggled to say the name. Ma Tims. Euclid. The, the, ah, uh, the parallel axiom is independent of the other Euclidean axioms. It cannot be deduced from them. Her look at him labeled him crazy. But he wasn't crazy. He could talk about mathematics, that was all. Go? She asked. Tims? Go to her father? He made a sound of amazed assent and stood up. The ape had dressed him again in decent clothes, Christian's own clothes. Maddie Girl had fastened his cuffs. 
he felt hopeful and uncertain, afraid that they would make him count on this new whim of being treated as something close to a human being. She unlocked the door, stepped out, and held it open. He followed her. The man across the hall mumbled angrily as they passed, reaching out toward Maddie through the door of his cage. Christian thrust himself forward, but she'd already stepped neatly out of reach. The lunatic caught Christian's arm instead. The fingers dug in, then suddenly released him, patting, plucking at his sleeve. The man's furious expression had gone to bewilderment, as if he couldn't understand why Christian was standing there. Some attendant had combed the man's hair down, but on one side it stood up straight and wild, as if he'd been pulling at it. He began to mutter something Christian couldn't understand, a litany of, Jeez dev, jeez dev, whispering under his breath. His blank eyes stared into Christian's, a tempest, lifeless and alive at once. Christian stared back. Look like this? This? He was horrified. Not this, not. He gave Maddie a distraught look, wrenching his arm from the lunatic's grasp. He wanted to tell her, to make her comprehend that he was not mad, but nothing at all would come, not the tortured syllables he'd achieved lately, not even the simpleton echo of what he heard. It all left him, everything that had begun to come back. When she spoke, it seemed meaningless, no sense at all in the tangle of sounds. Not mad, not, not, no, no, not. He couldn't move. She was talking to him. He made nothing of it. He only knew that he had to subdue the frenzy inside him. Had to act like a sane man. Had to do it. Had to. It was at that instant the most crucial thing in God's creation, that he moved forward down the hall, calm and rational in his actions. The square of the hypotenuse of a right-angled triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. The theorem gave him a hold. He was sane. He was himself. He was going with her to call. On her father. The sum of the squares of the projections of a plane figure upon three mutually perpendicular planes is equal to the square of the area of the figure. Effortless to generalize Pythagoras, more challenging to move into analytical geometry. He could walk forward calmly. He could think beyond projectives to his own passion, the imaginary geometry outside Euclid. Through a point C lying outside a line AB there can be drawn in the plane more than one line not meeting AB. It existed, a logical geometry that described the properties of physical space, built in direct conflict with the parallel postulate. The Euclidean parallel axiom did not stand, though mathematicians had been trying to find a rigorous proof of it since the Greeks. He knew of men far madder than he, men who'd burned out their whole lives in search of an unassailable demonstration, wasted themselves and their families and their health in the quest. The wiser ones gave it up, and he and. Tims had gone at it backward and found an answer in reverse. He remembered something, something at the edge of a great confusion, rain, sky, dark sound. Thunder. He remembered faces, hands together, moving. Sound, the sound of hands together. Hands at the analytical society. Tim's. Paper, yes. Yes. Tim's. Christian found himself able to move. He walked beyond the man-man. He was demonstrably in possession of himself, passing down the stairs of a luxuriously furnished country house. Tims would understand, and Christian was going to see him. Papa, he is here. The Duke. Maddie closed the parlor door behind them. Before she could do more, Jervalk strode past her to Papa's chair. He looked down at the scatter of wooden letters and numerals on the table. He stared for an instant at the precise arrangement of a trigonometric equation. He grasped her father's hand. Friend, her papa said, with a smile and a depth of warmth that made something change in Jervox's face. I've missed thee sorely. The duke got down on his knees. He held her father's hand in both of his and pressed his forehead against them. He knelt there, silent. 
her father turned his face toward him. Papa reached out with his free hand and traced their clasped fists, spread his palm and moved it down the side of Jervalks's face. Friend, he said again. Jervalks made a sound in his throat, a low growl that somehow conveyed more of love and pleasure than any words Maddie had ever heard. He opened his eyes, stood up, releasing her father's hand. He touched the wooden formula. His forefinger caressed it. He said, tangent of half the boundary angle pi. X here, negative exponent. He placed a minus sign. Yes? He looked toward her father. Papa immediately felt over the carved symbols for the correction. Yes. I agree. Calculate for one. X equals one. He was silent a few moments, studying the table. Boundary angle, 40 degrees, 24 minutes. He looked toward Papa again, intensely. For the paper? Pa. Jervox clenched his jaw. Paha. He flung himself away from the table, pacing the room. Yes, yes, yes. Paha. X equal to one, her father said imperturbably. I shall calculate it out in the paper. Jervolk stopped at the window. Beyond him, cloud shadows rolled along the drive and the lawn. They fell over his face and moved on. He appeared to be watching the shapes or the sky. He cast a glance at Maddie. Then he wanted the room again, but closer to the table, as if it drew him. He stopped at the trigonometric equation again. Calculate in physical space. Not theory. Parallax. Application. Physical space. With what example? The distances are too large. Jervox worked at speaking. Nothing came. He strode to. The window and pointed out, upward, looking toward Maddie. The sky? She ventured. He nodded abruptly. Sky. Dark. Ah, her father said. Stars, then? Stars, Jervalk said. Chapter 10 The Mechanique Celeste and Laplace in French, Theoria Motus and Gauss in Latin, with reference to Kepler's Astronomia Nova and Newton's Principia, Maddie had her head bent over one or another of her father's books all morning. Jervalk couldn't seem to read the words but he could speak numbers and mathematical equations, even read them aloud if he cared to do so, but he seemed better pleased to take the volume out of her hands, leaf through it impatiently, find the tables he wanted, and hand it back to her to recite while he and her father conferred, forming and rearranging equations for the parallax of stars and arguing hotly about the suitability for publication of distances that must be so. Preposterously large. Her father took the conservative view that they would expose themselves to ridicule with such unthinkable numbers, while Jervalx, for his side of the debate, just banged his fist on the table and made the symbols jump. Predictably, Jervalx won. After the first hour, Maddie had made the mistake of suggesting that he might like to walk outside. For this suggestion, she received a sigh of plaintive resignation from her. Papa and from Jervalx, once she made herself understood, an eloquent look of incredulity and scorn, and an imperious thump on the page of Gauss in her lap. She bent her head and resumed reading aloud. When the maid came to serve her father's luncheon, the men were past the earlier argument and deep in the arithmetical side of their calculation. Neither of them paid the slightest. Attention to the tray, except that the duke tore off half of her father's bread, sat down at the table and ate it while computing astronomical squares. Maddie looked helplessly at the maid and asked that a meal also be brought for herself and Jervalx. She ate hers unaccompanied, during a period of considerable difficulty in the figuring. Jervalx was aggravated by the wooden numerals. He demanded a pen of Maddie more than once, but she pretended not to understand him, recalling cousin Edward's rule that he was not to have writing or drawing instruments. She feared that she had already transgressed that guideline in principle with the wooden symbols, for he was certainly in an agitated state with them. 
It was as if he didn't even wish to look at them, but kept his head turned aside a little as he maneuvered them across the table, or sometimes, scowling ferociously, closed his eyes and felt of them. As her father did, turning them over and over in his hand before. He placed them. But he was speaking better, managing fluent phrases sometimes even beyond the mathematics, and his fervor was all focused on the calculations. She suspected that he'd not have conducted himself very much more calmly even before his affliction. Maddie recognized a mathematical obsession when she saw one. She sat in her chair, a few feet from the table, feeling oddly jealous. With the whistle safely round her neck, she had been rather looking forward to walking outside with Jervalx. Cousin Edward looked in once, in the afternoon. Maddie rose quietly and went to the door, standing just inside to speak. With him. Their low voices didn't even seem to reach Jervalx, although her father turned his face toward them, listened for a moment, and turned back. The doctor stood watching as Jervalx pushed numbers back and forth on the table, viewed them and changed them. Maddie knew that to her cousin it appeared no more than pointless animation, a crazy sort of mental tick. But Jervalx was composed, and so the doctor was pleased. Cousin Edward went away. The door closed. To Maddie's surprise, Jervalx knocked a value for an angle out of place and sat back, looking toward her. Her father was still working, his hands hovering over his own wooden symbols in that way he had when he was deep in computation. Jervalx glanced at him, and at her, and rose from his chair. Her papa's head turned slightly, a recognition of the change, and then he went back to his labor. The duke strolled to the window. He stretched his head back and gave a sign of relaxation. Then he looked over his shoulder at Maddie. She pressed her back against the door. Wouldst thou like to take a walk? He made no response. The way he continued to look at her made her squeeze the door handle in her fingers. It was his pirate look, easy and wicked. He meandered to the bookcase, tilting his head, frowning for a moment at the titles there. Then he moved on, to the secretary, the reading table. A slow circle of the room, leading inexorably to where she stood at the door she could have stepped out. There was nothing whatsoever to prevent it. She could have opened the door to the rest of the house, as if she naturally assumed that he wished to go through. Instead she just stood there, working her fingers round the handle. Her father bent over his arithmetic, innocent. That he could have identified where she and Jervalk stood in the room at a moment's request, Maddie didn't doubt. Jervalk made no particular effort at silence at least until he paused within a hand's breadth of her. The whole room, and he stopped so close, as near as he had been when she tied his neckcloth and fastened his cufflinks, his breath and his warmth just touching her, the same as they did then. She didn't have her bonnet, hadn't realized until this moment how the stiff, deep brim was protection, how it had kept his face at a safe distance from hers. A walk? She repeated, her voice too faint. He only stood there, absurdly close. Blue eyes black. Lashes smiling. He dropped his gaze to the whistle dangling at her bodice. The smile became cynical. He touched the silver, toyed with it. Then he lifted it and turned it in his hand. He held the mouthpiece just skimming her lower lip, daring her. Her rapid breath made a tiny sound come from it, like the distant peep of a lost chick. Her father lifted his head, listening. Maddie girl? he asked. She turned her mouth from the whistle. Yes, Papa? I think there may be a sparrow in the chimney. Dost thou hear it? Jervalks lifted his arms, resting his fists on the door frame to either side of her. The chain of the whistle slid and tightened at her throat as he kept it in his hand. He held her trapped his smile growing into a mocking grin. I don't hear it. Maddie pressed her shoulders back against the door. I'll ask the groundskeeper to look. Her father seemed satisfied, going back to his calculations. Maddie was amazed. 
It was impossible that she was standing with a man holding her enclosed against the door. Incredible that she didn't push him away, break free, call out to her papa. Jervox leaned on one arm. He traced the whistle over the curve of her ear, watching what he did with a fascinated openness. He brought the cool silver along her chin, warming the metal with his fingers. The instrument grazed an arc across her lips to the center of them, and then back the side, to the center, and back again. He leaned closer. Maddie's breath was singing faintly, unevenly, through the silver alarm. He held it against her lips. His fingers spread across her cheek and chin. He bent his head and pressed his mouth to the silver, a kiss with her protection caught and made useless inside. The whistle slipped from his fingers. She felt it bounce against her breasts as his mouth came to hers. He touched her as the silver had touched her, just a light graze but warm. He took modesty and virtue and salvation away from her so easily. She gave it up so easily. She stood washed in the sensation of his featherlight contact against her lips, his breath mingling with hers. It seemed as if God's light within her must be shining bright, filling her with wonder. This man... His eyes closed, dark lashes so frivolously long as they rested against his skin. Even his eyelashes were unholy in their opulence. His tongue moved over her as if she were a ginger lozenge, to be tasted in small nibbles. He took her lower lip between his teeth, gently teasing. A flourish of pure fleshly joy blossomed in her body. She felt her own will leap up to meet his. Her mouth opened. He answered instantly with a deep and ardent union. His hands drew downward, closing as he leaned into her, bracing his forearms on the door. He enveloped her. The feel of his kiss was strange and painful and electric. Her hands opened helplessly, trying to find. Something to touch that wasn't him, but everything was him, all. The solid reality within reach. He opened his palms and smoothed her hair, sweetly, over and over like a parent would touch a child, at the same time that he kissed her, pressing hard against her, a forceful intercourse of their mouths and bodies. He broke it, pulling back to look into her face. They were both breathing deeply, almost silently, as it had all been silent in this room with her father just two yards away. In her ears, her pulse beat frantically. She began to feel what she'd done. Her soul came back from some place it had gone, lost in self-will, sunk in vanity and carnal pleasure. Jervalks was watching her. Maddie stared up at him. He was the devil, smiling a little, tender, a warmth that she'd never foreseen, not in all her everyday prayers to God to keep her soul safe and in spiritual grace. Never once had she imagined that Satan would smooth her hair would smell of heat and earth, wouldn't speak, wouldn't hiss evil promises in her ears. Never once had she thought he would be anything but ugly and corrupt and easy for virtuous Archimedia Tims to scorn. He looked down at her. The warmth in his smile went to slow irony. He took a curl of her hair that had fallen free and brushed it under her chin, then pushed himself away. The floor creaked under the shift of his weight. Her father sighed and sat back in his chair. It's a fearful thing, this. Papa shook his head over the astronomical calculations. Inconceivable. I shouldn't have believed the results if I hadn't done it myself. Jervox turned. He went to the table and braced his hands. Against the edge, bent over the computation, his head cocked to. One side. Dost thou think it holds? Her father asked, after Jervalks had frowned at it for a long time. The duke looked up at Maddie. He swept his hand over the formula her father had completed, where the value for the Earth's distance from the sun was multiplied by numbers half a million times greater than itself to reach the realms of their new geometry. Stars, he said, his face alight with passion. Infinity. And he smiled at her as if he owned it distance and space and stars and infinity, as if he owned her, too. Silence and meeting. The plain walls, 
The plain benches, simple, stark, silent, awaiting the still, small voice of God. The woman in front of Maddie, dressed in gray wool, had a cracked button at the top of her collar. When she bent her head, a single faint wisp of dark hair escaped the back of her bonnet. It was a small meeting, not more than twelve friends sitting motionless in the square room. No one took the elder's position facing the members. No one spoke. They listened, subdued self-will to the guiding spirit within. Maddie stared at the woman's wisp of hair. She felt something she never felt before in meeting. She felt herself among strangers. Everyone here was quiet, in a state of spiritual. Stillness, unadorned and undefiant. As Maddie should be. As she. Always had been in the past. She looked at the escaped strands of hair and thought of the duke with her bonnet. She looked at the bare and sober walls and saw his smile, mocking, tender, exulting in stars and infinity. Infinity. Even that seemed somehow immoral. How could anyone but God himself dare to trifle with infinity? To harness it with numbers and lay it on a baize tablecloth? Perhaps that was why he had struck Jervulks down with this affliction, for wicked hubris, for daring to turn the universe inside out and make a calculation that wouldn't fit inside the world God had given to man. She felt the power of the new geometry without understanding it. She'd heard the awe in her father's voice. Numbers, stars, parallax, infinity. Maddie found herself on her feet. She stood helplessly. A thousand words and thoughts possessed her, none of them spiritual or even rational. Many times in her life she'd sat in silence and heard someone stand up and speak out spontaneously. Never once had she done so herself. Never once had she risen from her bench before the rest did so. But none of the words within her were God's words. They could not be. They were all about a kiss, a man's smile, an infinity as he leaned over her and touched his mouth to hers and she didn't turn away. The sound of her shoes on the floorboards filled the room. It was only five steps from the last bench to the wooden door. She pushed it open, letting light pour into the dimness, squinting at the sun. The still, waxen scent of the meeting room vanished in cold open air, in the smell of sun-warmed, white-washed boards and wood smoke. A single cow, black and tan, looked up at her with solemn, pretty eyes and went back to grazing the common. Maddie dropped down onto the last step, holding her arms tight around herself, bending over her lap. She hid her face beneath her bonnet brim, though there was no one outside to see her, no one who couldn't see past the bonnet and into her heart anyway. Christian waited for her. She didn't come in the morning. Only the ape, not in a pleasant mood. He brought a Bible marked in three places. While Christian stood manacled by one hand, the keeper read verses out like toneless announcements. Christian didn't bother to listen to it, thud babble watching instead the door and out the window for Maddie. She didn't come all day. Brutal humiliation, that she could avoid him and he could not seek her out, his intention to humble her turned back against himself. Worse, he'd awoken a hunger. He'd brought it with him into the cell, an embrace, her body between his and the closed door. He'd brought something that he wanted and could not have, not at his own will. And there was nothing else to think about, no easy. Distraction as he'd always had before, stupid to crave a woman. He couldn't touch, he'd always moved on to one available. But there was no obliging substitute now. There was only a new desire, sharp as the throbbing pang in his back. Only the sweet way she'd let him do it, and answered him. He was afraid that she would not come back. He watched, chained to the bed. The ape went away. Darkness fell. Still he watched, and still she didn't come. She was so ashamed, the first time she had to go back she did not look at him even once. She went into the cell and stripped the bed and left. That was morning. 
In the afternoon, the schedule said that she was to take him outside in the grounds. She prayed that it would rain, miserly cowardice and self will that God did not see fit to satisfy. The day was still and unseasonable, almost warm, the sky a misty blend of cloud and blue coalescing into one another without definition. She walked from the bright yellow of the dining parlor to the upstairs corridor, hesitating before she came in view of his door. Her heart was pounding. She could still go back, the reasoner whispered. She'd come so quietly that Jervox could not have heard her. She could leave him here and finish up with her secretarial duties. All the other patients were silent, outside for air or simply mute. Moving softly, she peeked around the doorframe. He stood at the window, looking out, one hand resting against the bar, his fingers curled lightly around it. And suddenly she saw how contemptible it was to keep him there in the dim cell, when it was her duty to God and to Cousin Edward, to Jervalx, to take him abroad in the sunlight. She put her key in the lock. He turned. For an instant he looked at her, an immeasurable look, infinity between them. Duty had no place in it. Hot blue, his eyes, sable-lashed, the line of his cheek and his mouth so severe and finely fashioned. A mystery. Infinity and falling, down and down and down, the way it was in dreams. He broke it, drowned it in those black eyelashes and a moody glance away. When she entered the cell, he moved back from her, as if there should be some certain distance between them. I've come to take thee for a walk in the garden, she said with a little gesture toward the door. A faint smile curved his lips. He said nothing. Walk garden. She held the door open. Wouldst thou come? He extended his hand in a courtly motion, as if to give way to her before him. Christian respected her reticence, not insisting that she stay too close to him. He allowed her the lead, walking behind her on the gravel paths among the roses. She moved restively, touching a flower, pushing back her black skirt, bending to collect fallen leaves and pull a tiny weed. The flowers were opulent, full-blown, topple shower petals at a touch. He thought that she might topple that way, falling all at. Once into his hand, a soft drift of blossom between his fingers. The roses bowed their extravagant heads, nodding, but she was all stiff prim and black, back in her bonnet so that he could not see her face unless she looked directly at him. Still, she made it simple. She walked down along the path to a corner arbor, the bench beneath it dusted with withering petals from the red climber arched overhead. She didn't sit, she inspected the flowers as if it were an important office that she needed to perform. Christian didn't have to do anything. He merely moved into the path of escape, flanked on either side by thorns. She turned around. He saw her realize it. She looked scared and breathless. A scarlet petal floated downward, avoided the brim of her bonnet and caught on her shoulder. The scrap of crimson lay there, close to the pale curve of her throat, between the stark collar and the tight upward sweep of her hair. Christian reached out and caught the petal between his fingers. She held stiff, breathing like a frightened doe. He let the moment spin out, his hand suspended near her cheek, not quite touching, not quite, not quite, a whisper away, a restraint as intimate as a kiss. Color flooded her cheeks. Expectation. Her eyes, those eyes that turned hazel to gold under wanton lashes, her eyes held terror and wonder. He stepped back and set her free. With a duck of her head, hiding beneath the defense of her, Hat, she hurried past him. Christian turned after her, smiling to himself. Free, at his consent. He still had that much power, that he could have kept her there and kissed her, shedding rose petals at a touch. After that, she didn't linger in the walled rose garden but went quickly to the gate. Christian followed, lazy hunting now, allowing a little distance to open between them. Beyond the garden door was a large courtyard dotted with lunatics and keepers. Nearest was the man-man who muttered across the hall from Christian's cell, the ape behind with his hand on the lunatic's taut shoulder leash. 
Christian disliked the open yard instantly. Not circus beasts, animals drag round leash exercise. He stopped inside the gate, ready to object, but Maddie was gone. His nerve evaporated. He stood where he was, trying to find her. The ape and his man-man approached, trudging around the track. The lunatic was shaking his head, pulling at the leash, mouthing silent words. The ape bent close to his ear and said something. The man-man looked at Christian, half a foot away, full empty eyes, stare void, chilling. Tim's! The ape said sharply as they passed him. Tack our charge! Christian looked after the keeper, and for an instant he saw Maddie beyond. Then a howl, and an impact that hit him from nowhere, took him down, impaled him on pain, while hands ripped at his coat and collar, drawing the neckcloth in a red strangle against his throat. The man Anne was screaming above him, mouth pulled back, pounding his fist into Christian's head and face. Christian fought, his hand on the maniac's jaw, fingers forcing it up, rolling off his back with a shove that speared agony through him. He struck, a hard blow to the man Anne's face that didn't check him. The clutching hands tore at Christian's throat, scrabbling for purchase. The man shrieked, his fingers closing on Christian's neck, pulling him down, trying to sink his teeth into anything in reach. Christian hauled back on his knees and locked his fists, swinging at the lunatic's jaw. The impact slammed through his arms, made an instant's weakening in the grip on his throat. Christian swung again. The blow knocked the madman insensible. Christian stayed on his knees. He went on hitting, his side in agony, breathing hard and pounding at the still figure beneath him. He hated the lunatic, loathed him, wanted out of this nightmare if it took beating the man to bloody pulp. But the ape came, a surprise a grip from nowhere, hard hands pulling Christian to his feet, people running toward them. He'd completely lost Maddie. His body was aflame, hurting. He tasted blood. Left me. He had four keepers dragging him back from the lunatic. Maddie. When she finally appeared it was another shock, she wasn't there and then she was, and he could only stare at her in accusation Lee vanished desert me. Maddie, Leave me this, leave animal defend animals fight teeth. Fist barbarian. Damn you damn you Maddie girl left me. Maddie stood speechless. His glare at her was wild, his jaw bleeding from a long scratch, his shirt front torn into three strips and pulled free of his waistcoat. Larkin stood back and allowed the others to pull him toward the house. You let him get too far away from you, miss, the keeper said gruffly. Oh God, she said. He went after my patient like a bulldog. Unprovoked. Did you see him hit? Maddie hadn't seen it start. She'd only turned from her determined stride around the courtyard track when the man's screech had risen, loud enough to curdle blood. They'd been rolling in the dirt, and yes, Jervalks had hit him, beaten him, even after the poor man was insensible. No need for the doctor to know about this, Mississippi. Maddie was still hardly able to speak. We kinda keep these things to ourselves, the attendants. One of us to the other. Don't let him get so far away from you again. No, she whispered, watching as they bundled Jervalks through the door. Larkin put his hand on her shoulder. You see why we don't put fine clothes on the violent patients, Mississippi. He smiled. We know what we're doing here, Mississippi tell me if we don't. Master William, the man Jervalks had beaten, was awake and tied in the infirmary, repeating, Jesus is the devil. Over. And over again with a muttered vehemence. Jervalks was in his. Cell manacled, sitting bare-chested on the bed with only breeches and the rib bandage for decency. Maddie shut the solid door behind her and stood near him. Why? she asked. He looked up at her, beautiful and savage, his hair with dust in it, his face still bloody. She moistened her lips. Why didst thou hit him? He made a groan, shook his head. Kill! No. 
No, I don't believe that. Thou couldst not have wished to kill him. Why didst thou attack him? He gazed at her as if she were some mysterious vision, then shook his head again, looking down. Understand? She asked. He shook his head, dropped it lower. Maddie knelt. I want to understand, she said slowly. Tell me why. His jaw worked. Kill. He lifted his lashes, a brief look, and appeal. M-N-N-H. Me. He made a fist and struck his chest as if he were driving a knife into it. His mouth drew back in a silent grimace. He turned his face away from her. She did not know if it was an answer or a plea. With an uncertain move, she reached out and touched his temple, smoothing his hair back from his lowered face. He flinched as if she surprised him. Then after a moment he relaxed into it, leaning against her hand. It will be all right, she whispered. He made a sound, a strange half-laugh, and shook his head. Again. Just perceptibly, his body rocked, like a strong tree in the wind, a silent sway, too deep for words. Let me clean thy face. He made no response. Maddie rose and poured water from the tin pitcher into the basin. The towel was fresh, she'd brought it herself. She knelt again and began to sponge the blood from his face. He closed his eyes. When she finished, she took his hands and washed the dirt from the raw scrapes there. She rose. The manacles rattled as he put his arm round her hips and leaned his face against her. The chain pressed across the back of her leg. The wristband and his fingers pressed harder. She laid her hand on his shoulder. For a long time, they stayed that way. It might have been all night but for the loud knock on the solid wood door. Larkin stood outside the bars. Doctor found out, he said briefly. I'm to take him down to seclusion until morning. After breakfast Maddie was called into Cousin Edward. He sat at his desk with a large notebook open and a pen in his hand. This will not do, he said. I'm disappointed. I'm sorry. She was miserably, utterly sincere. I allowed myself to go too far away from him. It's fortunate that Master William seems to have taken no serious hurt. His family is connected to the Huntingtons, of Whitehaven, you know. And the Duke, well, he seems prone to injury lately. I wonder now if those ribs weren't somehow cracked in an altercation instead of an accident. He gave her a questioning look, as if she might be hiding something. Ah, no. It was Jervalx himself who showed me that a chair fell. That may be, that may be. Still, Larkin was slow to report this, and you also, cousin. I'm afraid that I must give you both a check. She kept her head down, receiving the reprimand humbly. He wrote in the book. After a pause, her cousin went on. Your reports have been positive. The Duke has not offered you any violence. Maddie didn't lift her eyes. No violence at all. You aren't uneasy in him? She raised her head. He has not been violent toward me. Still... I believe we must restrict his movements for a time. You will continue to serve him, but only with restraints or a male attendant present. We shall see if that suits. I had felt it was going so well. Really, I am surprised to have it reported to me that it was Master Christian who provoked the scuffle rather than Master William, who's been in the very midst of a bad paroxysm for the past fortnight. Once again, he gave Maddie a searching look. I did not see who provoked it, she said. Next time, you will be more careful. I will. I will. I'm so sorry. Chapter 11 She tried to explain to Jervalx where they were going. She had no idea if he understood. He had that look of tautness, of a man frozen but burning inside. With both his hands laced together to the elbows in leather gauntlets, he gripped the strap inside the carriage and stared out the window, as intense as he had been with the mathematics, fixing on ordinary things, 
a haystack, a mill wheel, watching them pass as if they were enemies that might leap upon the vehicle without a moment's warning. He was a mobile explosive ready to set to spark. Maddie sat across from him and her father and prayed from moment to moment that it would not happen. Larkin rode on top of the carriage, much too distant to provide real security or aid. Having embarked on this course of supporting Jervolks, Maddie found it beyond her control now, caught up in the doctor's tests and experimental trials. The Duke had been so subdued for the past fortnight since his fight that Cousin Edward had decided to allow him more freedom with Maddie in the carriage. She was, by her mere presence, to elicit civilized behavior from him, never mind that she was no genteel and noble lady, but only plain Maddie Tims. Never mind that they tied him in gauntlets that anyone could see drove him to the edge of control. Never mind that when they came to the first change, a busy posting house with a yard full of travelers and horses and shouting ostlers, he pushed back in his seat and expelled harsh breathe between his teeth, refusing to get out, and looked at her. with terror and anger and a rigid-jawed shame, then turned his face away. Maddie pulled the curtains closed on the carriage. When Cousin Edward came to the door, she told him that the Duke did not wish to take refreshment here. Cousin Edward, sometimes foolish and sometimes not, looked from her to the dim corner where Jervolk sat, his gaze malevolent and silent, like cat's eyes that turned and caught lantern light in a cellar. We'll stop a little farther on her cousin said. Maddie let go of her breath. I'll stay here then, if thou wouldst take Papa in to tea. When they stopped again, it was in a small and ancient village snug down in a wooded hollow. The midday street was empty, the public house quiet and dark inside its open door. Maddie helped her father from the carriage and turned back, surprised to find Jervalks rising, awkward in the gauntlets, but apparently ready to follow. He disdained aid in descending. When he stood in the street, he looked up the curve of the road. Half-timbered brick cottages with skewed slate roofs and garden walls seemed to warp themselves to the contour of the hill, a treacle flow of buildings instead of a neat, straight modern line. Jervolks looked back at Maddie. His jaw tightened with effort. Pa! He managed and then... Lost. Not at all, not at all, Master Christian. Cousin Edward walked up to them. You mustn't be concerned about that. We've come a little off the main road, but we know precisely where we are, I assure you. Chalfont Street Giles. Jervox made an exasperated snort. Lost. Indeed, we're not lost. Not a bit. St. Giles. Her pop amused as if he couldn't quite recall something. Lost, the Duke said emphatically. Cousin Edward was soothing. No, no. We are not lost. Larkin, you'll see to the Duke. Have a care about handling him. I'm a bit concerned about his mood. Jervalk stood behind Cousin Edward, looking down on him with a caustic scowl. Damned blockhead, he said clearly. Lost. We shall find our way. Cousin Edward responded in a level tone. He scanned Jervox critically. We may have a manic episode developing, I fear. Disrespect and invective are frequent early signs. We'll leave the restraints in place. Will you follow me, Master Christian? Larkin took the Duke's arm. Jervox stepped back, twitching free of the touch. He glanced once at Maddie, a dark look, as if she'd betrayed him, then walked away toward the public house with Larkin, trailing like a bulldog behind a thoroughbred. She moistened her lips. Dost thou wish to take tea, Papa? Her father turned his head, drawn from a thoughtful silence. Tea? No, not at all. Shall we walk a little way for fresh air, Matty girl? It seemed startling to hear her father's pet name for her spoken so clearly and easily. Somehow, Jervox's tortured intonation had become more familiar, or more significant, and effort of will merely to utter the syllables, and therefore each one momentous. 
She took her father's arm, still feeling agitated. They walked a little way in silence until Maddie finally exclaimed, I hope that he isn't about to become disorderly. Disorderly? The Duke? She had never told him about the fight in the courtyard. She smoothed the cuff of her sleeve down, rolling the edge in her fingers. He did seem rather turbulent. Perhaps, instead of thee and me, Cousin Edward would consent to have Larkin ride with him. Thou art frightened? Her father's surprise made Maddie feel a little ashamed. Thou dost not know him, Papa. He's forbidding in a passion. He isn't rational. And he's very strong. He sounded to me quite rational, Papa said. He called Cousin Edward a blockhead. Papa! He stopped, holding her back with a strange little smile. Where are we? We've walked up a hill, have we not? Is there a cottage to the left, red brick, with a chimney facing on the street, and a multitude of vines on the garden side? Oh, yes, one more house up the way. Hast thou been here before? Upon the chimney, is there a sign? Maddie looked. Milton's Cottage. Her father said nothing. She hesitated, gazing at the modest village home. Understanding dawned. She burst into a laugh. Oh no, he is a blockhead. And so am I. We aren't lost at all, are we? She made an imitation of Cousin Edward's soothing reassurance to the Duke. Why, you mustn't worry, Master Christian. We know precisely where we are, Master Christian. Chalfont Street Giles. Paradise Lost. The very house where Milton wrote it. Thy mother and I stopped to visit among the friends here when thou wast only a babe in arms. What simpletons the Duke must think us. His face when Cousin Edward kept saying we weren't lost. Oh, Papa. She bit her lip as the laughter died and her voice broke. Oh, Papa, how he hates it. What's happened to him? He needs thee, Maddie girl. Her father laid his hand over hers. He needs thy faith. Even when thou art frightened. I didn't think. I haven't been sure. I've been praying. I was so certain before, but now. She shut her mouth tightly. Her father stood silent, his hand still. He kissed me, Papa. How she wanted to say it, but could not. She would repulse him beyond forgiving. The Duke was his friend, and Maddie. She hadn't even tried to prevent it. She thought she must have lured Jervox, that the devil had gotten into her, too, and made her look at the Duke and see comeliness in his earthy shape. A woman minister had spoken out in meeting just weeks ago, when it had meant nothing to Maddie, when she had hardly been listening, words that came back now with vivid precision, as if God wished her to recall them in perfect detail. All our joys, pleasures, profits, all things delightful to the flesh, they be but vanity and vexation. We become silent, not answering to obey the lusts of the carnal mind. Maddie didn't feel silent. Inside her a clamor of vanity and delight and joy and vexation tumbled. She felt wicked and weak, a foreigner to herself. She felt afraid. I don't know what to do, she said painfully. I don't know. Her father lifted his head. After a long moment, he said slowly, Is it so difficult, Maddie girl? She couldn't tell him. She could not. It seems to be she said, looking down at his hand on her. Arm. Thou wouldst rather go home, then? She thought of doing that. Returning to Shane Row and the safe and quiet life there, where the only temptations were small ones, a disposition to scold the maid and a frivolous envy of girls who owned pretty clothes. Going home, leaving him to Larkin and Cousin Edward and Master William, to silence and chains and a prison cell. I'm sure that I would rather go, she said. But I, she made a sound of despair. I could not. He patted her hand. Thou art a good girl, Maddie. Oh, Papa, she cried. 
I'm not. He only smiled, as if she were still an impulsive child. But Maddie knew. She wasn't good. She was tied to the earth and the devil and a man, and she was not good at all. They arrived in London at dusk, the city smells and population ajar to Maddie after only a month in the country. The chaise never slowed, but rolled past Hyde Park into Oxford Street, where bright gay lights already gleamed on the row of lacquered carriages standing in wait down the middle while ladies and gentlemen passed in and out of the shops. A silversmith, a spirit booth, jewelers and linen stores and confectioners, a mile of goods and spectacles, everything lit and polished for display. The Duke watched it pass, glancing keenly sometimes at Maddie, suspiciously, as if she had somehow conjured the illusion of it all. She tried to explain, to prepare him for the hearing, but she knew he had no notion of what she meant. She could tell by the suppressed elation in him, he thought he was coming home to stay. When the coach turned out of Oxford Street, and began to wind its way through stylish side streets, he held out his bound arms toward her. Off, he said. The carriage came into an aristocratic square. She could hear the calls of footmen and the bustle to clear pedestrians from the passage. Please! The word came harshly, the sharp explosion of it in stark contrast to the appeal. Outside, liveried servants milled about as the vehicles creaked to a halt before the house at the head of the square. The freestanding building dominated its neighbors, white and symmetrical, pristine in its Corinthian pilasters and balanced windows, not so different from the Duke's home in Belgrave Square but larger and colder in its isolated perfection, with a small and unwelcoming door just one step up from the street. That door stood open, showing lights inside. Maddy saw Calvin the butler come down the single step and stand aside. Then came the dowager duchess in a black dress. She took Calvin's help to the sidewalk and hurried toward Cousin Edward's carriage. Maddy leaned over, pulling Jervalk's hands into her lap. In the dimness, she struggled with the leather laces and just managed to pull them free as her cousin and the duchess came to the carriage door. The gauntlets fell into obscurity on the floor. Maddie kicked them back into a corner. Jervalx made a sound of gratitude, not quite accomplishing a real word. Lantern light poured into the interior as the door opened and the Duchess' voice rose above the others. Christian! She paused, as if she didn't know how to go on, staring up at him from the curb. She took a step backward, her black skirts shifting around her. A footman moved close to her side as she closed her eyes and put her hand to her throat. No, go away. I shan't let myself be overcome. She opened her eyes. Go away, all of you. People will stare at this bustle. Someone might recognize him. She turned to Cousin Edward and gestured toward an alley beside the house. Drive around to the rear. We shall take him inside there. No, the duke said. His mother looked back, as startled as if one of the horses had spoken. She and Jervolks were hardly alike at all, different in everything, the dowager's hair graying from blonde instead of black, her skin fair to paleness, her figure slender and far more delicate, in her eyes but a hint of the midnight blue of her son's. But when her face lit with hope, Maddie saw the same intensity that kindled the duke in his mathematical passions, a stubborn, focused ardor as the duchess swept forward and caught the edge of the carriage door. Christian? Are you? She stopped herself again and glanced at Cousin Edward. He's made some progress lately, the doctor said. I think your grace will be pleased. Jervox picked up his hat where Maddie had laid it on the seat and beckoned her and her father to get down. She obeyed. Helping Papa to come behind her, while the Dowager Duchess watched them speechlessly. This is Miss Archimedia Timms, and her father, Mr. John Timms, Your Grace. Miss Timms, in particular, has been of assistance with the Duke. We've instituted a novel treatment in his case. I shall apprise you of the details at the first opportunity, but as you see, our success speaks for itself. 
The dowager was paying no attention to Maddie or her father. Instead, she was watching her son descend from the carriage. Jervox gave his mother a dry smile and a bow. He said nothing, only stood by the coach as if he were courteously waiting for someone to suggest a direction. The duchess kept staring at him. Her whole body seemed to shudder. Suddenly a sob burst from her, and she walked into his arms, pulling herself close to him. For an instant, he was very still. Above his mother's trembling embrace, Maddie could see the near explosion, the way his expression went to emotional tempest, all the words that battled for freedom. His left hand closed into a hard fist. His eyes met Maddie's. Fury came so close to detonation, she could not imagine that his mother didn't recognize it. He had no way to speak, only violence, and violence hovered, vibrating in the genteel square. Maddie stood in terror, pleading with him silently. He closed his eyes. With a long, indrawn breath, he lifted his right hand and laid it, tentative, against the dowager's head. She began to weep in earnest, pressing closer. The moment of hazard seemed to pass. He stood, awkwardly touching his mother's coiffured hair like a man put upon by an overeager child and uncertain how to deal with it. But his left hand never relaxed the fist, still locked in mute hostility. The Duchess pushed back a little, turning her face up, smoothing his collar with restless fingers. Christian. She caught his hand as it fell away and held it against her breast. Praise God. I've prayed for this. It is a miracle. Progress, Your Grace. Cousin Edward said. Progress based on scientific treatment. We are not wholly recovered yet. It's a miracle. We should go down on our knees and lift our thanks to heaven. She gripped her son's hand hard. You most of all, Christian, in consequence of your sins. Give thanks for forgiveness and for your deliverance. She bowed her head. Almighty God, who dost bequeath us life and taketh it away on whose sufferance we— Jervalks freed himself. He turned and walked away from her, as Calvin sprang forward to hold open the door. His mother finished her prayer quickly, moving her lips in silence, and went after him. She disappeared into the lighted hall with Cousin Edward on her heels. Calvin held the door open and looked back. Miss Timms? Mr. Timms? There was a moment, when he came into the hall, that he— found himself alone. He turned at the sound of footsteps, expecting Maddie girl, but it was his mother behind him with her pious gibberish. He forgot it, half forgot her, until she'd wept on his chest in the street, and he'd realized that she must be the one who had abandoned him to the cell and the ape. In the hall, he disengaged himself from her again, working for command of himself, waiting for Maddie girl, feeling the world go out of balance until her gray the thou figure appeared in the doorway. Once he knew she was there, he could go on, he mounted the mahogany staircase, his hand on the curved banister. He owned this house. It seemed strange and disturbing and right. How long it had been since he'd walked this stair, this hall, he had no idea, but he owned it. Everyone here would do his bidding, even his mother lived in it at his pleasure. It occurred to him that he himself didn't live here. Not now. What he remembered best were times far in the past, seasons in the city, balls for his sisters, going home to Jervalks. That was where he lived, and he felt a surge of sharp longing for its dark medieval silhouette, its convoluted towers and chimneys and endless rooms. That was where he would go, now that he was free. Home to Jervalks Castle. Two of his sisters waited in the drawing room. He stood at the door, watching them before they knew he was there. They talked to one another in low tones and looked nervous. At the sound of other footsteps on the stair behind him, they turned. They looked at him as if he were not alive. Transparent. Walking dead. In the shock on their faces, another revelation came to him. He knew what they'd expected. A madman, carried upstairs to be exhibited in chains. No wonder they were nervous. His mother passed him, 
taking him by the arm with her into the drawing room. She talked, kept talking so quickly that he felt overwhelmed. Clementia. He caught the name and remembered Clem. With that came Charlotte's. Both of them reached out and kissed his cheek in turn, puffed sleeves and lace, plump hands that caught at his and brushed gently before they were gone. He felt bewildered, uncertain of them and their sudden smiles. Their dresses seemed too bright and elaborate, their hair too much of rolls and ringlets. He looked back again for Maddie, found only the blood doctor, and strode to the head of the staircase. She was standing in the hall below with her father, still in her bonnet and cloak. He went halfway down the stairs and stopped. When she looked up, he made a sound. He watched her face change, felt a vast and forceful relief when she put her hand to the tie on her cloak, murmuring to Calvin as he took it from her. She guided her father to the foot of the stairs. Christian stood waiting for their slow progress until they reached him. He would not attempt to speak in front of his family and servants who knew him. He walked silently around the edges of the white and gold drawing room while the others talked. The house pleased him. Everything familiar and in its proper place, the marble tables with their gilded legs, the matching chairs, rich green fabric, all older than he was, standing in the places they had stood for his whole life. He had to turn sometimes to be certain Maddie was there, because the others didn't talk to her or even offer her or her father a seat. That provoked him. He fixed a look on Charlotte, willing her to show a little courtesy, but she only glanced at him and grew pale and discomfited. Should Shud be load loose? She asked the woman anxiously. Loose. As if he were some zoo animal, to be locked up. My house. Own it, own you, dress, lace, fancy, trust, all of it. He knew these too. They were the ones who needed Christian's right name pen to get into their equity, who most liked a generous supplement to their husband's means, a thing which galled those gentlemen to the edge of civility. Christian noticed that they didn't seem inclined to make an appearance on his first night home. He suspected Clem and Charlotte were here for precisely that, allowance, and he didn't know what he would do when they finally asked. Everything before the cell and the ape was hazy. He couldn't recall what quarter it was or if he'd made arrangements. He turned away from them, facing the mantel, where a good fire burned in the well-swept grate. He would ask Matty Girl to help him after they were gone. Are sure angry thus? Clementia spoke into a small silence. Chris? He realized that she was talking to him. He locked his hands behind his back and slanted a look toward her. Chew angry? She repeated. He looked at Maddie Girl, still standing a little distance from the others. He walked to the edge of the room, retrieved two chairs, and placed them for the Timses. He set the gilt pair with thuds that could hardly be misinterpreted, then guided Mr. Tims to one himself. When Maddie hesitated, he took up a position behind the empty chair and bumped it, frowning at her. She cast down her eyes and sat. His family looked at him as if he were an astonishing puzzle. Clem started to speak, then closed her mouth abruptly, distracted by the familiar snap and thump of a walking stick. That sound Christian knew to the bottom of his brain, since before the day he'd even learned to talk, the adamant herald of his Aunt Vesta. With a sardonic smile, he placed a chair for her, too, her favorite, the heavy French smallbird's flowers with massive gold arms and dragon claw feet, fit thrown for a she-dragon. He looked up from setting it close to the fire, sketched a bow as she stood in the doorway, imposing pale against sable black, in the morning for father, husband, brother, perhaps even for. Christian, who could tell, that she had never put off. It was a battle of jet and ebony in this house, between his mother and his aunt. He remembered why he didn't live here. You look well, Jervalx, Lady de Marley announced, moving toward him. Maddie had recognized her instantly, needing no introduction to know that here was the author of those rigorous and pointed letters in the Duke's file at Blydale Hall, 
the lady who sent fastidiously tailored clothes instead of devout sentiments, who had marched so fixedly into the house in Belgrave Square on that morning when Mattie had stood watching. With a rush of help from one of the fashionable young women, Lady de Marley seated herself in the chair Jervolx offered. Her brows were painted on to skin the color of shriveling white petals, her lips and cheeks delicately but visibly. Rouged. She lifted one thin finger. I shall have a glass of claret. The duke tilted his head. After an instant of hesitation, he reached out and used the belt pull beside the fireplace. You will upset your digestion, Aunt Vesta, the young woman said. Lady de Marley ignored her. She looked to the side, speaking to Jervox where he stood behind her. Come here where I can see you, young man. She gestured with her walking stick, tapping the floor beyond her feet. He moved into her view. She looked him up and down. Maddie didn't think a more handsome and elegant gentleman could be imagined. You look as if you were going to a French musicale in a hunting cravat. Where is the signet? Lady de Marley demanded. Ah. Uh, Cousin Edward fumbled in his pocket. I brought that, my lady. I deemed it best to keep it under my own protection until we arrived. You need keep it no longer. He went to her, bowing in a most servile and unquakerish way, and handed her a small box. She merely took it and held it out to Jervalx. Maddie didn't know if the others could see the Duke's subtle wariness. He accepted the box, looked down at it in his hand. As Lady de Marley gave orders for wine to the servant who had just arrived in the doorway, Jervalx slid a glance toward Maddie. She surreptitiously closed her hand, as if round an object, and slipped her fist down the side of her skirt. Jervalx tightened his fingers on the box and felt for the side pocket in his coat, dropping the case inside. He gave her a covert, one-sided smile. You look well, Jervalx, Lady de Marley repeated. I don't scruple to say that I'm surprised. How has this been accomplished, Dr. Timms? I understood from your last report that little progress had taken place. We've instituted an innovative therapy, my lady, Cousin Edward said eagerly. It's been successful beyond our expectations. Innovative? She regarded him suspiciously. What therapy is this? The natural extension of our social and moral treatment. We find at Blydale Hall that a regulated social commerce between the sexes can be notably effective in encouraging self-control. I described it to you, my lady, you may remember, when I came to escort the patient to Blydale. But of course a minimum standard of behavior must be achieved before we can introduce a violent patient to the larger group. As I had communicated to you, his grace had not approached this quality of conduct, but remained sullen, with unpredictable fits of mania, in his behavior toward all attendants and myself. However, we had a fortunate opportunity in the arrival of my cousin Miss Timms. Knowing her to be of mild and steady feminine character, unimpeachable in her moral fiber, I took care to assign her as the Duke's primary daytime attendant. I did so in the expectation that under her influence any remaining vestige of self-control might best be encouraged. I think you will agree that this approach has been most beneficial. He was working hard to govern his triumph and keep to a professional tone, but could not quite conceal his satisfaction. Lady de Marley didn't even look at him as he spoke, but remained watching Jervalx for a long moment after he finished. She turned her imperious gaze on Maddie. You are Miss Timms? Maddie stood up. I am. This is my father, John Timms. Be seated. Maddie felt those dark eyes fixed on her as she sat again. She kept her gaze just a point lower than Lady de Marley's, not. Bowing like a child of the world, but not taking a stand of open. Disrespect either. When last I saw my nephew, Lady de Marley said. He was a bellowing beast. He was tied into a bed, his hand cut down to the bone from putting it through a window before he was stopped. He had broken the arm of the footman in charge of him, who was attempting to prevent him strangling his brother-in-law. 
He would not feed himself. His speech was that of an idiot. He roared. He howled. He was an animal, Miss Timms. The Duke of Jervolks was a mindless brute. She stared at Maddie. I would like an explanation of how you have realized this change. Maddie lifted her eyes and looked directly at Lady de Marley. He is not mindless, she said steadily, nor a brute. For a long moment, the old lady did not respond. Then she said, with a little wry wrinkle of her lips, I must say, miss, that he had me fooled on the subject. I believe. Maddie glanced at Cousin Edward, who didn't look entirely happy with her, but he hadn't said that she should not speak her opinion. I believe that he is in his right mind, and no more in. Idiot, than thou or me. Lady de Marley lifted her eyebrows. A lofty little Quaker. I don't wish to be lofty. I only wish to explain to thee. In my day, miss, we called the way you talk uncivil. Your cousin here don't thee and now his betters. Maddie merely kept her eyes up and level, declining to be drawn into a defense of her plain speech. She had known old. Ladies just like Lady de Marley before, there was nothing she would like better than a good rousing argument that might be turned into a scold. Maddie had a certain affection for the type. She sometimes thought that she might turn out to be one herself, held back now only by her papa's gentle refusal to rise to any baiting. Cousin Edward pursed his cheeks in a vexed way at her, and she recalled her promise not to use Quaker language with outsiders. But it was too late now, and she had a feeling that if she gave in and apologized, Lady de Marley would only like her the less for it. So, the elderly woman said to the duke. Miss Timms declares that you are perfectly sane. Jervalk simply stood looking at her. Well, boy, what have you to say to that? He turned his head a little, the way he did when he was intent on something, regarding it obliquely instead of straight. On. Do you understand me? He glanced uneasily at Maddie. Don't look to her. It's to you I speak. Can you hear what I say? His mouth tightened. He nodded once and briefly, then began an expressive contemplation of a side table. It certainly bore contemplation, as its black marble top was upheld, instead of by mere legs, by two huge golden birds with spreading wings that seemed to dash flames from their tips. It would have been the most rich and gaudy piece of furniture Maddie had ever seen if it hadn't been matched by one precisely like it on the opposite side of the mantelpiece. Lady de Marley tapped her stick rapidly against the floor. She scowled at her nephew. This is no time for your willfulness, boy. You've had you a score of years to treat us to your caprice, wild and thoughtless as a Red Indian you've been, and paying for it now. No one can tell me that a sensible man would have got himself tangled in that barbarous exchange of shots at all, far less wake up from it a bedlamite. Only the duke's tense jaw gave any sign that he even realized that she spoke to him. Lady de Marley sat back in her chair with a sharp sigh. Young fool. She fixed an accusing look on Maddie. What sort of progress is this? If thou wilt perhaps speak slowly. Maddie ventured. You said that he wasn't an idiot. Maddie stood up. No more an idiot than thou wouldst be set down in China amongst Chinamen. He will understand, if thou hast patience with him. Miss Timms, tomorrow at ten o'clock he comes before the Lord Chancellor. I have managed to see that it will be private. No jury has been called, not yet. She sent a withering look toward her two nieces. The vultures are covetous, however. I suggest that if you don't wish to see your prize subject warranted an idiot under the law, then you'd best bend your moral fiber and steady character rather smartly to the task of making him understand his peril. Her words died away into a stunned and uncomfortable silence. The servant's door opened, and a footman padded in, carrying Lady de Marley's claret. She took it from the tray and drank a sip, never taking her eyes from Jervalk's. Then she set the glass on a side table and pushed herself out of the chair. 
Miss Timms will stop here tonight. The rest of you, leave us. The Dowager Duchess looked shocked. But Dr. Timms? Lady de Marley cut her short. I understood that he had accommodation? The Gloucester, I believe. Yes, my lady. Cousin Edward bowed. Twice. I wish to speak with the doctor, the Duchess said, rather plaintively. I wish to find out how Christian's been going on. Hetty, dear, Lady de Marley said dryly, if you have not already discovered in the last quarter hour how he's been going on, there is nothing the man can tell you that will not keep until tomorrow. Will you join us for breakfast, doctor? Eight o'clock. I would be honored, my lady. I'll just call our night attendant to settle the patient in his bed, Cousin Edward said. Will that be necessary, Miss Timms? Under Lady de Marley's dictatorial eye, Maddie groped for a proper answer. I think it would be wise. That's as it may be. I find it highly inconvenient to have extra servants in the house this evening. I hope you feel yourself up to the task. She glanced at the footman. Tell Pato to air the bedding from Miss Timms in the Duke's dressing room. Maddie stood rooted to the floor as Lady de Marley began to thump her way toward the door. She stopped and turned back. You're blushing, girl. I thought you was a nurse? Yes, Maddie managed to say. And he's an idiot until you prove me different. See to it that we have no bizarre scenes out of him tonight. Chapter 12 As luxurious as Blydale Hall had been, as comfortable and rich as the Duke's house in Belgrave Square had appeared, Maddie had never even imagined that behind the pale facades of houses such as this were interiors beyond commonplace imagination, servants dressed like princes in snowy satin trimmed with blue and silver lace, walls of red velvet adorned by huge paintings, intricate plaster moldings painted in white and gold, carpets that muffled the sound of her feet, candelabra glowing everywhere. When the liveried footman showed her into the duke's dressing room, she tried not to betray her astonishment, but as soon as the servant was gone, leaving Maddie alone with her small traveling case, she looked up at the ceiling and couldn't help herself. She choked back appalled laughter. It was absurd. A dressing room, and it was painted in royal blue, with huge pediments bordered in intricate bands of gold. Over the doors. Not only that, Above the pediments were round. Portraits of solemn gentlemen surrounded by languishing gilded cherubs draped over frames of flowers, crossed banners, all gold, then blue velvet up to the arched ceiling where a riot of design glittered, stately rows of knobs and leaves, more gold, highlighting every pattern detail. The narrow room blazed with it. Maddie hardly saw how one was expected to sleep amid such splendor. On the far wall, the connecting door to the bedroom stood open. Maddie heard the Duchess' voice from beyond and peeked around the tall and glossy door panel. You'll be all right, Christian? His mother stood hesitantly near the door from the hall, while a maid worked quickly at turning down the bedclothes and drawing the curtains. Jervox paid neither any mind, but looked about the bedroom with his painstaking intensity, as if he were memorizing it. This room was blue also but not so garish as the dressing room, a powder color that Maddie thought quite pretty even if the bed was an outrageous extravagance, with a headboard that rose all the way to the ceiling and then curved over like a huge sea wave. Damask silk drapings matched the walls. The only diversity of color was in the full-length portraits and a dark blue and green oriental carpet that covered the floor from wall to wall. Jervox caught sight of himself in a mirrored bureau cabinet. He gazed at the glass, then turned, looking for something behind him. With a little surprise, Maddie realized that it was her. He smiled when he saw her, and some of the tension left him. She stepped out into the bedroom. The dowager duchess glanced toward her. Ah, Miss Timms, you don't think you will need. She stopped, looking embarrassed. I don't. Suppose there's no chance that he might wander in the night? Maddie realized that the Duchess was afraid of him, 
and wished him restrained. Though Maddie was hardly so certain of him herself, she found it somehow terrible that his own mother would offer the suggestion. Thou canst lock the doors if thou wishest, she said. Perhaps that would be best. The windows. She let the thought trail off. Well, you will ring if you have trouble. I'll have a footman in the hall all night. But he seems so much better. I don't imagine. You don't think he might try the windows? Maddie looked at Jervalx. Even having seen him chained at Blydale Hall, she could not envision what he must have been like to have inspired this alarm in his own family. The windows, Jervalx? She asked slowly. Thou wouldst not break them. He shook his head. She wasn't certain he understood her, for he didn't hesitate or attend to the words, but seemed merely to assent to the tone of her voice. I'll leave you then, the Duchess said. Cook is to send up. A tea tray. She gave her son a long look. Good night, Christian. Good night. He gave a slight bow and a Serbic smile. The maid passed Maddie and went into the dressing room. I shall pray, the dowager announced, and pulled the hall door closed behind her. The key turned in the lock. Christian sat on the bed. He leaned his head back, clasping his hands behind his neck, and let himself fall backwards into the soft down. He sighed in satisfaction. Home. No ape, no chains, no nightmare. He didn't mind a dressing down from the she-dragon. He was accustomed to it. Hell's bells, he almost enjoyed it. And Maddie Girl was here, the only thing he would have taken with him from that place if he'd had his own choosing. Amazing upside-down world, in which his family locked him in with a young and pretty female. Nurse, Aunt Vesta had said, and Christian grinned at the blue arch of fabric above him. He drew up his leg and rested his heel on the edge of the bed indulging in an enjoyable contemplation of the wilder sort of possibilities to which such a convenient designation of one's mistress might lend themselves. He sighed. While it made a pleasant fantasy, things were different now. The reputation of a thee thou girl might not have occurred to his family. They wouldn't care about it if it had. But while she was entirely within his dominion she was also his responsibility. Seduction was no longer the neat lesson that he'd anticipated. From this perspective, it looked too much like the sort of offensive attentions a man might force on his housemaid. It was hard to recall, really, why he'd even got the notion in his head to punish her in that way. He was frowning, contemplating that, when she said his name. He turned his head and lifted his eyebrows. We must talk, she said. He made a questioning sound. Talk, she said. Christian sat up. He pushed himself up on the bed, lounging on pillows, and swept a space on the bedclothes to invite her. Talk. He was pleased with how easily the word came. Instead of the bed, she chose a straight back chair facing him. Thou unstand hap tomorrow? Tomorrow? Here, she said. I hear, he said, annoyed that she would question it. Hearing, she repeated. Lord Chancellor. He didn't remember a Lord Chancellor. Christian knew there was much he didn't remember, but to think of it made him. Uneasy. Chan Dos? He demanded. She couldn't mean Buckingham's son. The Marquis of Chandos hadn't any trouble with his hearing that Christian knew, and he knew Chandos well. They'd gambled and raked together from London to Paris and back. Trouble with his ruinous extravagance, oh yes, but not his ears. Not since Christian could remember. Here, she insisted. Hearing. He had to work for another word. Yum, he said. Chandos couldn't be deaf. He and Christian were of an age. She shook her head and clasped her hands with a sigh. He knew that he was failing what she wanted. He had an urge to pound something, to smash his fists into stone. With an angry mutter he rolled off the bed away from her. At a scratch and the sound of the door lock, she rose. A footman entered, pushing the tea cart. 
He gave Christian a wary glance, then wordlessly began to remove the covers and pour. The minced tarts and thin sliced bread and butter appeared civilized fare. Christian walked toward the tray. The cups rattled as the footman dropped one back into its saucer and turned to face him. Christian stopped. Never in his life had a servant looked at him with such a suspicious vigilance, as if he were some footpad shadowing the fellow in a back street. He felt as if he'd been slapped across the face. He just stood there, accused and condemned in silence and a look. Should tie up, miss? The man said to Maddie. Christian felt hot amazement rise in his face. Who was this impudent rogue? He looked toward Maddy Girl in powerless shock. He didn't even have a recourse, couldn't order the fellow out of the room and out of his employment. No, she answered, at least that. Christian thought she should have cast him out on his ear. Not afraid him? The footman asked her. Afraid of him? Maddy shook her head and Christian felt a wave of passionate appreciation for her. The servant picked up the teapot once again, still glancing at Christian. Broke arm, did? Christian couldn't prevent it. At this monstrous assertion, a twisted utterance of protest escaped him. Out. He took a step forward. Son of a bitch, buggering horse, son bastard. Out. He realized at the same moment as the footman what he'd said and just how well and loudly. The two of them looked at one another. They both looked at Maddie. She sat in her scoop sugar bonnet, her fingers locked, her brows drawn together dubiously. She didn't have the vaguest notion of the full insult to her feminine sensibility. That was obvious, but he gave her a short nod of apology anyway, and then glared at the footman, unable to express anything but obscenities. Haps best go, Maddie said, standing up. The footman replaced the teapot, made a stiff bow, and obeyed her. She came to the cart and finished pouring tea. With quiet and methodical moves, she prepared a plate and then set it out on the bedside table. Not arm, Christian said, determined to correct the record. Not see, never. Thost eat, she said. Christian scowled. He crossed his arms and leaned on the wall. Believe. Eat. He shoved away. Believe. Matty girl. A little Puritan pinch appeared around her lips. Thou dost not member. She didn't believe him. She believed that puling peasant over him. Christian hit his fist against the wall. The pinch of her lips tightened. Thou wast still, she said, very slowly and clearly. Thou dost not remember. He swung away from her, pacing the width of the room. No. No, no, no. Jervalks. She said his name so sharply, with such decisive emphasis, that he stopped and stared at her. Moro. Lord Chancer here. Famous Shokam sense. Reasonable. Who? He shouted. Not deaf. Nor I, she said, lifting her chin. He exhaled, stiff-jawed, nodding once to acknowledge that. Who, Lord? He asked, in a quieter tone. Chansor. Lord Chansor. Comacy hearing. He felt the importance of it in the intense way she looked at him. He needed to understand. She wanted him to. Come. See here? He asked helplessly. Hearing. He shook his head, gave it up. He was to go and see some deaf old lord trying to hear, and it was important. She must have slept, because she had the sensation of coming awake. She felt a long and dreadful moment of fright at the monstrous design of bright eyes that seemed to hover too close before she remembered, and recognized the gilt pattern on the ceiling above. She sat up quickly in bed. Jervalks? She saw a movement in the dark corner. A black silhouette detached itself from the mass of the door. Real terror rose up to envelop her in the sound of her own heart pounding. Maddy, he said, in the silence and the inner thunder of her heart, but in such an uncertain tone that she let go of a breath, 
relief following on dread, leaving her muscles weak. What is it? she asked, her voice unsteady. He was barely illuminated by the shielded lamp she'd left lit. Hearing. He had the emerald green dressing gown around him, loose and open, with nothing on beneath it but his trousers. Maddie girl. Tell hearing. Lord Chance. Lou, legal. Legal? She bit her lip. Yes. A legal hearing. Competency hearing. In the faint light, his eyes were black, his aspect satanic, and yet dazed. Comp me? Yes, she said. He looked down at her, and then at the lamp and the dusky gleam of polished wood that was the dressing table. He shook. His head a little. She drew her knees up under her skirt and held. Then to her breast, watching him. He focused a look on her suddenly, a demon look in that strange light. The cot creaked as he grabbed her arm, sat by her, fixing her with a vehement gaze. Back? he demanded. Send back? His grip hurt. She endured it, giving him that, for she had no other comfort. I don't know. He closed his eyes. Not back, mad place. He opened them, glared at her. No. She wanted to lie, to say that what was true was false. The best that she could offer him was saying that she didn't know, and even that was half a lie, told outside the light of truth, against everything she'd been taught all her life. Thou must show sense tomorrow, she said. Speak calmly and show sense. He held her arm, sending pain to the bone. Thou canst do it. He looked toward the hallway door. Maddie saw his thought instantly. For an arrested moment they were both still, caught on the edge of his intention. Lock? His fingers grew tighter yet. She would not lie. Instead, she gave no answer at all. He let go of her, walked to the door. The knob turned easily under his hand. The hinges moved half an inch without sound. He held it there and looked back at her. Go, he said between his teeth. She sat helpless, waiting for him to do it. He stood with the handle beneath his hand. Two, go. With a motion of his head, he beckoned. Both. No, she whispered. I can't. Thou must not. He frowned at her, as if she'd put an obstacle in his way. With a careful motion, he cracked the door wider, leaned against the frame and looked through. A ray of light from the hall fell on his face, crossing it in a slice of diabolic contours. His mouth curved upward in a contemptuous smile. The crack closed silently. Bone break, he said in the darkness. Arm. Her eyes readjusted to the gloom. He turned his back to the door and stood looking at her. Matty girl, he said. Back, he broke off and then from deep in his throat said, Die. She had no answer. He came to her, sat again beside her on the bed, grasped her by both arms. Not back. No. It is not my decision. It is not mine to say. Go. There was pleading in his voice. Now. She pushed at him, not knowing what to do. Go, then. I will not stop thee. He held on to her, shook her. Two. Two go. No, she said miserably. That's impossible. Christian bent his head, made a sound of agony. Not. One go. Maddie. His fingers drove into her shoulders. Can't. He pulled her toward him, leaned his face into the curve of her neck. Maddie. Maddie girl. Not one. Can't. He pressed his forehead hard against her, his jaw taut with silent entreaty. He was disintegrating. It came to this, after the locks and the keepers and the chains. If she had handed him a key, he could not have walked out free. He didn't have the courage. Not himself, one, without two. 
but to go back that place, the cell, the ape. He held to her, his body paralyzed, frozen, shattering in panic. Jervalks. She touched his hair, her voice anguished. Moro, Thamus, calm. Sense. Shows sense a shows m- Maddie, he said, muffled into her skin, all he could say. He shook his head, all he could do. He had no sense or sanity. He had to go, to escape, but he was frozen. He was shaking all. Over. She bent her head, pressed her cheek to his, her hand. Moving lightly over his hair. He turned his face into her throat. She seemed the only thing important in the universe, his one hold on reality. He made an impassioned sound, to tell her what words could never have said anyway, the magnitude of his need to have her with him. He felt her draw a little shuddering breath, and then a wet tumble of water on her cheek. She whispered, God forgive, Jervox, that I sh'd of thee. That I should love thee. It broke the spell that held him. Had she said that? He pushed back, gazing at her. Faint lamplight caught the glistening curve of her cheek, but he couldn't see her eyes. She smoothed her hand over his arm, a touch, and then gone. He felt confounded, too stupid to compass it. He wasn't certain that he had heard it right. She turned her face down, drawing away from him. He let her go. He stood up. She was lost in darkness, unmoving. His brain seemed befuddled. He wanted to go somewhere and lean his face against the cool wall and find his way through the disorder. The worst was that she wept. He felt angry at it. No pity thee thou church charity. Was that what she meant? Why she cried? Because he was an animal afraid to leave its cage. No words to say what he thought. No thoughts but muddled mad stupid thoughts. He left her there and walked into the deeper darkness of the room where his father and grandfather and great-grandfather had slept in state. He lay face down on the bed, his arms spread, his cheek against the silken sheets. His ribs ached. If he'd known a prayer, he would have prayed it, coward that he was, to ask for favors now, when he never deigned to ask before. He didn't reckon that God owed him anything. He... Reckoned that he'd had it all, and wasted it. Burning lakes sent. Howling fiends had just never seemed that convincing, perils hardly fit to frighten naughty children. He turned over, staring up at the darkest. Damned, having found out now what hell was really like. Chapter 13 From out the window of the chamber, one could imagine Lincoln's in a country town, with the leaves slipping down from venerable trees, green lawns, a meeting-house stillness broken by the passage of one or two men fluttering in black robes through the late afternoon sun and shadows. Here in the middle of London, the loudest sound was a crow cawing in a nearby tree while his sable brothers marched with stately, halting tread across the walks. Maddie sat with her papa in the window seat, cousin Edward and Jervalk standing on either side of her, and Larkin a few steps away. It was almost crowded in this room where they waited. By the fire, Lady Clementia and Lady Charlotte and two more of Jervox's sisters had their chairs pulled up behind Lady de Marley and the Dowager Duchess. The ladies' husbands clustered near the door, speaking very softly among themselves, conferring sometimes with a bewigged man who stood in the doorway and sorted through papers without entering the room. Lady de Marley had particularly asked that Manny and Papa be present, which was daunting. A very somber and low-voiced barrister had already interviewed the Timses in a separate room, asking all about the Duke and his behavior. The advocate made notes and cross-examined Papa at length on the mathematical work, but when Manny rose and escorted Papa out, she had no very clear idea of what might come of it. The counselor had gone away then with Lady de Marley and Jervalx, who came back strung to a higher tension yet, resonating beneath a veneer of stillness. He stood beside Maddie now, impeccably turned out by a valet who had unceremoniously evicted her from the dressing room this morning. No pretty embroidered waistcoat this time, but severe white, unadorned, with white knee breeches and a dark blue coat that Lady de Marley had pronounced suitable. 
He appeared as severe as a Quaker, but with a look that Maddie had never seen on any friend's face, save on a man disowned from the meeting for marriage by a priest to one of the world. That was what his relations wished to do to Jervalks, Maddie thought, deny him. Disclaim and renounce him, make him disappear from family and place. As they sat waiting all the long afternoon in the chancery chamber, she came to understand without anyone telling her, it was these, his own kin, his own. Sisters and the men they had married, even his mother, who urged this inquiry, and only Lady de Marley stood on the other side. The summons came to attend the Lord Chancellor. Lady de Marley rose, and with her all the ladies, but it was Jervalx alone who was wanted. Lady de Marley thrust out her stick and sat back down. Do not fail me, she snapped at the Duke. At the door, the advocate stood waiting, square-jawed and expressionless beneath his wig. Jervalks cast Maddie a look of utter desperation. She gripped her hands hard together, unable. To say to him what she wished to say not in front of these others, to will him courage and faith. Your grace? The barrister said. His lordship awaits you. A slow cold blaze of hate came into the duke's face. It made him frightening. He looked at his family, one by one, each of his sisters, his brothers-in-law, his mother, as if he marked them, not to forget this. Then he walked forward to the barrister and the door. With one of his strange shifts of reality, Christian recognized the man at the table, Lyndhurst, Chancellor's robes, change government. He remembered that. He remembered, canny. A whole portion of his life suddenly opened to him. Lyndhurst stopped the rapid tapping of his fingers and looked up from the papers in his hand. A relief seemed to come into his face, replacing nervous restlessness, when he saw Christian standing silently. Lyndhurst rose and came around the table, holding out his hand. Christian knew him, a notorious womanizer, renegade. Wig, a long, long way from Christian's small radical corner of the lords but not the worst of the old men. Lord Chancellor now. Plum advance. But Christian recalled that, precariously. Tory crisis, talk and uncertainties, he felt adrift, with no notion of how long ago it had been or where the government stood. Now. No revolution, at least, not with the likes of Lyndhurst, made Lord Chancellor. He clapped Christian on the shoulder, took his hand, the baffling moment when Christian couldn't lift it dissolved. Christian moved, became a human being able to return the pressure of greeting. Lukel, sir! Verwell! Christian nodded. Come have seat. Wonek Long. Spoke Lamarly, YC. He gestured toward a chair by the fire, pulling his own up to it. The lace on his robes flapped. He shook off the full dress, handed it over to a clerk who slipped out the door and vanished with the scarlet prize. Lyndhurst unfolded spectacles and perched them on his nose. The other bagwig stood by, rustling papers. Fusimp quest, all clear up, eh? He gave Christian a glance, between hope and embarrassment, and cleared his throat. A bagwig handed him. Some papers. He spent a moment making faces at the sheets in his lap. Without looking up, he said, Stay name, Sir Eiffel. Christian closed his hands around the arms of his chair. The fire popped. He could feel his heart beating hard. Lyndhurst looked up. Name? Christian Richard Nicholas Francis Langland. He could not say it. He felt a surge of renewed terror. The words would not come out. His breathing began to deepen. He stared at Lyndhurst, trying to turn an exhalation into a sound. One of the bagwigs said something, but it was a meaningless string of syllables to Christian. They put a parchment book in his lap, gave him a pen. He set the pen to the sheet. Nothing happened. He laid it down, then picked it up with his left hand. He tried to think of the letters, their shape, how to begin them. He looked up at Lyndhurst and found the man leaning forward, a troubled frown on his face. 
Can't I name? Christian pressed his head back against the chair. The ape, that place. They would lock him there again. Frenzy sent the words farther away yet, scattering them beyond reach, beyond hope. The bagwigs watched him solemnly. His last time to speak. In the House of Lords, he'd stood up to argue education, mechanical societies, science. He remembered Lyndhurst then, writing notes and whispering asides, regulatory business. And now, like distant relatives at a deathbed, the Lord Chancellor and his minions peered at the Duke of Jervalx, proper, uneasy, fascinated. He was one of them, dressed like them, had sat in the Lords with Lyndhurst, and this had happened to him. Lyndhurst pulled his lip leaning on his chair. He shook his head, made a notation on a paper. Mortification seared Christian. He looked down at the notebook in his lap and wrote the algebraic expression of the distance between two points with respect to an orthogonal axis. What ties? Lyndhurst peered at the notebook, reaching to turn it without taking it from Christian's lap. The same square-faced bagwig leaned over and murmured in his ear. Ah. Lindhurst nodded, pushing his glasses up his nose. He looked at Christian. Rye on twenty force? Twenty? They all watched the notebook expectantly. Christian deduced that he was to write. This time, his hand obeyed him. He transcribed the numeral twenty in his notebook. One two twenty, if please. With more assurance, Christian wrote one thousand two hundred and twenty. Lindhurst sighed and pulled his lip again. Christian's momentary confidence evaporated. He hadn't done it right, that was obvious. He could taste the terror rise up in him again, feeling himself failing. The other bagwig spoke, and Lyndhurst nodded absently. The door opened. A clerk escorted Christian's mother into the room. Christian rose. She didn't even look at him. She just... paused at the door. When the bagwig touched her arm, she turned and left the room. The door closed. Christian stood a moment, nonplussed. He sat down. No laid? Anger rose in him. Just a game. It was a game to them, petty sport to baffle him. Hose. What? Name? Lindhurst prodded. He closed his eyes. He worked at it. It wouldn't come. Nothing came. Dunno? Nothing. Christian stared at Lindhurst, breathing fiercely through his teeth. One of the bagwigs took an unlit candlestick from the mantel, placing it on the table at Christian's side. The man handed him a paper twisted into a candlelighter. Taper to candle. Paper and flame. But his hands seemed to have nothing to do with one another. Lindhurst leaned over and took the twist of paper. He held it to the coals until it began to smoke. A thin flame appeared. He inverted the taper and offered it to Christian. Christian accepted it carefully. He gazed at the blue and yellow flame, the white stream of smoke that curled from the tip. Someone spoke sharply. The bagwig leaned over and blew. Out the paper twist with a quick huff. Christian frowned. They had to give him time. They didn't give him time enough. The expression on the bagwig's face infuriated him. He closed his eyes and groped for the candlestick, caught it in his hand. He held the half-burned lighter in his other. He was determined to show that he could do it. He tried. He looked at the candle lighter, held it to the candle, turned his head to see better. His right hand reversed the candle. His left hand ground the smoking taper into the wax. Little flakes of black soot scattered over the notebook and his breeches, but that wasn't right. He turned the candlestick over and pressed the taper to it again. The paper twist crumpled in his hands and fell to the floor. Christian gazed at it in despair. Lindhurst muttered to himself, writing. The clerk gently pried the inverted candlestick from Christian's grip. Then he collected a sheaf of banknotes and a handful of coins from the table, gave them to the Lord Chancellor. Lindhurst reached out, spreading the money across the notebook in Christian's lap. 
to Simmies. Christian picked up a pound note. He looked at Lyndhurst. The Lord Chancellor looked back kindly, sympathetically, and in that patient pity Christian read his fate. He crushed the banknote. He came to his feet, hurling the notebook into the fire. Coins cascaded, ringing against the hearth. No, 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 no. That was all he could do, that one futile word, over and over. No, 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 no. He felt like a cornered beast, all their startled eyes on him. Lunatic, lunatic, back to the mad place and chains. Back to die. Or worse, to live. Lunatic, oh God. A sworn and signed madman. Lunatic. They called Maddie and cousin Edward to calm him. She went with her heart in her throat, expecting a shambles. All she found was Jervalks beside an overturned chair with the barristers and the Lord Chancellor himself looking harassed. Jervalk saw Matty. He lifted his hands and dropped them, making a sound of grief. Cousin Edward went to the chair and set it upright. There now, he said calmly. You won't force us to resort to the gauntlets, will you, Master Christian? Not in front of her grace and Miss Timms. Jervalks hit him. Cousin Edward went down in a mill of arms, falling back against the chair as the barristers lunged for Jervalks before he made it past them. For a moment confusion reigned, shouts and the scrape of wood, then Larkin was there, backhanding the duke with a fist that sent him sprawling against the table, the two lawyers still clinging to his arms. Papers flew, sliding in massive sheaths and bundles to the floor. Larkin flung himself on top of the duke, his blunt hands at Jervalks's throat. The struggle ceased. Jervalks dropped his head back against the table, panting. He closed his eyes and turned his face from the rest of them. Larkin slowly pushed himself away, flipping a big India. Rubber ring against his palm before he shoved it in his pocket. The barristers had both lost their wigs. They looked flushed and awkward, chagrined when Larkin said, Stand him up and let him go, sirs. He'll not fight any longer. They pulled him upright. Jervalks hardly seemed aware of the grip on his arms. He stood braced against the table, his head down, making no attempt to move when they released him. His fine coat had ripped at the shoulder seam, showing white linen beneath. Cousin Edward moved forward with the leather gauntlets, slipping them on and securing the laces with the efficiency of long practice. His lip was bleeding but Jervalks, who'd taken a far harder blow from Larkin, had no mark on him. What is this? Lady de Marley's voice cut ice through the air. The Lord Chancellor looked up from examining his cracked spectacles. My lady. Behind her, the Dowager Duchess and the rest crowded about the door, nudging themselves into Lady de Marley's wake. Maddie found herself edged into a corner as one of the husbands pushed his way past her, begging her pardon without much conviction. Jervalk stood with his arms bound, staring at the floor. The rip at his shoulder gaped with the awkward angle forced on his arms by the gauntlets. The Lord Chancellor glanced around at the family crowding in. Well, he said, quite dry and little annoyed. As it falls out that you're all here. Let me tell you my decision in the matter of the petition for a writ de idiota inquirendo in the case of His Grace Christian Langland, the Duke of Jervalks. Lady de Marley thumped her stick in an ominous way. Lyndhurst, she began imperiously. My lady, the Lord Chancellor's voice had a warning note within it. Allow me. He seated himself in a large chair next to the fire, waving Lady de Marley into the one that had been replaced across from him. He held out his hand in expectation. The clerk hurried to retrieve a scatter of papers from near his feet. The Lord Chancellor took them, rearranged them, holding his damaged spectacles to his nose without putting them on. I have examined the Duke with a view to his ability to mind his business. I find that he cannot give his name, nor write it. He cannot count from one to twenty. He does not appear to recognize his mother. He had no sensible response upon being given a candle to light. 
When asked to tell a sum of money, he threw it into the fire. These are, his voice rose as Lady de Marley attempted to interrupt. These are the customary criteria we apply to determine compass mentis, my lady. Lady de Marley had been leaning forward. She met the Lord Chancellor's look and sank back in her chair, her chin lifted. Your lordship, he is the Duke of Jervalx. She gave the Lord Chancellor a glare that would have shriveled stone. The Duke of Jervalx. They were like two elders locked in silent conflict, too. Massive wills. Everyone and everything else was eerily still, but for the fire rumbling quietly between Lady de Marley and the Lord Chancellor. Such a commonplace sound, while Jervalx never moved nor lifted his head. The Lord Chancellor rustled his papers. He cleared his throat. On behalf of Her Grace the Dowager Duchess of Jervalx, we have Lord Tilgate, Lord Stoneham, Mr. Manning, Mr. Perceval, jointly and severally, etc., etc., petition the court, etc., writ de idiota inquirendo, yes, I thought I was not mistaken. He glanced toward their counselor. Mr. Temple, there has been an error in the documents. This should not have been submitted as the idiota, but as the lenatico, as I have satisfied myself from my examination of the duke. He swept his audience with a dispassionate look. It is perfectly clear to me that this is a case of mental derangement rather than idiocy. If your party should wish to correct the petition and resubmit Mr. Temple, I will of course take up the question again at a later date. Maddy could not understand why Lady de Marley was so jubilant. She appeared to view the postponement as an entire victory, and indeed, the vehement low voice complaints of the brothers-in-law revealed their dissatisfaction. As Lady de Marley made her slow and thumping way down the hall and outside to the waiting carriages, Maddie overheard one of the husbands mutter, Good God, man, another half-year? His voice rose a little as he caught the barrister's arm. The estate'll be a shambles. The others hushed him. Maddie walked past them in the hall. His sisters and brothers-in-law looked behind her, edged aside putting their backs to the wall. Maddie paused at the head of the stairs. Between Cousin Edward and Larkin, Jervalx walked down the row of spectators, bound, as if he were a criminal led to execution. He gave no sign that he even knew anyone else was nearby. He only seemed to watch the hems of his sister's dresses as he passed. Not until he reached Maddie did he raise his eyes, and she saw then that he had gone away. Nothing was there, no sorrow, no anger, no recognition. He'd said that he would die if they sent him back. Maddie thought that he had already. She almost reached out to touch him, but, no. No. It was better this way. Better not to bring him back, not to make him feel this moment. The family closed ranks in the hall behind him, murmuring among themselves. Maddie lifted her skirt, turning away from him leading the way down the stairs. In a chair drawn close to the fire as always, Lady de Marley seated herself in her private boudoir, surrounded by furniture and black oriental lacquer. Every possible inch of space was covered with blue and white porcelain bottles, tiny and large, some simple, some painted with grotesque dragons and mythical beasts. She took a long draft of smelling salts from one of the bottles, then opened her eyes and curled the phial in her hand. Miss Timms. She fixed her look on Maddie. It is imperative that he comprehend what I have to say. That is why you are here. I understand. Ill-bred shit. You answer me. My lady, when I speak to you, it is not our principle, Maddie said calmly. Lady de Marley lifted her brows. I dare say. She appeared content with this caustic remark and turned her attention to the duke. He stood bound in the gauntlets, watching them both like a dark outlaw enchained. Lady de Marley took another deep breath of her salts, then waved the file. Remove those bonds, she said, as if the very word offended her. Maddie was happy to do so. Jervalks held still as she unlaced them. 
Released, he moved his fists apart, spread his fingers, looking down at his hands one by one. Then he lifted his head and nodded once to Maddie, terse thanks. Lady de Marley thumped her stick for attention. You, boy, do you know what's happened today? Slowly, Maddie advised. The old lady made an annoyed grimace. Jervox. He looked at her. Hear me, she said. You failed today. Failed. His jaw worked. He began to breathe faster, making the effort to speak. To Maddie's relief, Lady de Marley waited without interrupting him. Vesta! He burst out fiercely. Don't back. God! If. Love. If. He reached and grabbed Maddie's arm, pushing her toward his aunt. He held her in front of him. Say. Maddie felt his fingers drive into her arms. He gave her a little shake, made a growl in his throat. Say, he insisted. He doesn't wish to return to Blythedale, Lady de Marley, she said. I believe that is what he wants me to tell thee. Indeed. She didn't even look at Maddie, only at the duke behind her. Jervolks expelled a groan pushing Matty from him. He strode to the end of the room. Kill now? He turned on them, gripping the fretted rails of an ebony Chinese chair. Nod back. Lady de Marley regarded him, nodding faintly. Back you go, however. Your mother wills it, she said, with a calm cruelty that forced Matty into speech. Perhaps thou might consider, Miss Timms. Lady de Marley snapped. Maddie fell silent. Miss Timms, you did not mention that he was capable of intelligent speech. Lady de Marley had a way of making one feel guilty even for improvement. He's sometimes spoken, Maddie said, but not often. How often? In what circumstances? I think, when he's angry. When he wants something very much. When it is, she hesitated when it is important to him. I see. Lady de Marley wrapped both her hands around the knob of her walking stick. She leaned her head against the chair and closed her eyes. Jervolks, the old lady said. You will go back. Do you? Understand? He held the chair. Back? Just that word, one agonized word. Yes. Lady de Marley opened her eyes. She thumped her stick. Unless you do as I say. She set the stick and pushed herself to her feet. The duke didn't move as she walked toward him, each half-step a stiff rustle of silk. She stopped, leaning hard on her support. They looked at one another with the ebony chair between them. Not back, Jervalks. Not back if— She glared up into the duke's eyes. If you consent. His face was dark with emotion and wariness. Con. Sent. Consent to marry. He turned his head slightly. Maddie could see the hesitation. Mary, Lady de Marley repeated, clear and plain. Mary, secure the title, and you do not go back. I'll see to it. Comprehension washed into his face. Comprehension in affront, an instant of aristocratic arrogance, pure duke, amazed offense at this interference, and then the further realization, full grasp of what she offered. He let go of the chair. Yes, he ejaculated. Anything that one syllable said. Anything not to go back. Chapter 14 I will Matty read again. The duke's fingers tightened around the hand grip of a heavy seal. It formed another stamp in the desk blotter as he pressed down in his effort to speak. All day she'd been locked with him in the library, reciting from the marriage ceremony in the Book of Common Prayer. He never looked at the endless phoenix crests he was making in the paper. He never took his eyes from her. WMMM mail, he managed. I will, she corrected. He stared at her across the desk. Concentration froze all humanity from his face. He was ice and darkness, 
his eyes the depth of blue winter. No sound came. Maddie looked down at the book again. She referred once more to Lady de Marley's note of the proper names to insert, though she had them memorized long since. I, Christian Richard Nicholas Francis Langland, Christian Richard, he said. Christian Richard, N.N. Kloss. He swallowed, clenching his teeth. Fra. Lang. Take thee. Teach in an N.H., he said, half a groan. She went on as if he'd succeeded, though it had begun to appear that he never would. Lady de Marley had set them to this task just after breakfast, and now, after dinner and tea time, Maddie was near despairing of it. She moistened her lips, exhaling softly, and read again. A tired sing-song crept into her voice. Take thee and rose, take thee and rose. He managed that quite clearly. The sudden fluency made Maddie glance up. Surprise caught them both. The duke looked as startled at his success as she. Maddie broke into a smile. There! He grinned, flushing with achievement. Take thee and rose, he repeated, nodding on each stress. Take thee and rose Bernice Trotman. His smile faded. He frowned and shook his head. Take thee and rose, Bernice Trotman. Take thee and rose Bexness Trotman. Yes. She leaned forward. I, he interrupted her, taking up a nodding rhythm. Christian Richard Nicholas Langland. Christian Richard Nicholas Langland. I, Christian Richard Nicholas Langland. He shoved back the chair, flung himself out of it. I, Christian Richard Nicholas Langland. Langland. Christian. I, Christian Richard Nicholas Francis Langland. Langland. He gave a harsh, victorious laugh. He grabbed the seal, pounding it down on the blotter with each word. I, Christian Richard Nicholas Francis Langland. His violent excitement frightened her a little. Maddie closed the book. Perhaps that would be a good place to stop for the day. No. He came around the desk, took the book from her hand and flattened it open on the table. Maddie girl. Take thee and rose Bernice Trotman. She hesitated. He caught her hand, squeezed it, working it painfully in his. Maddie nodded. He let her go. She leaned over the priest's book. To my wedded wife. That seemed harder to fit to the lilt. She had to force it into an unnatural beat. To my wedded wife. To my wed wife. She thought that must be near enough. To have and to hold to have and hold. From this day forward, for better for worse, for richer for poorer, in sickness and in health, whatever else might be said of the Church of England's wedding vows, and the Society of Friends had nothing but ill to impart, the lines lent themselves to this simple, heavy cadence that he could repeat. He was far from perfect, slurring over syllables that didn't quite fit into the rhythm, but the improvement made him joyous. He paced the room, nodding in tempo, insisting that she read the lines over and over as he repeated them. Finally he came and stood behind her, his hands on her shoulders, reciting the whole passage himself. I will. I, Christian Richard Nicholas Francis Langland, take thee and Rose Bernice Trotman to my wed wife to have to hold from this day for for bet for worse in sick and health to love to shares, till death do part. His fingers worked in time, according to God's holy ord. And there, I plight thee my troth. Ha! He squeezed her, obviously proud of himself for getting through the difficult last lines. Maddie turned her head to the side, unable to see him for her bonnet. She didn't try, not really. Her bonnet was there, reality and protection, buffer against a man's elation, his beautiful grin and dark midnight eyes. He was of the world. He would be married by a priest to a child of the world. He would be married, and he would not go back to Blydale Hall. With a quick move, she shut the book. 
she stood up, breaking free of his touch. I shall tell Lady de Marley then, thou art able to say thy lines. She was called into Lady de Marley's presence directly. The lady ate her supper in bed from a lap tray, enthroned beneath exotic birds and oriental figures in the Chinese room. Maddie stood with her hands clasped. So you believe that he's capable? Lady de Marley demanded, between a bite of toast and a sip of tea. He will perhaps be better with more work. Six months, Miss Timms? Six months, that is what. Lyndhurst gave us. And we may not count upon that, although. Counsel advises me that it would be surprising if the corrected petition should proceed any faster than the original. She dropped her teaspoon on the tray with a careless clatter. We can't wait upon improvement. Best to have the thing done and get the girl with child. I want no questions of legitimacy. You understand the urgency of this matter? His marriage, dost thou mean? His heir, girl. He's got no heir. He ought to have done years ago, like any reasonable man. But what must his witless mother do but pester him every living minute of his life to reform and marry, with the natural result that wild horses could not drag him to the altar? He flouts her every way he can. Not that I blame him for it, but only a selfish blockhead with illusions of immortality would have left the title unsecured. Which, as I've made no bones to tell him, is precisely what he is. And now, her voice went to an unexpected quaver. She stopped speaking. Her age seemed to descend on her suddenly, leaving her vulnerable, fumbling for her teacup, taking a long trembling sip. The cup rattled when she set it down. She stared at nothing for a moment, then made a ripe snort. Well, at any rate, now that he is, what he's become, she continued, with a brittle precision that gained strength as she spoke, as if by saying the thing out loud she brought it under her dominion. We must retrieve what we can. The dukedom reverts to the crown without legitimate male issue. That is what lies at stake here, my fine miss. He's got no heir. An idiot can't marry, can he? Nor a man judged out of his mind. If we cannot get him what before he's declared incompetent, it is lost. Maddie was silent, and a little shocked. She didn't think that Lady de Marley would admire a speech on the vanity of worldly institutions such as dukedoms, but to force her nephew to. Mary for one, to blackmail him into it with the threat of Blydale, it seemed iniquitous. But and Trotman? Maddie asked diffidently. She is wishful to marry him? He is the Duke of Jervalk's girl. Even though, Lady de Marley rattled her cup on the tray quite loudly. Her father and I have arrived at a satisfactory arrangement a month since. The family are gentry. They have an ancient connection to the Dukes of Rutland but no direct claim to hereditary honors. Mr. Trotman has just been returned MP for some petty borough in Huntingdonshire. The girl's marriage portion is a scant ten thousand pounds, against what I think you must agree is a generous jointure of fifty-two hundred annual for the duke's wife. I believe Miss Trotman may consider herself a most amazingly fortunate young lady. She does not know. Lady de Marley became interested in her toast slicing a portion with exactitude. She is aware that he has been ill. Her parents and I have not judged it useful to tax her with the details. Young minds are inclined to overactive imagination. Lady de Marley, it cannot be a true marriage before God. You are impertinent. I am plain spoken. Rude and common. A true marriage before God. A ceremony in the Church of England, how much more before. God would you wish? Nonsense, girl. What low-bred notions will you prate of next? Bundling? Shall they court in bed, as the country servants do? Hop over a broomstick for their vows. A true marriage indeed. You know nothing of it. I know that no truth can be based upon pride of place and falsehood. Lady de Marley threw down her silver knife. Insolent jade. Do you call me a liar? 
Maddie took a stubborn breath. Thou knowest thine own heart. And you would do well to remember it, girl. Enough of your dissenter babble. He is the duke. She will be his duchess. I don't know what objection there can be to that. I can see only one question, and that is tainted blood, but there's been no case of madness or imbecility in his pedigree for centuries, setting aside his silly goose of a mother. You may believe that I have looked into it. And Mr. Trotman will have too, if he is a man of any sense. Maddie felt distressed. She will not have him, when she discovers it. She will humiliate him. That she will not, Lady de Marley said crisply. Miss Timms, I will allow that you are a generous-hearted girl. Let me be as plain as you. Naturally you are not accustomed to our ways. Miss Trotman will be a peeress. She will have her own house, this house. Her own staff, access to the greatest in the land, wealth beyond her ability to exhaust. By this alliance, her father's political career, nay, her entire family's future, is assured. For all this, she need have no more to do with him than her duty. Her parents understand this, as well they might. Whatever her immediate feelings, I am assured that Miss Trotman, on reflection, can be brought to see the advantages of the match. And the Duke? The Duke will no longer be your affair. But if there should be an heir? She might wish to see him sent away then. You strain my patience, Miss Timms. Why think you that I chose the girl? She's biddable enough. His brothers-in-law will not preside. Nor his mother. Miss Trotman is well enough. Aware of who has done this for her. Maddie stood silent, still caught in peculiar anxiety for his future. Lady de Marley regarded her. Miss Timms, she said in a quieter tone than she had yet used. He is my brother's last surviving son. He is the last of my family whom I understand. Until you have outlived your husband, your children, and all your generation, you cannot know what that means. If thou loved him, thou wouldst not ever send him back. She lifted her painted brows. Ah, but I did not say to you I loved him. I said that I understood him. He weds miss, or back he goes. I vow it. And so you may assure him. She rested against the pillows. See that he can speak his pledge proper, girl, if you care what becomes of him. Now move this tray so that I can sleep. They were all garnered, the Trotmans, Lady de Marley and the Dowager Duchess, when Maddie entered the drawing room with Jervox. Lady de Marley, without rising from her chair, said, Jervox, Mr. and Mrs. James Trotman. The father, a distinguished, vigorous gentleman with high color in his cheeks, came forward across the carpet instantly. He held out his hand. Jervalks looked at it, looked up in the man's face, and made a slight nod. Trotman's hand dropped. Sir? He responded with a deep formal bow, quickly covering the awkwardness. I'm honored. May I present my wife? He turned slightly. The lady, very fair and small, dropped a curtsy. And this, this is my daughter Anne. With a fatherly gesture he beckoned her. Annie, don't hang back. She's a little shy today. Perhaps you'll forgive her, sir, under the circumstances. Come here, darling, and make yourself known to the Duke. And Trotman obeyed, leaving her mother's side with lowered face. When she reached her father, she glanced up quickly and then looked down again, lowering herself into a deep curtsy. In that brief glimpse, Maddie saw how young she was, as pale now as Lady de Marley, but with the same apples of pink in her cheeks as her father, the flush of fright in a face just a breath too round to be called beautiful, but still quite pretty. Blonde, dressed in apple green with ribbons and ruches of white, she looked a terrified lamb to Jervox's black wolf potency. Maddie watched him survey her, her elaborately dressed hair, her puffed sleeves, her tiny waist. So young, Maddie thought, she could not have seventeen years yet. 
The duke was impassive. He responded to her curtsy with a half-bow of worldly and impeccable politeness. He straightened, still observing her beneath his long lashes. She's a very nice girl, don't you think, Christian? A good devout girl. The dowager duchess floated forward. Mrs. Trotman and her daughter are both active in the church, building society. Lady de Marley groped for her stick and heaved herself to her feet. I believe Mr. Trotman expressed his wish to view the library, she announced. Let us leave the young people to divert themselves. Miss Timms, you will stay. Ring for refreshment. Maddie was glad of this small task, as it gave her something to do. Lady de Marley overcame the dowager duchess' reluctance to leave by insisting that she needed her sister-in-law's arm for support out the door, and the Trotmans filed out in willing subjection. As they passed him, the duke gave them each a nod of recognition, an ironic lift to the corner of his mouth. The door closed. Jervalks turned and walked away to the window. He stood there, gazing out. The girl also stood, her cheeks aflame, gripping her hands together and staring at the floor. Thou would sit? Maddie asked, finding herself hostess. And Trotman peeked at her. She looked quickly toward the duke and away. Yes, she said, barely whispering the word. Maddie arranged two chairs near the fire and placed one for herself a little back. The girl immediately started to take the one at a distance from the others. Please, Maddie said firmly, determined that Jervalks and his betrothed should come to know one another as well as they might before embarking upon an entire life together. Do have this seat. Next the fire. And Trotman reluctantly took the chair Maddie indicated. She sat straight, her face lowered, her hands in two white fists. Maddie looked up at Jervalks, who merely looked back at her with that sarcastic half smile. She frowned at him a little, moving her chin to hint him into the other chair. He lifted his eyebrows and stayed where he was, cool defiance, a complete disavowal of any obligation. Maddie sat down in her place. She had to lean forward a little to see in Trotman's features. I'm Maddie Timms, she said. The girl nodded. She gave Maddie one wild glance and then dropped her eyes to her lap again. Mercifully, the tea tray arrived. For a few moments, that provided distraction as Maddie poured and inquired about milk and sugar. The young lady would not take a plate. I'm afraid I could not eat, she said in a low voice. Maddie prepared a cup and carried it to Jervalks. He leaned against the window draperies, accepting the tea but making no move to drink it. She went back to her chair. The stilted silence lengthened. Maddie rued her lack of art for idle talk. The Duke is fond of mathematics, she said finally. The girl looked at her as if she'd spoken in some language out of darkest Africa. He and my father have developed a new geometry, Maddie continued stubbornly. They received a standing ovation at the Analytical Society. Are you mathematical and Trotman? The girl blinked. Not at all. I can give thee some books on the subject. It ought to be a pleasure for married people to enter into one another's interests, ought it not? I am a gardener myself. What dost thou enjoy to do? And Trotman wet her lips. Go to balls, she said. And... Dance. Although, I haven't been to one. I'm not yet out. Mother said that now I should come out when. She shot a glance toward the Duke and away. Afterward, she lifted her head a little. I shall be presented at court with a satin gown and a train. I shall wear feathers in my hair and diamonds. Maddie rose. She walked halfway to Jervalks, stopped, and said clearly, and Trotman enjoys dancing at balls. He looked up from a deep contemplation of his teacup. Dance, Maddie repeated. And Trotman likes to dance. She likes balls. Jervalks lifted his brows in exaggerated astonishment at this. News 
Maddie returned to the young lady at the fire. The duke has been quite ill. If thou wilt but speak slow and distinct, he can converse with thee. He is mad, isn't he? And Trotman came to vehement life. His sister called yesterday. She told me that he nearly killed a footman. He is not mad. The girl was trembling. She exclaimed beneath her breath. They put him in a madhouse. He was in chains. Isn't that true? Maddie pursed her lips. It is true. And Trotman dropped her cup onto the tray and stood, turning on Maddie. I can see it by your face. She looked beyond to Jervox. It's ghastly. I don't want to converse with him. I don't want him to touch me. Then perhaps thou shouldst not consent to marry him, Maddie said quietly. And Trotman tore her gaze from Jervox. Everyone says that I must. Maddie could not support disobedience, nor argue against the wisdom of the girl's parents. It would be wicked. She could. Only hope that the child would find her own way in the light. I must. I will be a duchess, the girl said. A duchess. Jervalk smiled, a slow sneer. He left the window, walked past Maddie, making a leisurely stalk of entrapment as she backed away, her pink cheeks going to burning ruby against white. Don't! She came up against a gilded table. Don't touch me! Miss Timms! The Duke caught her chin hard between his fingers. He made her look up into his face, held her there as she panted in hysterical dismay. He touched her, spreading his hand at her wide ribbon sash, his fingers strong and dark on white satin. His palm moved upward in a licentious exploration that ignored all the ruche and ruffles that outlined her bosom in flagrant depravity. As she tried to slip sideways, he gripped her arm. He forced himself against her, his whole body a barrier pressed to hers. The girl struggled, gasping. You are indecent, she cried. Let me go. He held her fast in spite of her strain. Touch when? Please. The brutal inflection of his words froze her. She held her breath, staring up at him like a petrified animal. Maddie came to her feet. Jervalx, she said. He let Entrotman go. She scrambled aside, brushing at her silk and ribbons as if she had been dirted. With a wordless, Frantic glance at Maddie, the girl picked up her skirts and fled. The room. The door shut on a resounding boom. And rose beneath Trotwan. His right fist opened and closed rhythmically. He glanced at her beneath dusky lashes. Thou frightened her by intent. Bitch, he said clearly. An ugly smile curled his lips. He reached to the mantel and picked up a china figurine of a young girl. He dropped it on the hearth. Maddie startled at the shatter, then took a step forward to prevent him as he reached for another of the set. The second figure smashed against the stone. He caught up a third, held it suspended in his hand, taunting her. Maddie halted. He dropped the statuette. It burst into fragments that arched and fell at her feet. Mine, he said. Break. He swept a look around the ornate room. Break all. Maddie turned away. Very fine. Thou art the duke. Thou canst break it all. She looked over her shoulder at him. And now she will not wed thee, and thou wilt go back. And rose beneath Trotman, he jeered, and flicked at the fragments with his boot. They will send thee back. Her voice rose with emotion. Back. That caught his attention. He narrowed his eyes. No. No marriage. Back. He scowled. No, Mar. Maddie gestured toward the door where his betrothed had escaped. She will not wed thee now. In a long instant of hesitation, he concentrated on Maddie's face, and then suddenly gave a laugh. No. He shook his head and sprawled in a golden-legged chair. Mad, ghastly, touch. He made a face of revulsion, 
pushed his palm away as Entrapman had done. He laughed again bitterly. Maddie girl. Think won't wed? The Dowager Duchess came to Maddie in the wildly ornate dressing room, just as she had finished her tray of supper. The Duchess asked that they kneel and pray together. In a long discourse, she thanked God for Miss and Trotman, and for Dr. Timms and his assistants Larkin and Miss Timms, who with the permission of kind providence, without which all human aid would fail, had set her son on the path of restoration. Maddie recognized that she was meant to accept this as a personal acknowledgement, which made her feel uncomfortable and subdued. After the final amen, while the Duchess took the single chair in the room, Maddie got up from beside her cot and sat on the edge of it. The Duchess laid her hands together in her lap. Miss. Tims, I've had a long interview with your uncle, and I don't. Scruple to say to you I'm distressed that my son is to be taken from care at Blythdale. I think you must know who is responsible, but we'll say no more of that. I will tell you now, as I told Dr. Tims, that I consider the whole situation an experimental one. Her fingers moved in a restless pulse, as if she were picking out odd notes on a musical instrument. The Duke should be married, there is no question of that. It is the only reason that I allow this plan to go forward. But if there should be the slightest recurrence of ungovernability, then Dr. Timms believes, as I do, that my son should be returned to the asylum. I speak of this to you because it is intended that you will stay with us through the wedding, perhaps even a little after. I believe that Miss Trotman has asked that you not be let go until she is consulted, which I think we can agree is quite wise of her. She seems a steady girl for her age, a good Christian girl. Of course, I had never thought, my son's bride. She pressed her lips together. Her background isn't what anyone could have envisioned, but we must count ourselves fortunate in her, considering the situation. Miss Timms, I cannot tell you how many nights I've prayed that he would see the error of his ways. I cannot tell. You. She lost her voice. Maddie sat quietly. The Duchess lowered her face, with silent tears slipping down her cheeks. She stood up abruptly and went to the hallway door. His aunt, she said, facing away from Maddie. Lady de Marley thinks only of the title, but I know in my heart that it is too soon. He should return. I really think that he will. Blythdale offers the best of moral treatment. He should be in your care there. Perhaps, under Dr. Tim's supervision, he might visit his wife when it is appropriate. She held the doorknob and looked back. That would be better for everyone. Lady de Marley has promised him differently, Maddie said. Well, the Dowager Duchess said, we shall see. We shall see. You are to keep me informed of his state of mind, Miss Timms. Lady de Marley has her whims, but I am his mother. I understand his welfare better than anyone. I feel quite certain that I can bring Miss Trotman to agree with me after they are married. It will be her decision then. Even Lady de Marley must admit that. And Miss Trotman is such a good steady girl. Christian stood and let himself be dressed for his wedding, his court suit, deep brown velvet, silver buttons, a waistcoat long and trimmed with heavy pattern. Breeches, cutaway embroidered tails, and over it all, the blue garter ribbon and silver starburst of the order pinned across his chest. Feudal, unremittingly antiquated, right down to the diamond shoe buckles. Maddie had been wrong. The girl wanted to be a duchess too badly to bolt. Mad ghastly lunatic. Commission mad, tried and hung, he? Was theirs now. He had no existence. Strip naked strangle. Castrate, powerless, dead, but he couldn't think of that. The outrage still burned him, scorched heat and shame in his skin. Didn't want him to touch her, did she? When she was just the sort of silly green giggle calf he most despised, all dress flounce airs, no wit, primed to dance at balls and swoon on cue. She was his fate, and always had been. He understood his aunt. It was a family matter, cold-blooded business that went beyond Christian's personal inclinations. It was duty, 
rock hard and unforgiving, seven hundred years of the unbroken name of Langland. Beyond that, it was Jervalk's castle in the hands of strangers. It was the mad place, losing himself, the cradle and the straitjacket and the chains. He thought it through, thought about it all night and the night before that, lying in his father's and grandfather's bed. Mary breathed air, his own blood at Jervalk's. He wasn't accustomed to looking at himself in that way. He'd always left it to the women in his family, obsessed as they had always seemed with the notion. Mate with a bought mare. He envisioned betting Miss Trotman, realized the horse pun in her name. His mouth curled, vicious humor to contain the ferocity he felt. Good reason to be afraid, trot calf duchess. Good reason to snivel. He would bed her, get a son. God would remember him that far, surely and go home to Jervalks with the boy. She could stay in town and dance her feet off, play duchess till she died. And Maddie. Maddie girl he would take. He couldn't live without Maddie. Jewels, kittens, kisses, whatever he had to give her. Quaker thee thou, she wouldn't like to be a mistress. He didn't like it himself, but it was crucial. It was necessary and he would not take her virtue without giving back anything, everything she wanted. They could live at Jervalk's with him, she and her father and his heir. And Christian thought, with a kind of bewilderment, that it would be all right. It would be a sufficient life. Different, utterly, from what he'd anticipated, existing by halves, as he was half of himself, but the best he could conceive now. He tried to think of his wedding lines and couldn't find the start. But that was all right, too. When he heard them, he could do it. The valet began to brush his coat. Christian looked at himself in the mirror. He looked like a half-man there, too, not real on the right side. It made him uneasy, and he looked away. Duke. Duchess. He didn't want her. He hardly knew her well enough to hate her but he imagined that the day would shortly come when he would. He knew a hundred men who did anything to avoid going home to their wives. His valet smoothed his shoulder seams and laid down the brush. Christian found himself made ready to become number. 101 Chapter 15 The church echoed, almost empty, the windows stark and dim with a cold morning fog. Christian had attended all of his sister's weddings. Fashionably private as they had been, this was so small as to be furtive, in a parish chapel he never entered before, only his mother and aunt in front, a small scatter of Trotmans, the blood man, the ape, and Mattie, her face as sober as her plain gray dress and black cloak, in a box pew farther back. In the hush, Mr. Trotman escorted his daughter to the Spartan altar, both of them breathing frost in the shadowy air. Except for the frost and the red spots in her cheeks, the bride looked as inhumanly polished as a stone effigy. She arrived at Christian's side, all in pale silk, her train hissing behind her. She didn't look at him. The curate began to speak. Christian took a deep breath, turning his head to watch the man read. He was lost immediately, unable to find a place in the quick. Flow of Syllables he clenched his hand. The clergyman paused, looking up beyond Christian and Miss Trotman to the tiny congregation. He waited an instant, and then began to read again, glancing first at Christian, then the bride. Christian thought it must be the part about impediments and the dreadful day of judgment. He had nothing to say here, but his first moment was coming rapidly. The air in front of his face grew white with his breath. He tried to control it, swallowing, concentrating, forcing his hand to open, then finding it ground into a fist again. The priest looked at him. Christian heard his name, but too fast, it went too fast. The sounds slid by like foreign babble and ended on an upward questioning note. The church held an expectant lull. I will. Christian knew exactly what he was to say. He'd said it a hundred times for Maddie. He envisioned her head nodding in time to the cadence. He breathed deeper and faster, trying for it. Silence. Nothing. 
The curate kept looking at him. Miss Trotman stared straight ahead. Christian opened his fist. He knew the words. He couldn't speak. 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 His fist went hard with the effort. He felt himself growing dizzy. Jervalx. His aunt's voice reverberated against brick and carved wood, empty dead glass windows. Vaudu or Turnblythal. The mad place. Strip chains animal no. No, 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 no. Christian didn't look at her. He kept his eyes on the clergyman. Her resounding voice died away. She wouldn't do it. She couldn't send him away to that place again. He didn't believe her. It was a mistake. He was trying and she thought he was defying her. I will, I will. I can't no words not back, oh God. He struggled. Silence, silence, no word silence. He couldn't produce sound sentence words scream nothing, as unreal as the half-man in the mirror, impotent. Miss Trotman ran her tongue round her lips, not moving more than that. Unstand, Jervalks? The high, peak ceiling amplified his aunt's vehemence. Unstand back, Blythal? He turned his head. She was on her feet. From where he stood, he could see her shaking with rage. Bythal, she said. The word echoed and echoed. Back mad 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 mad. Miss Trotman was a monument, like the stone busts and memorials, a walking dead. The curate lifted his book, said Christian's name again, and read. He came to the question a second time, keep on her long bothlev? Christian tried to respond. He would not go back but he couldn't form the words. He felt nauseated with the intensity of the effort. In dumb extremity he turned round, searching for. Maddie. She sat still, stark and fixed in her prim bonnet and cloak, not answering when he gazed at her, pleading with her to help him, to say it properly, to give him the heavy unmusical tempo he could control. Tack thus, his aunt snapped moving laboriously out of the pew. His mother rose. The clergyman cleared his throat and closed his book. Christian saw the ape, ludicrous in a rented coat, stand and come striding up the aisle. Christian moved. He left Miss Trotman, walking toward the keeper. His mother and aunt were coming into the aisle. Behind the ape. Christian went as if to them, brushed past the keeper, the blood man, Calm, calm, no excuse to hold him, stop him, reach his aunt, almost to the she-dragon, and instead he turned into the box pew where Maddie stood. He took her arm, pushed her lightly, urging her out. He didn't give the ape a reason. He headed for the vestry where he'd been before the ceremony, keeping Maddie on his arm, holding her hand there by force. The others followed. Their voices resounded in the church, a little high-pitched but not urgent. He let Maddie Girl pass in front of him through the vestry door. He closed it behind him. There was no key. Christian shot the bolt. Maddie exclaimed as he yanked her with him past the rows of hanging vestments. The side door was locked, this one a mortise, but the key hung from a red ribbon directly beside the frame. He caught up the ornate brass, but his right hand was too clumsy. The keyhole seemed hard to see. He let go of Maddie to use his left hand and then could not make the transfer from one hand to the other. The door behind them rattled. A man's voice called out. Maddie turned toward it. The bolt rattled again, and then pounding began. Christian dropped the key trying to get it into the lock. He made a sound of anguish, retrieving it, pulling back her cloak and pushing the key into her hand. Only a minute, maybe two, before they reckoned what he was about and came around the outside to stop him. He seized her hand, compelling it toward the lock. No, she cried. Can't. He held her wrist in both of his hands, pressed it up against the door. She made a sob of frustration. Still Christian held her there, halfway to tears himself, not even able to say her name to beg and plead and grovel for the one trivial move the small petty commonplace act, a key in a lock and his whole life balanced on it. He would have gone down on his knees to induce her, but he had no time. 
he threw his shoulder against the door. The wood crashed on the frame. He smashed himself against it again, battering on a thick solid barrier, ignoring the punishment to his arm and ribs, working for freedom. Maddie cried out, tugging at him, but he defied that too. The door boomed under his assault. The shouts from beyond the other entrance ceased, and he knew he had only seconds now. Maddie kept calling at him, but he could barely hear her above the thunder of the wood. She caught his arm desperately. Wait! Her frantic words finally came clear in his brain. Wait, Thamus, wait! She was pushing at him, struggling to reach the lock. Christian stayed pressed to the door, watching her hands. She had the key inserted and turned in an instant. He grabbed the handle and shoved it open. Down into the tiny side yard. He took Maddie, pulled her so hard that she fell down the steps against him. At the foot, he met a gate and shattered it at the lock with one kick. Maddie had ceased speaking or trying to pull away. As he pushed through the gate, she came after, her head down except. For one brief glance at him. Christian shoved the gate closed and turned to the old burying ground. Slipping on long grass, Maddie followed him. A single shout of pursuit hung thin and strange in the vapor, then there was nothing but mist and the graves. The Duke was a dark figure in the freezing fog, a ghost from another century in his long-tailed velvet wedding clothes, human only when he looked back to see that she was there. He moved fast, as if he knew his way. She stumbled over a half-buried gravestone trying to keep up. An extravagantly untamed rose bush, all thorns and silvery dying leaves, caught her skirt. She stopped to pull it free and tangled her cloak in it too. He came back and yanked at the fabric himself, oblivious to the rip. He caught her arm then, keeping her beside him as he wound between the headstones. Her hem flapped heavily. Her feet were soaked with cold dew by the time a wall loomed out of the fog. He turned and walked along it, dodging ancient graves. Ducking around one big monument where angels with broken and chipped wingtips gazed down on mossy epitaphs. Maddie could hear traffic beyond the wall, street vendors in the city, a weird contrast to the dank silhouettes and wet stones in the burial place. Another forbidding priestly custom, marking graves and setting monuments, she far preferred the friend's clean and open ground where no spirits seemed to linger. Jervox brought them to a corner. He walked right into it, beating back the wet branches of an overgrown tree, revealing a stone coffin and a fresh clearing. He stepped up onto it, crushing leaves beneath his feet, and held out his hand to Maddie. This was a boy's trick, that much she recognized. He knew the place, retained some map of childhood mischief through the fog and weedy grass. When she had climbed up onto the gravestone, he hauled himself atop the wall, straddling it, unmindful of the embroidery on his coattails or the heavy medallion that hung from the sash across his chest. He offered his arm to support her. Maddie wavered, looked back. He made an impatient noise, reaching for her. Foliage clashed and rustled somewhere in the graveyard far behind. Cousin Edward called, but if it was distant or near, she couldn't tell. The Duke's hand closed on her cloak, her arm, a painful coercion as he dragged her up. In a wild and undignified scramble, she made it astride the top. She perched there, the Bricks scraping rough on her legs, pulling at her stockings. Her bonnet had come askew, giving her only a glimpse of how far down it was to the alley on the other side. She tried to settle the headpiece back into some semblance of order and keep her ankles under her skirt. Jervolks leaned over and untied the string beneath her chin. He tossed the bonnet back into the burying ground, where the ties caught high up on a broken tree branch. He grinned. For a terrible reckless moment, she was certain that he was going to kiss her, plain peculiar Archimedia Tims, here atop this wall, with Larkin and Cousin Edward in pursuit, with her skirt up to her waist, with people in view in the street at the end of the narrow alley. He didn't. He hiked his leg over and dropped to the pavement. Maddie bit her lip as he lifted his arms for her. 
She hardly knew what she was doing. It had all happened too quickly to think, and here she was like some wild coal seller's daughter, with the duke reaching for her to take her down to an alley that smelled of chamber pots and puddles. Go, she whispered. Go. I won't let them find thee. He pulled at her skirt, stretched up and yanked her hand, hauling her off balance. She fought and toppled, biting a shriek to a whimper as the bricks scratched raw across her palms and thighs. He caught her, his chin connecting sharply with her. Temple in the force of her drop. Maddie stumbled and they went. Down together, Jervalk's falling back against the building, exhaling a hard grunt, his shoulder a cushion between her forehead and the unforgiving wall. She pushed herself upright to her knees her palms on his coat. He did kiss her then, sitting in the dank alley, a short, painful grind of his mouth on hers, holding her to him with his hand behind her head. Maddie broke away. She stood up. Her dress was in shambles, her bonnet gone, her hair half down and her hands bleeding, and he was smiling at her, which brought her near to weeping. He rose, brushing down one side of his coat ignoring the damp leaves that clung to the other. With one hand, he attempted to unpin the silver starburst on his sash, then gave it up with an annoyed mutter. He looked slipshod, like one of those noblemen who wove their way home at dawn, singing, while good modest people swept their front steps and carried out the ashes. What now? She couldn't keep the quaver from her voice. Go where? He put his hand up to her hair pushing ineffectually at the part that hung untidy. Maddie gave a huff and caught up the fallen braid, searching out the loose pin and coiling it all back into place as well as she could. As she worked, he dusted at her skirt, walking around her and plucking leaves from her cloak as well. The water stains and rip were beyond help, her best steel. Gray, and she was going to be rebuked, possibly punished, probably cast out of friends and sent to prison for abducting the Duke of Jervalx. Maddie didn't know what to do with him. She couldn't take him back. It was impossible to let them send him to Blydale again, immoral to see him forced into marriage for his title. Clearly it wasn't God's will that he wed in Trotman, the words had been there before, but when the time had come Jervalx couldn't say them, a more obvious truth than that Maddie couldn't imagine but what measure she ought to follow at the present moment was beyond her power to divine. The duke simply took her arm on his, appropriating the decision. With an autocratic determination, he drew her with him, walking out of the alley and into the street. Lacking her bonnet, Maddie pulled her hood up over her bare head and still felt baldly conspicuous with Jervalx on the open curb. She didn't recognize the street, never having ventured into Mayfair. The buildings stretched both ways into the fog, not as elegant as Jervalk's house or the new homes in Belgrave Square but still far above anything Maddie had ever been accustomed to. The scent of roasting apples drifted on the mist, their vendor only a disembodied voice, a woman's musical cry. Her call was lost in the echo of horses' hooves as two carriages came down the street with liveried servants on the box and up behind. The coaches passed on. Another vehicle came out of the fog, the single lame cab horse clopping forlornly toward them. Along the cobbles, shouts began to resonate from the unseen. Corner in the direction of the church. Jervalx turned his head, his fingers going tight on her arm. He stepped into the street in the path of the hackney. The horse threw up its head. Ho there! The driver cried, jerking the reins as if the poor animal had not already halted of its own accord. Mind your lady, fine sir. The man looked over his shoulder at the commotion in the fog behind and then back at Maddie and Jervalx. Can I carry em lord and my lady? He inquired, without much expectation. Fast as lightning, comfortable too. He looked rather startled when Jervalx reached for the door, but clambered down from the perch in an instant, helping in the duke after Maddie showering them with compliments as the yelling and the sound of running feet grew louder in the misty street. The cabman glanced in that direction, and then back at Jervalx. Where to, em lord? The duke squeezed Maddie's hand so hard that she gasped. 
she caught her breath and said, Chelsea. No. Not there. People knew her there. A voice shouted up the street. She had no time to think. Oh, hurry. She seized on the first faraway locale that came into her head. Ludgate Hill. John Spring will have you there in a blink, and so you'll see. He slammed the door, and in a moment she heard him snap his whip at the mournful horse. They rattled at a great pace away from the pursuit, the sound of it lost instantly in the creak and grind of the shabby coach. Maddie dropped her head back against the squabs. We should not. We should not. She put her hand to her mouth. Oh, hast thou any money? Jervalks didn't respond only gripped the strap with a frown, a look of strained bewilderment in his eyes as if he didn't comprehend her, as if his own actions had gone beyond his mastery. Money! she exclaimed, hardly able to contain her distress. He glanced at her with a hot uncertainty. Maddie gave a little moan. I don't even have a shilling in my shoe. Shoe, he said, one of his reflexive repetitions. He made an aggravated sound, turned from her with a scowl. The hackney took a corner, jostling them together in a bump and rattle of wheels. He propped his foot on the opposite seat and braced her with his shoulder. Abruptly, he laughed. Matty girl. He leaned over and tore the buckle from his formal slipper. Money. In Ludgate Hill, outside the mercers and drapers' shops, amid the screeching roar of iron-wheeled traffic, Matty had to explain to the cabman as he leaned in the door. We must sell this, she said, handing it across Jervalk's, and then we can pay thy fare. I'm so sorry to make thee tarry. The driver held the sparkling buckle, turning it over in his fingerless gloves. A flock of pigeons took wing from the sidewalk at the sudden peal of the bells of St. Paul's, clapping upward into the sooty fog. You're running away, ain't you, ladyship? Maddie moistened her lips, aghast at his intuition. I'm not a ladyship. Thou must not call me so. I heard em after ye, back there west. You talk peculiar. You one o' them sort. How do they say it? Friends, Maddie said faintly. A Quaker. He looked up at Jervalks. You going to marry her for real, then, em lord? John Spring don't hold with no carrying off. The duke said nothing. His confusion had vanished. He only seemed haughty, sullen in his silence. He fixed the cab driver with a look of disinterested scorn. Thou art mistaken, Maddie said. We aren't to marry. Ought to, the driver grumbled. Ought to make. Im do right by you, my lady. It isn't. She broke off. There was no use trying to explain. Dost thou know a shop where I may sell it? Those three balls hung over the door yonder. That's a pawnbroker's sign. You stay here, my lady, if you please, so I know, and lord. I'll be back with me fair. No. I must go. The. She almost called Jervalks by his title, then thought better of it. He will wait. She gathered her skirt in preparation to get down. Jervalks plucked the buckle from the cabman's hand. Before Maddie could prevent him, he climbed down from the coach. She scrambled after, but the driver caught her arm as she reached the pavement. What of you stays right here, my lady? he said. No. He shouldn't go alone. He can't. The Duke was already amid the crowd, ignoring both the driver and Maddie's protest avoiding a donkey that trundled past with two rush baskets of coals hung across its back. He turned in the direction opposite from the pawn shop, up the hill toward the cathedral. Thou must let me go. Maddie stood on tiptoe, dreading to lose sight of him. I have to go with him. Though he stood out, tall even bareheaded, his black hair and the blue sash across his coat easy to descry amid the everyday pedestrians, at any moment he must vanish from sight in the swarm. Nay, do you think he'll abandon you so easy, my lady? As she craned anxiously, the driver pointed after Jervalks. Look there. Right into number 32, me fine lordship. 
said John Spring in satisfaction. Rundell and Bridge it is. Christian stopped just inside the jeweler's door. The assistant who had ushered him across the threshold seemed to recognize him, bowing from the waist with a stream of soft greeting. It was all familiar. Christian came here with some frequency. He remembered an emerald bracelet, a set of earrings to match. Who had that been for? A partner came instantly from the inner precincts. Christian acknowledged the man, unable to recall his name, not needing it. Words were unnecessary. Normally he would have been escorted to a private room to view velvet trays and rainbow fire. At his leisure, something he liked, but had no time for now. He could not afford to linger here where he was known. He laid his buckles on the counter. There was a little pause. The assistant faded backward into obscurity. The partner, well-fed and courteous, his cheeks completely hidden behind tall collar points, gave no indication of surprise. He went around the counter, felt in his pocket, and pulled out a tiny magnifier. Christian watched the evaluation of the brilliance, which was short and professional. The jeweler laid down the buckle. HD 300 Sepult. Grace? 300 was an outrageous overpayment. The pair couldn't have been worth more than half that together. Christian frowned, afraid he had not understood it right. He fought down alarm, choked it in ice. 325, the man said. He smiled. You brace been good to us. Lead us tapper tundi show steam return. The assistant came round the corner of the counter, returning a tray of rings to their drawer. Golden curves, set neat row after neat row. The brief display caught Christian's eye, distracted him. The partner made a questioning murmur. Christian realized that he'd drifted. He covered it with a quick autocratic nod, agreeing to the price. The rings disappeared into their slotted drawer. Wedding rings. The assistant lifted the key on a string round his neck and unlocked another tray. The partner leaned a little across toward Christian. Cred Grace, he asked in a very soft voice. Cast paint? The low tone, the question, Christian didn't understand. He felt befuddled, facing the man's expectant confidentiality. In an appallingly long pause, he clung to his ice remoteness, refused to lean close or acknowledge the question, tried to think it through. The merchandise examined, the bargain struck then, what? They would pay him. Credit or cash payment? Yes. His heart accelerated. He could think of no way to respond. He gripped the edge of the counter, then put his white-gloved hand on top. He opened it palm up. Virgood. The partner nodded. Moment. He took up the buckles and went briskly toward the back rooms. Christian watched the assistant at his work. The new tray went down the counter to a man and a young woman in a plain gray dress. And as Christian was standing there with his jaw clamped, his heart pounding, spying on some country couple who murmured solemnly over their meager purchase, it came to him. A revelation, an answer that had been making its way through his numb and wayward brain for longer than he'd even known himself. Maddie. It was Maddie girl he should marry. The clarity of it, the beauty, burst on him in perfect glory. Maddie girl would never let them send him back. Maddie girl could understand him. She didn't humiliate him. Her father was. A talented geometer, she was devoted and loyal. Look at the way. She'd come with him, even if it had been under a certain amount of force, a very little. She'd come almost of her own accord, ye gods. He'd even seen her stand up, and damned well, to the she-dragon and she had said she loved him. He thought she'd said that. He was almost certain. Maddie girl deserved to be a duchess. It had been a great mistake of nature to make her a thee thou sugar scoop bonnet. The partner returned with a slim leather book. He laid it on the counter, circumspect, no sign of banknotes, but Christian. Knew what it was. He felt urgent, anxious to escape. With an effort he governed his impulse to snatch it up and flee. Instead he went to the ring tray, 
made a slight bow of apology to the young lady, pulled a ring from its velvet rest, and brought it back to the jeweler. The partner smiled his affluent smile. He started to take back the money book. Christian clapped his hand over it. Bill in course. The jeweler never blinked. Led your grace box. He took up the ring, leaving the book untouched. Christian slipped the leather wallet into his pocket. He hated the taste of this, a thief with his own money. He felt his control breaking. A skulking, escaped animal, chancery lunatic, with no right to sell his shoe buckles, to purchase a ring for his future wife. The partner returned with the box. Christian accepted it. They ushered him out as if he were real, still the Duke of Jervalx. Still a man and not a beast. When he returned to the street, he felt dazed, sluggish, his. Whole body felt like terror trapped inside lethargy. He walked a little way along the pavement, then stopped and leaned on the wall. The crowds flowed past, confusing and loud, alien gibber, horrible mindless sound that should have been sense. The ice calm of the episode deserted him. Late reaction sent his heart thudding with dread. He might not have done it right. He might have forgotten something. He didn't know. It was all forbidding and strange. What might have happened? How he might have given himself away, made himself ridiculous, put himself in their power to seize and restrain. He heard Maddie call him. He heard his name through the disorder. Jervalx, solid dear plain no manners Maddie girl, her hands on his arms, her eyes, sherry eyes, decadent gold, looking up into his, full of fear and question. He drew in a hard breath, mastering panic. He manufactured a grin. Without looking down, he fumbled the book of banknotes from his pocket and pushed them into her hands. Chapter 16 Maddie had not ever had so much money at once in her possession. She held the wallet in both hands as they walked, afraid to tuck it into her dress. The hundreds of pounds made this preposterous flight seem all too credible. An immediate return became choice, not necessity. After she'd paid the driver, Jervalx had looked at her as if she knew what they ought to do. He kept his hand gripped firmly on her elbow, a strange mixture of dependence and protection. With the duke beside her, none of the barrow boys shouted at her that she stopped the way. No quarrelsome pedestrian pushed her into the muddy street rather than give up an inch of space to pass. He was broad-shouldered and imperial, and his eyes were the blue spirit of bewilderment, a disquietude like looking into the sky at the last of twilight, straight overhead to a single star, when comfortable illusion vanished and the solid roof of the sky dissolved to betray its real and dizzy distance. She felt as if her whole solid world had evaporated in that way. It was hard to conceive that Archimedia Timms was standing in the teeming footway on Ludgate Hill trying to decide what was to be done with the Duke of Jervalx, since he did not appear to have any notion what to do with himself. She'd begun to walk, having no better idea. A safe haven, that was what she must find for him. No matter the reprisal that faced her, she had to get back to Papa by evening. He would be frantic that she had disappeared with the Duke. She had no clear idea of what broken laws and criminal acts she might be taxed with, but Lady de Marley would be sure to know them all. Maddie was certain of that. For herself, she thought with a rather tenuous bravery, she didn't mind so very much. Jervalx was her opening, after all, and any sufferings that came with him must be borne but she was afraid of what might become of her papa if she were to be sent to prison. The pressure of his hand pulled her to a stop. Just in front of them, on the loud blast of a horn, a day coach for Brighton clattered out from beneath the sign of the Bell Savage, wheeling into the street with the guard blowing enthusiastically for right-of-way. As soon as it passed, disappearing into the shifting screen of traffic and black mist, Jervalks drew her toward the inn-yard gate. Beneath the passageway, a stable boy wielded a deft rake, scooping dirt and droppings from their path, skipping backwards with a quick muttered salute as they passed. Travelers stood about inside the yard, waiting next to their trunks and valises and piles of bundled belongings. Another coach was loading, 
the yellow and black for new market, the horses fresh, rattling their shoes against the cobbles and blowing frost. Jervalks went directly to the booking office. He handed Maddie in the door, with a little extra push as if she might need encouragement. The crowd inside around the desk barely admitted two more. Even as outlandishly as Maddie and the Duke were dressed, no one paid the least mind, the clerks too busy flinging brown paper parcels into the tower of pigeonholes. Behind the desk, the customers calling out questions or trying to engage the attention of some porter. He pulled her into a tight corner, turned his back on the gathering and leaned over to her ear. Go, he said, not achieving an actual whisper, but it hardly mattered in the common racket. Maddie looked at him. Where? The question appeared to exasperate him. Go, he repeated. Two. Not I, she said firmly. A lady with a pair of little girls on her arms edged past behind him, working her way to the end of the shortest queue. Jervalks put his hand on Maddie's shoulder. Two, he insisted. I cannot. His fingers pressed into her. Home. Sure, he clenched his jaw with effort. Vo. It didn't seem an entirely absurd notion, except that she had no idea where his home might be or whether he could travel there alone, without being tagged, like a child or a trunk, or an idiot, which was vision enough to chill her. And his home would be no protection from his family's power to send him. Back to Blythedale. Home, he urged. Maddie girl. Where is it? She asked. Where? That seemed to foil him. He scowled released her and turned her around bodily. On the wall she'd been leaning against were posting bills and a shellacked and yellowing tourist's map of England, the varnish in the vicinity of London. Rubbed through and cracking from all the wear. He put his hand on a part of the map that had hardly deteriorated at all, far to the west, where the green of England met the red of Wales. No! Thou canst not go that distance alone. He caught her shoulders again. She felt him move closer against her back, almost an embrace. He pressed his cheek to her hood, dislodging it from covering her hair, and made a sound of insistence. He wrapped his arms around her and held her back against him, right there amid the stagecoach passengers. Two, he said in her ear. Home. She tried to scramble away, but he wouldn't allow it. He let her turn then trapped her there against the map and the wall. She hardly knew what to do. Some of the customers were looking at them. She imagined their shock and censure, what they must think of her in a torn skirt and no bonnet, locked in a man's arms. He leaned his mouth next to her ear. Maddie girl, Wednesday. Several more customers walked into the room, brushing close behind Jervalks. One of them kept on his hat, the broad-brimmed, unmistakable insignia of a Quaker. Maddie ducked. Her head in horror. She hadn't caught sight of who it was, but any visiting friend with business here might know her from yearly meeting, and all too many from London itself would know her very well. She buried her face in Jervalks's shoulder for concealment. He caught her close, with a soft, willing murmur in his throat. She did not dare look up. She didn't struggle. He was a shield against discovery, large and solid enough to hide safely behind, if only he would not slip his hand up beneath her hood that way, brushing it fully back and wrapping his fingers round the nape of her neck, pulling her closer yet, resting his face against her hair. She couldn't imagine that everyone in the room didn't turn and gasp and point in condemnation. But the normal sound of business went on about them, the clump of shoes passing in and out the door, the porter's calls, the new market coach's horn as the team turned into the street. His hand slipped from her waist. She felt him work at something in his coat, all the while she did not venture to lift her head and risk being seen. He groped for her hand and pressed a small box into it. Maddie held the container, keeping her head down, looking a little to the side to try to see if the unknown friend had departed yet. 
Jervox made her turn her hand over. With an impatient mutter, he pushed his thumb awkwardly against the box in her palm. The lid opened. Hiding as she was, her face lowered, she saw gold and multicolored fire. A ring, a wide filigree band with seed pearls around a vivid opal, for entrapment. He fumbled at it one-handed, got his forefinger halfway through the ring, and let the box fall. In this small corner, with their heads lowered together, they created a tiny private world. Maddie watched in perplexity as he worked the ring around into his hand, and then tried to slide it onto her finger. Wednesday. He put his lips against her ear. Maddie wed. Home. She stared at the ring, at his fingers as he pushed it forcibly onto hers. No! She pulled the opal free and stooped to retrieve the box, yanking her hood firmly over her head. Thou art, it is not, no! However didst thou invent such a scheme? She shoved the box into his palm and turned. With the hood clasped close to her face, she forced her way through the press of travelers and hurried into the yard. Outside, she rushed a few feet from the door and stopped, her face burning. She held her hood over her mouth and nose. The Duke came out of the office door. She was in plain sight, but he didn't seem to see her. He halted, a bizarrely splendid gentleman amid the ordinary surroundings, a lost courtier, rich with velvet and heavy embellishment with his royal blue sash and medallion, lost in more than place and time. People turned to look at him. Maddie saw the rigid unease in his stance. He stood immobile where he'd stopped, as if one step in any direction might be into a cavern that opened at his feet. His jaw was tight, his dark brows drawn down. Arrested force, alone and alien. He scanned the yard. Maddie was quite close to him, within. A touch of his right hand, and yet she might have been one of the pieces of baggage scattered in piles about the court. He didn't even look her way. He only radiated high-strung tension, a spiraling stillness, a man ready to splinter. She said his name, muffled behind the cloak. His bearing changed. He turned toward her as if she'd broken a spell, the release like a bright flame in his face. It seemed to startle him that she was so close. He took an aggressive step and moved to catch her by both arms. Not leave, he said savagely. Lone, can't. Stay. You, stay. I don't know what to do with you. Maddie bit down on the woolen hood as she held it to her mouth. I can't stay with you. I can't take you back. Sure. He put his palms against her shoulders and gave her a sharp push. Though. He gave her another, making her take a step back. Home. A push. Mary. Push. Maddie. Push. Girl. Push. Yes. Under his coercion, she was progressing unevenly backward across the yard. Not. Mad place. Mary. Maddie. No, she said, then sucked in a panicked breath and twitched her hood as far as she could over her face to conceal herself. In somber hat and plain coat, the Quaker from the ticket office approached them. Maddie peered from inside her hood as the stranger laid a hand on Jervalks's arm. Think a moment, friend. Thou art importunate. Jervalks gave him a look as if the man had just spit in his face. For a vibrating instant, she was afraid that he would turn and strike out the way he'd done to Cousin Edward. The Quaker was only a medium-sized man, no older than Maddie herself, clean-shaven and clear-eyed, no one whom she recalled seeing before. A good man, courageous to confront Jervalks, who was so clearly angry and an aristocrat, with nothing insignificant about him, either in conduct or in build. The Duke shook off the restraining hand. He looked hotly at Maddie, as if expecting her to explain. I thank thee, friend, she said quickly, anxious to placate Jervalks. But I need no help. The Quaker gave her a startled glance. Maddie felt her heart drop. 
Thou art in the life? he asked. She looked at the ground. Wicked lies sprang to her lips, immoral deceptions to retrieve the mistake that had revealed her to another friend more clearly than a Quaker bonnet and plain dress would have done. But she could not. He was no threat to Jervox. It was only to save her own stature in front of one of her fellow members. She barely lifted her eyes. I am. Jervox grasped her elbow. It was a silent touch, not harsh, but firm. He watched the Quaker warily. He doesn't bedevil thee? the man asked. He met Jervox's look. I'd not suffer thee to lift a hand against her. Will thou compose thyself and walk peaceful? It was a quiet inquiry, almost kind. Maddie felt a surge of gratitude and affinity. This man seemed an island of sense in a storm of uncertainty, so much more familiar in his broad plain. Hat and simple coat, so much more trustworthy than an incalculable, angry stranger in velvet and medallion and royal sash. The Quaker appeared troubled at Jervox's lack of response. Thou wilt not answer as an honest man? Jervox's grip on her arm grew painful. Maddie touched the Quaker's rough broadcloth sleeve. Friend, she said softly, ignoring Jervox's increasing pressure on her arm his silent attempt to pull her from the newcomer's range. She was forming a new purpose. I spoke idle words in haste, to say that I need not thy help. She lifted her eyes to the level, steady inquiry in the young man's gaze. I'm in true want of aid. Canst thou give assistance? Surely, he said, a single word that lifted a thousand pounds from Maddie's shoulders. While Jervalk sat disposed in an attitude of majestic disapproval, his chair pushed away from a table in the public dining parlor, his legs outstretched, his arms crossed over. Starburst and sash, Maddie bent close to the young Quaker and related her difficulty. Richard Gill took a sip of ale and looked thoughtfully at the Duke when she'd finished. Jervalk's, brooding and defiant, glared back beneath his black lashes. He had not wished to come into the dining room. He tried to prevent her. But when Maddie refused to be held back, he'd followed, not allowing her to move a step beyond his immediate reach. He didn't speak, and Maddie couldn't tell how much he understood of what she said to Richard Gill, but his whole demeanor was of betrayed dignity, as if she offended him with this new connection. Richard remained silent, a somber and thinking pause. Maddie waited glad to be again with a person who was not so quick with words or action but took time to consider. She was content to bide in Richard's contemplation. The young friend was handsome, with composed moves and a resolute air that invited confidence. His strong face suited the deep-brimmed hat. An unadorned coat better than did many a solemn elders. Maddie was certain he never attended London yearly meeting, where friends met to conduct their annual business— and query the smaller quarterly and monthly meetings as to their spiritual state. Yearly meeting gathered Quaker families together from all over England. She would have recalled it if Richard Gill had been a delegate. It didn't require direct attendance at men's meeting for all the women to know who was prominent and who was not, and who was unmarried and who was not. It was axiomatic that if a young woman wished to wed, her best course was to attend London yearly meeting where one of the chief duties of the meeting of women friends there was to look into hopeful couples' clearness for marriage, a process that naturally lent itself to appraisal and ordering by their suitability of the other eligible bachelors in attendance. Richard Gill, Maddie was quite certain, had not yet been brought to the attention of women's in any regard, nuptial or otherwise. She was not quite certain what his business must be. He'd come to the coach office to retrieve a sturdy small box that he seemed heedful to manage with great care. It sat now on the table beside him, labeled with a series of circles designated by such curious titles as Claudiana, Fourth Row, Rose, Trafalgar Banner, First Row, Bibleman, and Duke of Clarence, Fourth Row, Bizid. The waiter brought beefsteak pudding and boiled cabbage. Jervalks made a face at it. 
He drank deeply of his ale while Maddie busied herself buttering three slices of bread, serving out portions for each of them. She bowed her head for a moment of blessing. Richard removed his hat. Jervalks did nothing at all, just watched them malevolently, slouched with crossed arms in his chair. Richard put on his hat again and began to eat his pudding. Maddie didn't know many young men who kept so strictly to plain speech and dress. She admired him for it. She wished that she might have appeared in a more neat and proper guise herself, instead of lacking her bonnet and with her skirt torn. She glanced at Jervox. He wasn't eating. He was watching. Her, and as cleanly handsome as Richard Gill might be, the Duke was more shadow and connection to her, his fine mouth that had kissed hers, his hands that had caressed her hair. She flushed, feeling the liar and pretender. She had represented Jervox as her patient, herself as his nurse. The appearance of it struck her with strong effect. What nurse would run away with a patient against his family's wishes? What nurse would let herself be kissed? What would Richard Gill think of her if he knew? And not to tell him, it was one of those lies of silence and omission. It was not walking in the way, not at all. Thou don't think him mad? Richard asked. He startled Maddie with his sudden speech. She looked up. No. He does not seem raving. But he pushed thee in the yard. She broke a piece of bread with a tiny wry smile. He's a duke. It's not the same as madness, quite. Richard ate another bite. That is what dukes do. He lifted his brows. Push? That is the least of what this one will do. At his little distance from the table, Jervalx tilted his head and looked bored. He flicked a glance from Maddie to Richard, lifted his ale and drank. He doesn't understand? Richard asked. I don't know. Some, I think. Thou ought to take him back to his family. Maddie sat up a little. No. Jervox looked at her. The tedium left his manner. It isn't thy place to keep him away, if they wish him to live retired. He belongs to his own, not to thee. No. His family doesn't understand. They don't know what. Tis like there. It is thy cousin's house? It's a madhouse. He is not mad. He doesn't speak. How is he to live in the world alone? She pulled her cloak close around her. Not alone. He can't live alone. How then? Has he no friends but thee? I... Maddie stopped, realizing that she didn't know. She looked to Jervalx. A friend? She asked. Hast thou a near companion? He looked from her to Richard and back again warily. No she said. I don't mean Quaker. A friendship. Of thine. A companion. He hesitated. Then he held out his hand to her. Jervox. Despair crept into her voice. Is there not one friend who loves thee? His hand closed. His great golden signet gleamed against his fingers. He gave Richard a baleful look, settling back in the chair. Perhaps, Jervalx, thou wouldst remain with him? She nodded toward the Quaker. With Richard Gill? Archimedia, Richard began. Only until I can go back and tell Papa I'm well, she said hastily. If thou wouldst only stop here with him for a little. While. A few hours. It isn't the stopping. It is that he ought to go back. I can't take him back. She cried, leaning forward. Thou canst not understand. Jervalx watched her intensely. His right fist worked in rhythm. He closed his left around the tankard of ale. But did not drink. Please, she said to Richard Gill. Small lines of unhappiness marked the Quaker's brow. She saw the misgiving in his lucid gray eyes. Please, she whispered. Wilt thou not make it thy concern? It was a plea that no friend could take lightly. 
Richard frowned down at his meal. He closed his eyes. Maddie waited, pleading with God to speak to him, knowing that it was wrong to do so, to beg that her own self will prevail, but unable to help herself. She couldn't take Jervok's back. That was the only truth she knew for certain. It was simply impossible to imagine him again in the cell at Blydale Hall. Richard let go of a deep breath and looked at her. I will make it my concern. I will consider further if he should go back. She hardly knew whether that meant he would wait here with the Duke or not, but before she could ask, Jervalk thumped his ale down on the table. He stood, kicking his chair away, and jerked Maddie up from hers. Back, he exclaimed, with energy burning in his eyes. Then he gritted his teeth and said, Friend! He hauled her with him, his grip more than she could break. She heard Richard utter something behind them, saw the waiter come hurrying up to block him at the table as Jervalks propelled her toward the door with unswerving force. Maddie fought him, trying to turn back. Jervalks overmatched her easily, with more strength than she'd ever realized he could command. When she tried to plant her feet, he dragged her off them. She wrenched free, but Jervalks grabbed her again, his arm around her neck, forcing her ruthlessly with him. His hold locked as she twisted away, his fingers digging. Hard into the skin at her nape, catching stray hairs. She yelped. Jervox! Richard! I can't help me! She had a whirling glimpse of Richard and the waiter, and then lost them, stumbling out the front door under Jervox's propulsion, half falling down the step among the pedestrians. Friend! Jervox ejaculated plowing ahead with her. Dem! He stopped a hackney in the same way he'd stopped one before, by walking right into the street in front of it. As the horse half-reared, its hooves striking the pavement inches from his feet, the driver shouted and another cab swerved. Jervalks grabbed the animal's bridle. Alban! He yelled, with the horse in one hand and Maddie in the other. Jeo Christ! All right, Albany, ye blinkin'. Mad man, the driver shouted. Let me horse loose, then, and get you inside. A paved and covered walkway led into the mist, materializing ahead of them and vanishing behind as they walked between the double rows of long, pale cream buildings. Off Piccadilly, the Duke's footsteps echoed in the quiet, the place. Seemed deserted at mid morning except for a single boot black hurrying past with a box and a pair of shoes in his hands. Maddie had given up resisting. She ceased trying to do anything but keep pace with Jervalks. He would not let her go or allow her to lag behind. They passed another servant, a little pot-bellied man in a red waistcoat who stepped aside, bowed to the duke and murmured, Your Grace. Without a pause, Jervalks turned into a stone staircase and went up two floors with Maddie. A dog began to bark before he even touched the door. Another took up the chorus. Jervalks froze with his hand lifted. Devil! His lips pulled back in a fierce grin. His fist came down, pounding. The dogs on the other side went reckless with extravagant noise. Devil, devil, devil! Good God, hold your row! A muffled voice yelled from somewhere far inside. On a lower landing, another door opened. Maddie looked down to see a curious face lifted, an elderly man in a dressing robe and nightcap. The dogs scraped savagely at the door. The staircase resonated with barks and Jervox's pounding knock. The voice from inside tried to quiet them. Here, Cass, here, you worthless cur. Shut up, shut up. They'll make me shoot you for certain. Jervox stopped banging abruptly, leaning on the door his cheek against it as if it were solid ground to a drowning sailor. The dogs went on barking while the latch turned. The door. Open to a swarm of white and black fur, pink tongues and plumed tails, as the two dogs threw themselves onto Jervalks. Maddie looked beyond them to the blonde, drowsy-eyed man who stood in the entrance hall, bare-chested and in stocking feet, a scrap of shaving soap still spread on his jaw. 
The barking ceased as the dogs plunged and pressed themselves over Jervalks. The duke knelt, spread his arms and let them lick his face and scrabbled their paws in his hair. Chev? The man in the doorway said, as if he'd just been woken from a sound sleep. Matty glanced at the elderly eavesdropper on the landing below, who was still looking up and leaning a little to get a better view. May we come inside? She asked. The blonde man had been staring at Jervalx and the dogs. He glanced at Matty, seemed to come all at once awake, and stepped back. Ye gods, he said. That was all, but he threw his shaving towel over his shoulder and reached to urge the duke. Within. Jervalx went, the dogs twining themselves lovingly. Round his legs. Matty stepped quickly inside and shut the door behind her. Their host, still dumbfounded, followed them into the sitting room. Chef, he said. Jervalx crossed the room and leaned his hands on the windowsill, looking out into the mist. Then he turned around, his back to the wall with his dogs pressing ecstatic bodies against him. Some severe emotion came into his face. He closed his eyes and slid down to sit on the floor. The black and white setter licked his ear. He put his arm round the dog and buried. His face in the silky white coat. The black one whined and tried to push between them. I thought, oh. God, man, they said you were dying. As good as dead. They gave me the dogs. The disheveled gentleman strode to Jervalks, then didn't seem to know what to do when he got there. He fell to his knees. Chev, he said helplessly. Jervalks didn't lift his face. He shook his head, his fingers buried in Devil's coat. The blonde man turned to look up at Matty. What is it? They told me he was dying. What's happened? Thou art his friend. Certainly I'm his friend. He don't have a better. Out with it, woman. Have you got claws into him some way or other? He looked back at Jervalx. Christ, is it opium? He needs thy assistance. What assistance? Who are you? My name is Archimedia Timms. He was a patient at my cousin's asylum in Buckinghamshire. I had charge of him there. We are. She made a little foolish laugh and spread her hands. I suppose we have broke bounds and are run away. The man pushed back a tousled blonde forelock. He sat on his heels. Chev, he said again in that baffled voice. The duke raised his head. His eyes were midnight dark, full of moisture. With an angry, abashed move, he raised his arm and wiped one side of his face on his sleeve. Friend he said hoarsely. D-N-N-H. Dunram. He leaned his head back against the wall with a groan. Dun? Maddie said. Is that thy name? Durham, the blonde man said, and added absently. Kit Durham, at your service, ma'am. Jervalx looked at his friend. Devil put a nose to his cheek and temple, wriggling in delight. Jervalks hugged the animal. D-R-R-M, thank, he said. Thank, dogs. Durham stared at him. Jervalks made another anguished sound and shook his head, pushing air between his teeth. Right. Dogs. Nothing to it. Durham stood up, set a chair. Get off the floor, old fellow. Got to think. Can't think with you on the floor, Chev. Maddie thought the resumption of normality a good thing. Jervalx had a very strange expression. He was on the edge of shattering. He wouldn't like his friend to see him beyond control. Perhaps thou ought to finish dressing, she suggested to Durham, hoping to give the Duke a moment to compose himself in privacy. Oh, good God! Durham began a hasty retreat. My apologies. I beg your pardon, ma'am. Forgot myself. Wasn't. Expecting, a lady, that is. You stay right there, Chev. Don't leave. We won't leave, Maddie said. Durham blinked at her, as if it kept surprising him that she spoke instead of Jervalks. 
he backed into the other room and slammed the door. Having disdained cabbage and beefsteak, Jervalk seemed quite content to share Durham's breakfast of salmon and fresh oysters with bread and lemon. Without asking what he'd like, Durham sent his servant, the same pot-bellied man who'd spoken to the duke outside, back to the kitchen for chocolate instead of coffee to drink. Jervalk sat sipping at the steaming dark liquid and feeding tidbits to the dogs while his friend interrogated Maddie. As they talked, the duke watched them through the vapors from his cup, an unruffled satisfaction in his expression. He seemed to feel that he had done all that could be done, and was satisfied to leave any further decisions in the hands of others. Durham, at least, had no doubts that Jervalx ought to be protected from his family's intentions. That loathsome old hellcat was his succinct opinion of Lady de Marley, and his comment upon the duke's mother included words that Maddie had never even heard before. At best, she found his style of speech difficult to comprehend. She hesitated when he demanded whether she was certain that no one could touch on the drag from the church. Drag? She asked dubiously. The scent. No one could find where you went. I shouldn't think so. We've been to Ludgate Hill and back in Hackney's. Ludgate Hill? He gave a bark of laughter. Good girl. He grinned at Jervalx. Who'd think of you pointing for a lot of drapers, eh? The duke turned his head a little, smiling back. He took a sip of his chocolate. Maddie suspected that he understood less than she. No one, take my word, Durham answered himself. More likely they'd have that. Egad. He sprang out of his chair, pulling the curtains. They'll come here. Mark. He yelled into the next room. Onto the stair with you. Keep a watch. I'm not at home. Tell M. I've gone early to change. The servant bowed over his scarlet potbelly. Sir, they won't believe me. Hell's bells, can a man make a purchase in the public funds? I just had a bequest from my third cousin four times removed, that's the ticket. Six hundred pounds, but mind you, don't part with that morsel for less than half a crown. What of the colonel, sir? Should I turn him off? Damn and blast, Fane. He'll be here any minute. Durham chewed his lip. No percentage in it. He glanced at Maddie. We can trust Fane. He'd never swallow the tail. Anyway, think I'd gone batty to put six hundred in funds. He won't have a not a notion what to do. He ain't the thinking sort. But if you want a good sound fellow at your back, and he feigns your man. Maddie was pleased to have anyone at all at her back. Durham seemed a little flighty, but he clearly meant to help Jervalx. She was about to mention her need to return to her papa when Jervalx and Durham both glanced toward the window at the sound of an off-key whistle. The duke grinned and set down his cup. Friend, he said to Maddie. Beforehand for once, Durham said, as a handsome clock on the mantel rang a set of melodious chimes. He ducked halfway into the entrance hall. I'll send Mark down to bring him up quiet. The old general was in on that racket when you came in, wasn't he? We'll put it in his ear about the six hundred pounds. He frowned at Maddie. You're my, ah, uh, second cousin five times removed. Orphan. Came with the bequest. Orphan always comes with the bequest. Solicitor brought you, couldn't wait, had to catch the mail back to somewhere. All that pounding to wake me up, right? Barking, his imagination. Dogs ain't allowed. Lord only knows how I've got by with it this long. He disappeared into the entryway. All these lies and deceptions made Maddie uncomfortable. Even if she weren't speaking them herself, she was participating. Richard Gill's steady, thoughtful gaze haunted her like a conscience. But against it was Jervalx's clear joy in his friends, both Durham and the officer with the magnificent golden lace and bright facings on his uniform, who didn't say a word to the duke, just took him round the shoulders and pounded his back, and then shoved him away. The officer looked down and pushed Devil off his knee. Knew he was too tedious to kill. 
he said to the dog. Got a few more papers to write, what? He gave Maddie a sideways squint. Brought a girl along, too, wouldn't you know it? This is Miss Sa. Ah. Durham left an expectant pause. Tim's, Maddie said. The soldier swept a bow, holding his sword back with one white-gloved hand and brushing her skirt with the tall white plume of his military hat. Colonel Andrew Fane, at your service, my love. Leave off, Fane. She's a Quaker. Colonel Fane looked startled. He stiffened his spine and put his heels together in a military manner, going quite red in the face. I beg your pardon, ma'am. Miss? Then it's your fellow waiting out by the street, is it? One who wanted to know if, damn, asked about you, Chev, that was it. Didn't understand what the devil he was getting at, but I see it now. Wanted to know where to find the duke. What duke, says I, got dukes by the score, Richard. Maddie clapped her hand to her breast. It will be Richard Gill. Oh, said Colonel Fane. However did he. She bit her lip and turned to Durham. He'll have followed us. I spoke to him. I asked him to help. And he said that he would, but I'm not certain that he. Doesn't think I should take the Duke back to his family? He knows about it. Durham demanded. And he's out there now? Here? Lud, miss, why didn't you say? I didn't know. I never thought he could follow, or would. But he's made it a concern. I should have known that he wouldn't cast it off easily. What the devil is going on? The colonel demanded. Get rid of that ridiculous thing you wear on your head and sit down. Durham yanked a chair from the table. We're all gone to cover for Chev. Those harpies he's pleased to call a family want to put him away in a madhouse. Say what? Tell him, Miss Timms. Chev needs us. You tell him what you told me. Chapter 17 Can't talk? Colonel Fane gave Jervalx a look of comical incredulity. The Duke returned a wintry smile. He stroked the black dog Cass. His mouth curled and hardened with brutal effort. His fingers dug into the black ruff. Dumb you! The officer appeared to comprehend this comment instantly. I'm not dumb! He protested. Come along, Fane! Durham poured him coffee. Everybody knows you're a block. I am not dumb! Listen, who thought of selling Chev to the Resurrection Jarvi? Me. And who had to go and pay his bail? Colonel Fane grinned. Kill him, he smirked theatrically. I say, his lips puckered. Kill him when, he began to snicker. Take a damper, you lobcock. Durham's face was a pink combination of disgust and pent-up amusement. This is serious. Kill him. The colonel could no longer speak through wheezes of laughter. I say, kill him, kill him when you want him, Jervalk said clearly. He grinned, leaning his chair back on two legs. Durham's smile faded in surprise, but Maddie caught his eye. He made no comment on the duke's speech. The colonel seemed to think nothing of it. He was chortling, banging one fist into his other palm. Bless me, what a row that was, Miss Timms! Chev was right bosky, do you see? He was used up. Corned, pickled and salted, comatose, Miss Timms, Durham explained gravely. In strong drink. Oh yes, good Oxford word. Comatose. The colonel seemed to find that description an uplifting one. Perfectly senseless. And we was having to carry him home, why see, between the two of us, and he weighs. S. blood, he must weigh fourteen stone and who might drive by at the very moment but the one they call the Resurrection Jarvie, night coachman. Sells bodies to the surgeons. Durham interpreted. For anatomy lectures. Right. So what should I think? And it was my idea entirely, I promise you, miss. And the fellow took him, and Colonel Fane made an expressive revolution with his forefinger. And, you know, his clothes, we got those, 
and the fellow took him in a sheet to Old Brooks. In Blenheim Street. Took him. There, to the lecturer's door. He leaned back his head and thumped the table and offered and offered him for F. Sale. The colonel lost the power of coherent utterance in his hilarity. Maddie had lost hers, too. She stared at the officer in scandalized shock. Colonel Fane spluttered into speech again. And the doctor's amines. Am men says, he says. You scoundrel, this fellow ain't dead. She looked around at the others. Jervalks and Durham were both watching Colonel Fane, grinning broadly in anticipation. And the Jarvie says, Not dead? The colonel drew himself up in a semblance of a front. Not dead? Why then, sir, then I say, sir, you must just, k, k. The other two joined in, harmonizing in sonorous unison, kill him when you want him. A chorus of deep masculine timbre, Jervalx as fluent as the rest. He was chuckling, rocking back again with his legs outstretched. Damn you, he said to the colonel. Rob. Oh, right, that was the upshot of it. Poor old Chev, the doctor thinks. Tis a burglary attempt, a shot get into his house, and cries thief. The Jarvi got clean away, but they tied up Chev and sent. On to Marlborough Street, and he laid there all night in a sheet, and half the morning. Till Durham could get a solicitor out of the old Bailey, to argue not to commit him. Duke of. He began to. Lose his composure again. Duke of, of Jervalx, YC4. Attempt to rob a, a, bone house. They all grew absurd at that, wiping eyes and sighing when the waves of mirth finally died down. Devil jumped up, his forelegs on the duke's lap. Jervalx rubbed the dog's head vigorously between his hands. He slanted his pirate smile on Matty, midnight blue and mischief. So there you are, Miss Timms the colonel said, with a self-satisfied groan. It was all hushed up, but you have it from the horse's mouth. I see, she said, unable to add more. What a lark. I'm not dumb. No, indeed. Lord bless us, what a lark. Perhaps thou might return to the duke's situation, she said. Oh, yes. Right ho. The duke's situation. Got himself into another scrape, has he? Bear with us, Miss Timms, Durham said. We keep Fane about for his muscle, not his brains. Do you think we ought to speak to this man Richard Gill? How much does he know of it? Could he bring the pursuit down on us here? I told him all that I've told thee. Durham poured another round, coffee for himself and the colonel, chocolate for Jervalx and Maddie. I've been considering. I think we've got a little time before they draw our cover. With no one likely to have seen you get away, it might be all morning before they decide to look beyond. The streets about the chapel. Even if they think of me so soon. They'll do no more than send a query round, I'll wager, and Mark can fob that off all right. But for the long run, we must smuggle you both out of town. Out of town? The Duke, yes, I think that's excellently sensible. But I must return to my father. Do you think it wise? It matters not if it's wise, I must. Well, we'll think of a story then. You tried to keep up with the Duke, but lost him. But that should satisfy even this Gill fellow, eh? Pressed upon by the horses and over and the scent. St. James's was his point but you lost him among the thickets in Piccadilly. Leave the rest to us, and a rare great lady you are, Miss Timms, for bringing him out of that fix, if I may be allowed the compliment. I thank thee, but I can't say those things, Matty protested. Why not? They are not true. Of course they aren't true. Where would we be if you were to tell them the truth? I can't tell them falsehoods. Durham gave her a queer look. You must, my dear. Just a small falsehood. A very white lie. I can't. I can't lie. You can't lie? Colonel Fane echoed. 
He and Durham were gazing at her as if she were a disturbing illusion that had just crystallized out of the mist in front of them. No, she said. She might have thought, wickedly, of deceiving Lady de Marley, perhaps even Cousin Edward, but she couldn't imagine lying to her father, or to Richard Gill, whose whole demeanor was a public testimony to walking in the life. It's not our way, she said helplessly. I cannot do it. But what will you say, then? She bit her lip. If they asked me, I must answer truth. You can't lie. Durham fixed her with a hard look. Not even in this one case, to save a man's neck? It should be, what God wills. To lie is to make it my will. But after I leave, thou canst take him away, and I can say truthfully that I don't know where he is. Why, thank you. That leaves you quite in the clear, don't it? And when they ask you where you last saw him, I'll find myself hauled up before a magistrate. She lowered her eyes. All right. Just give me time to think. Let me think. He steepled his hands over his coffee cup. You must go back directly. Why must you go back directly? My papa. He doesn't know what's become of me. He won't even know that I went with the Duke of my own will. He might believe I'd been hurt, or even, he might think anything. Right. Your father's worried about you. Where is he? He and my cousin Edward are staying at the Gloucester Hotel. There you are. We'll just arrange to slip a note under his door, tell him you're perfectly well, but can't come back at the moment. That's all true, ain't it? He can't read a note. He's lost his sight. And I don't know what he'd think to get a message like that from me. He'd be. Beside himself. Wouldn't thou be? And how can I not go back? Where else am I to go? Oh Lord, Durham said and sighed. Nothing is simple. He eyed her speculatively, rubbing his chin. The room fell silent except for the occasional scrabble of the dog's toenails as they shifted and pushed one another out the way, vying for the duke's attention. Fane, Durham said abruptly, make yourself useful. Go down and invite Mr. Gill into luncheon. The colonel rose obediently, restoring his plumed hat firmly to his head. And do make certain that he accepts, Durham added, with a lazy lift of his brows. Colonel Fane bowed, Imposing in his uniform and tall plume, his hand resting casually on the gold and silver hilt of his sword. Most persuasive, when I wished to be. My mother always said so. The Duke didn't relish seeing Richard again, that was immediately obvious. He came to his feet with an irritated exclamation as Colonel Fane ushered the Quaker into the room. Still carrying his curious box. Jervalx moved to the sofa where Maddie sat, taking up a place behind her. The black setter instantly made a stand at her feet, growling, while Devil jumped up onto the sofa beside Maddie and began barking and snarling at the newcomer. Chev! Durham snapped. For God's sake, shut them up! Jervalx made a hiss between his teeth. The dogs grew quiet. Devil put his paws in her lap and lowered himself into a crouch half on her and half off, while Cass stood alert, pressed against her knees. Maddie, barricaded among dogs, gave Richard a feeble smile. Thou art good to come again to help. He looked around at the other men, then said softly, I followed. I was afeard for thee, Archimedia. There is no harm? Oh, no. No. The Duke brought us here. These are his good friends. Durham, and Colonel Fane. In spite of his dark plain coat and broad hat, Richard Gill seemed in some strange and subtle way not unlike Colonel Fane, the one in easy scarlet brilliance, trimmed in white and gold and blue, the other starkly unadorned, and yet both with a strength about them, something unexpectedly formidable underlying their preposterously different facades and characters. Durham didn't invite the Quaker to sit. He leaned his hands on the back of a chair. Let me be straightforward with you, Mr. Gill. 
We have no intention that the Duke shall go back to. His family, not under the circumstances that Miss Timms has. Described to us. She has suggested that you might have some other opinion. I must say, I don't see that it's really your affair, but it so happens that it'd be dashed inconvenient for us if you should go talking abroad, so I thought it best to have, shall we say, a little discussion of the matter. Richard said nothing. Colonel Fane stood behind him, leaning his shoulder against the door frame, not so foolish looking now as he blocked the way out. Miss Timms requested your aid, Durham said. Are you willing to give it? Archimedia is doing what she thinks right, Richard said noncommittally. Well, if it ain't too impertinent, sir, I guess what I want to know is what you think's right. I understand that you've made it some sort of personal concern of yours, that you might even take his family's view of things. Didn't matter in that case, why see, that you couldn't name this very chambers, if you was to tell. And he'd got as far as the Albany, they'd be sure to realize who he'd come to. Durham flexed his hands on the chair and added softly, He's my friend, Mr. Gill. I want you to understand that clear. Very clear. I won't let him be locked up on account of some pious zealotry on your part. With a slight chink of metal, the colonel shifted his stance, standing upright. No, indeed. He murmured. Tell me what I can say to induce you to keep silent in this. Matter, Mr. Gill. A faint mocking lilt marked Durham's tone. There is nothing thou can say. Ah. I suppose that only a higher voice than mine could move you. Richard gave a nod of assent. Durham lifted his eyebrows. Are you sure, then, that you've been brought here to no divine purpose? That there's nothing you might be meant to learn? I think, Richard said, that thou might have some smooth, pretty words at hand to convince me there is more. Durham smiled. Words? Is that all you think we have to convince you? My dear fellow, do I need to lay it out? Richard's expression did not alter. Maddie was really proud of him, that he didn't lose his fortitude, or his serenity, in the face of this thinly veiled threat. Concerning the Duke of Jervalks, he said merely, I'm not certainly persuaded to the course. Mr. Gill, I'm a frivolous fellow as I'm sure you've determined for yourself. I like a good dinner and a bottle. I'm partial to fair ladies and gambling halls and the best tailors. I really don't have anything to recommend me at all, not even as much as Fane there, who can at least say he led his battalion in open order at Cotterbras and Waterloo. Beyond that, about the best part of either one of us is that we love this man like our own blood. We don't give a damn for his title or his family or what they want will hang before we see him put away against. His will, he'd do the same for us, Wisey, just like you'd do it for. Your own. And that's all, Mr. Gill. All the pretty words I know on the subject. The enamel clock on the mantel chimed, a sweet melody in the silence. Devil put his nose beneath Maddie's hand and licked it. Richard looked toward her. Let me beg thee tenderly to come away and leave them to what they wish to do. It is worldly business, and none of ours. All right, go now, Durham said quickly, before she could answer. Go, but stay away from your father. Give us some time, Miss Timms. A few hours, half a day, enough for us to get. Ourselves safely away. You're in no danger. He'll have you back. Please, can you give us just that much? A little time before you return directly to him? She bit her lip, imagining her father's fears, balancing that against the lies she would have to tell, or set in motion Jervox's seizure. And she had a terrible feeling that she would tell lies, even to her papa, that she, like Durham and Colonel Fane, would do almost anything. She drew a breath. Until this evening? That's enough. She rose. The dog thumped to the floor and pressed past her, rounding the sofa to join the duke. I will stay away from Papa. Till supper, then. At seven. Durham nodded shortly. That'll do. Be gone, the both of you. And don't look back, 
or we'll turn you to pillars of salt. I swear it. Words or no, Christian understood well enough the way Durham and Fane got the dower thee thou between them, Durham with his sardonic smile and Fane at his best negligent. Muscle flexing. The procedure had Christian's full approval. He didn't like it that Maddie girl had so quickly put her trust in the fellow, trotting off without a by your leave heads together whisper look assess talk plans he couldn't understand, until he'd heard back and seen Maddie begin to contend words with the gloomy mule man. Meddlesome bastard, to have followed them even here. Durham and Fane would take care of it. Christian watched in pleasure, waiting for them to heave the mule out on his ear. He would have lent a hand to it himself but didn't want to upset the dance that Durham would be leading. Christian couldn't really follow the discourse. He only knew that Durham made sweet threats in that soft tone and got answers of obstinate brevity. Christian would embarrass himself by a clumsy entry at the wrong time. He saw the mule address Matty. Lebeg ten come then, leave wish do. Christian heard Durham's quick response with his own appeal to her. Ask hours time? Give time? Christian couldn't see her face, but her paws alarmed him. His body went tense. He took a step. She asked Durham something. Durham answered, enough? She rose and Christian moved, all at once. She was out of his reach. Durham was speaking to her with a parting tone, urging her to leave. The mule turning to go with her, dogs in the way of Christian's feet, he suddenly found himself with no idea at all of what had just passed but no one showed a sign of preventing her. Stay. His enraged voice arrested everyone. Maddy girl. You stay. He caught up with her. Without ceremony, he thrust her back toward the sofa. Her cloak flared around her as she fell onto the seat. Christian stood over her. You, me, he said, knowing it was too little unable to command the words to tell her that she must not leave without him and that he wasn't going anywhere without Durham and Fane and the dogs. Most emphatically she must not leave him and go with the meal. He addressed that in. Particular by standing between her and the Quaker, the dog seconding him, ready to counter any attempt to take her away. Durham dropped into a chair, crossing his arms. He gave Christian a look that meant he'd bundled the transaction but Christian didn't care. Any agreement that required Maddie to leave him was mistaken. The mule looked ice daggers at him with those vapor drab eyes. Only Fane had an idle smile, as if it were a row over some ladybird. Maddie herself just sat on the sofa, her head down, her hands and two fists on her knees. After a moment, she put one tight hand to her mouth, and Christian realized, like a blow, that she was weeping. His certainty evaporated. He felt suddenly conspicuous, the center of incriminating attention. He had made her cry. They all looked at him, and he could not tell them why it was important. She had to stay with him. She had to. He was going home with her, marry her, and he couldn't think beyond that. Why was she crying? Maddie girl, he said hoarsely. She shook her head, like a quick rejection. Christian glared at the mule. He thought this must be his fault, interfering rogue. Creep round steel in your thee thou coat. Strangle the fellow. Christian was considering the notion when suddenly something dark passed in front of him, moving quickly past toward the door. He realized that it was Maddie. He hadn't even seen her stand up. His brain got behind again making sense out of the hooded shape when she was already beyond him. He was still. Trying to gather a response from his scattered awareness when Fane straightened up from his indolent pose against the door frame, blocking it. Chev want you stay, Mississippi. She whirled around to Christian. Papa! She cried. Muse got him! Go! Him! Understand? Stay. It was all Christian could utter. Jervox. Her face was terrible, pleading with him. Papa need me. Frayed me. Must go. 
fear and denial rose in his throat. Her father, blind old afraid. But Christian needed her. Maddie. He gritted his teeth. Can't. He hated speaking in front of the others, words like a dim-witted beast, the old jokes and easier exchange with Durham and Fane vanished in his dread. Please, she said. Thou muse let me go. No. No. He looked beyond her to Fane, shook his head emphatically to keep the guardsman in place, preventing her desertion. Her thee thou meal touched her shoulder. Artia. I goeth fat he. He looked past her and Christian. I see fat hout spishin. Friend business. Maddie girl turned to him, her face alight with a joy that incensed Christian. Thoutst? Yunti Treus? Durham's sharp voice came from a place that Christian had forgotten. It scrambled his focus. He found Durham and tried not to surrender him again. No, the mule said. Have word on? Durham demanded. I have said. Truth dost work God. Pious mule, Christian thought. The sober thee thou glanced at Maddie. Thou'll stay till y return. Con said more then. She nodded meekly to his command. The mule, who never even taken off his hat, faced the door. Fane stood implacably until Durham said, Let him go, and the guardsman made a bow and stood aside. Maddie girl turned back to Christian. She gave him a look that raised him, a single glance of accusation, and walked past him to sit down on the sofa. Through the morning and noon they waited. Colonel Fane left for parade in the afternoon promising to return by supper. Maddie kept her place on the couch. She deliberately would not look at Jervalx, though he brought her a cup of chocolate with his own hands. She took it, not even giving thanks. She wished him to know that she did not remain of her own will, but only because he made it impossible for her to leave and Richard had. Been so kind as to say he would go to her father and acquaint. Papa with the case without speaking of where the duke had. Gone. Amazingly, Jervalks actually seemed to have some inkling of her resentful feelings. Instead of his usual aristocratic disinterest, he spent the endless hours standing near her or sometimes sitting at the other end of the sofa, restrained in his moves, not attempting to speak. He brought her the chocolate. It wasn't precisely an apology, but it was at least an acknowledgement that she was a person rather than a private and exclusive belonging of his. By supper, still no word had come from Richard, but there was a deadly scare just at tea time, when a servant in silver and white livery arrived wishing to speak to Durham. Mark could not lead the man off. He insisted on delivering his note into Durham's own hand. The dispute below the window became lamentably loud as the servants argued whether the Duchess man ought to wait until Mr. Durham returned home, or leave his message with Mark. When it became certain that the other servant would not go away without seeing Durham, that resourceful gentleman went up to the attics and somehow found his way outside. While Maddie and the Duke waited in the bedroom, Durham came back round as if he'd been out all along and interviewed the Duchess servant in his sitting room, full of falsehoods. The servant went away with a convoluted story about Durham's deceased fourth cousin that even Maddie, listening through the door, could not make out clear. On the subject of the Duke of Jervalks, Durham was baffled. Did the fellow mean that the Duke had recovered? That was excellent news. Durham had thought him dying. The Duchess herself had told him so. But now he was out and about. Miraculous. Durham wondered that he hadn't come to call on his friends. He would have thought that would be Jervalks's first destination, the moment he was back in form. Did the man mean to say, here now, Durham really didn't understand. The Duke was missing? Oh, not missing? Well, if he weren't missing or dying, nor calling on his friends, just precisely what the devil was he doing? Nobody had seen him for months. It sounded dash suspicious to Durham. He thought perhaps the authorities ought to be notified and damn the scandal. 
The servant backed down quite quickly at that point, and went away with Durham earnestly wishing the Duchess would inform him the moment they had any clue. Maddie had turned around in the dimness of the curtained bedroom and seen Jervox's set face as he stood with one hand on the bedpost, arrogant and wary, like a hunter cornered by his own prey, galled with the need to hide himself. Durham came to the door and opened it, allowing the dogs to rush in. They greeted Jervox joyously, as if they hadn't seen him just a quarter hour since, and his haughtiness evaporated into a grin and play. Those were the moments that shook Maddie, those sudden. Transitions from imperious pride to affection. She had no defense against them. Her opening fell into confusion. She wasn't even certain that it was a true leading any longer. Richard hadn't been convinced that she took the right course. Maddie knew that all of her life she'd had to fight to submerge a strong self will, to avoid being tempted by fashions and fripperies, by the urge to dispute and disagree with her elders. She was too often ungoverned and rebellious in her heart. Someone like Richard would be better able to know the prompting of God from the wiles of the reasoner. Maddie wanted to go home to her father. She wanted to be safe again. The door was there in front of her, with no king's officer to stop her now. The duke was employed with his dogs and Durham in setting out glasses and a decanter of golden sherry. The door was there. She did not go. Christian decided to send Maddie Girl to bed. She'd fallen asleep sitting up anyway, waiting for her the thou meal man. Fane had come and gone again, on duty, welcome nonsense and casual acceptance of Christian's flawed speech. Christian was sorry to see him leave. Durham was not so easy about it. He kept starting off to talk to Christian and then realizing halfway into a headlong statement that Christian didn't understand, though he tried desperately to hide it. It embarrassed both of them. Christian wanted to turn to Madigo for help, but she sat like a stone when he looked at her, angry at him still because he kept her from her father. Another thing impossible to communicate, the depth of his dependence on her being there. He was sorry. But the world was going too fast for him. New things, surprises and confusions and noise that made hard understanding harder. She had to stay. The bedroom was all right. Close by, the door was where he could see it, know for certain she was there. He woke her merely by walking close. Devil, following, stopped to touch her hand with his nose. When she opened her eyes, Christian held out his hand. Has come? It was the first thing that she uttered. Christian merely looked at her. Not yet, Durham said. Bed. Christian kept his hand extended. Yes, Durham said from the table. Go lie down, missed him. Wake moment return. She blinked back sleep and then sighed. She laid her hand in Christian's and rose. He would have taken her himself, but she released him immediately and turned away. A little rush of coals fell in the grate as the bedroom door closed behind her. Durham sat in silence at the table, surveying the remains of supper. Egad, he muttered. Bloody caspicles. Christian walked to the sideboard and took the round crystal hard thing from the top of the decanter of sherry. He poured himself a glass. So. Durham held up his empty one, and Christian filled it. What speck do there, now THV got? Christian put his forefinger to his mouth. Quiet. Durham took a swallow of his drink. He leaned his head back on the chair, gazing at the ceiling. Christian let the clock tick down. Listening to it instead of watching it, because it was like looking. At himself in the mirror, something odd and annoying about it, something not real in the way the numbers lay around the face. One of the crazy things that he preferred to ignore when he could. It chimed once on the half hour. Without conversation, he and Durham sat drinking. Durham poured two more sherries, and Christian felt a pleasant mellowness begin to steal over him. It was familiar and gratifying to sit here as they'd done so often. Companion. Sherry made Durham slow. Christian knew him. 
Three glasses took the edge from his decisiveness. Four made him smart, and his speech lazy. Christian waited for four. He set his glass on the table. Wednesday. He looked at Durham. Maddie girl. Durham frowned. He shook his head. Sony oil man. Don't understand. It was much easier when he spoke slowly instead of mumbling too fast. Maddie. Christian moved his head, indicating the bedroom. Yes. All right. Miss Timms. Me. Christian thrust his hand inside his coat pocket, exploring, and found the ring. He pushed the box onto the table. And got it open with his thumb. Wednesday. His friend gazed at the ring. He seemed not to comprehend. Christian was about to try again when Durham slammed his glass down onto the table. God Almighty. I lose a bloody mind? No, Christian said. Merry girl? Durham half rose. At Christian's quick warning hiss, he dropped back into his chair and lowered his tone to a violent whisper. Not serious? Christian picked up the ring and slapped it down again. No thing the nurse. Durham leaned forward over the table. Hang it, she's Quaker. Mary. With an effortful curl of his mouth, Christian said, Go home. Durham shook his head. Can't go, I'm dear fellow. Not safe. Take why way, she said. No. Christian reached across and gripped his wrist. Not wed. Son, dragon want. Nuff. Son. The meaning seemed to take a moment to strike. Durham's brows went up. He rubbed his hand across his mouth. Get air? All. All she wants? Deal. Christian let go. Not back place. Wednesday. Went my other girl then. Christian made a sound of disgust. Durham put both of his hands on the stem of his glass and rolled it between them watching the candlelight catch the cuts, spark color and darkness from the liquor. Like tea sun better? He asked, slanting a look across the table. Christian took a swig of sherry. He laid the pad of his thumb up against his lips, kissed it, and lifted it gently away. He smiled past it at his friend. Braid. He stretched his fingers apart, as if he spread them in her hair. Down. Durham snorted. He made his own fist, thumb up, and thrust it out toward Christian. So be it. Want her, old son, shall ave her. Didn't ordain me f. Not. Chapter 18 Miss Timms The voice came out of dreams. Time to wake, Miss Timms. Maddie sat up all at once. Papa? She was tangled in her cloak. For a moment of confusion, she thought it was a burglary, a strange man stepping back from the bed, holding a candle so that she only saw his face and shadowed profile. But she wasn't home. She couldn't recall at all where she was until suddenly a black and white dog trotted into the circle of candlelight and jumped up to put its front paws onto the edge of the bed. The animal made an enthusiastic stretch and licked her nose. Maddie spluttered and drew back, blinking sleep from her. Eyes. This came for you. Durham held out a note sealed by an uneven splotch of wax. It's from Mr. Gill. She fought to keep her eyes open. Sense and memory returned. She accepted the note as Durham set the candle down next to the bed and left her alone. She tore open the wax, holding the paper close, squinting at the blocky hand. Miss Timms, I have spoke with thy father at length. He is in agreement with thee that the duke ought to be protected from this travesty, and wishes thee to see to it. He urges thee to put thy trust in the duke's friends and take him out of danger instantly, as the pursuit is very hot. Thee art to remain with the duke wherever he goes. Thy father commands thee most gravely not to return to him, us it would put thee in peril. I cannot come to thee myself because of the hazard of being followed. There was some suspicion when I called on thy father. If thee has a message for him, 
send it to the Bell Savage, and I will see that he receives it. Bless thee, friend Richard Gill. Oh, Maddie whispered. She turned the note more to the light, blinked hard, and read it again. It still said the same thing, in the same awkward way. She was to go away with Jervalx. She was to stay with him. Her papa wished it. It was bewildering. And upsetting. She wasn't to return to papa. For how long? How much peril could there be? Maddie sat up in bed. She was to be accused of kidnapping. She truly was. Lady de Marley would not stick at that for an instant. She closed her eyes and prayed a quick, silent prayer, asking for the strength to face what she must. Then she hurried to find her shoes. As she bent to buckle them, she had to push Devil off four times from jumping on her. Taking up the candle, she went through the dark to the sitting room. Jervalks was there, startling in his extravagant formal clothes, his hair must, his face in need of shaving. He gave her a quick look, wary, as if he half expected that she might scold him for something. The clock chimed. Maddie held up her candle toward it and found that the time was only half past three. From the entrance hall, she heard the door open and the soft sound of Durham's voice in conversation with his servant. The door closed. Durham came into the room, padding and stocking feet, carrying a coffee pot and tray. Mark's gone to bring a cab round, if he can find one at this hour. So drink up. There's a post-coach leaves the swan at five. You'll want to put yourself in order in the bedroom, Miss Timms, but let me get something else for Chev to wear first. He looked no better than the Duke, and they both looked as if they'd been up all night. Durham set down the tray, yawned, then took the candle and shuffled into the bedroom, leaving the sitting room with only a faint flame from the oil lamp to illuminate it. Chev, he called quietly. Come here, my dear fellow, and... See if this will fit you. The Duke gave her another brief glance, and then walked past her into the bedroom. A looking glass hung over the mantelpiece. Maddie saw that she appeared no better than the men and attempted to make something of her hair, but with no brush or comb it seemed a hopeless task. She would have to keep her hood close. She poured coffee, hoping that might clear the sleepy disorder from her brain. Durham seemed to have some plan. He mentioned a post-coach, which meant that he intended for them to travel quickly. Nothing but the mail would be faster, and no mail left before evening. A post-coach would be swift and as anonymous as a ticket at the booking office, but to where? She hoped it was not too far. Then again, if she was to be hung for a kidnapper, perhaps she should wish it would be Scotland. Or America. Or the moon. As it fell out, it was Bath, or the great road in that direction, at any rate, in a beautiful black and red post-coach emblazoned with the device of the swan with two necks and gleaming in the lamplight of a frosty morning. Durham would not reveal to Maddie their final destination. In fact, he had become somewhat close in his speech to her. When she protested the distance, he would only say that they weren't bound for Bath itself. Jervalx and his friends slept in the coach. They made a disreputable pair, with Durham stretched across the forward. Seat and the Duke propped uncomfortably against the opposite. Window from Maddie, wrapped in a borrowed great coat, unshaven and hatless, which was Durham's peculiar notion of how a gentleman going into the country, for his health, ought to look. Maddie had agreed to this description of the Duke as basically compatible with the truth, but she would not bend so far as to call him Mr. Higgins, and present herself as his sister. Not even to avoid transportation or hanging. Without going out of her way to volunteer the information, she was his nurse, if anyone should ask, and her name was Archimedia Timms. As a result of this stance, she wasn't allowed out of the coach except at the busiest inns, where no one paid much mind to any individual traveler amid the clatter and jingle of the horses ready saddled the shouts of the arriving postilions and the stage passengers hurrying in and out for a brief refreshment. Even then, she only descended alone or with Durham. 
He insisted that the three of them oughtn't to be observed altogether, in order to confound any pursuit. He'd paid a full fare to secure the fourth seat in the light and graceful post-coach so that they would not have to travel with a stranger, and after the first change of horses and postillions no one even looked inside as long as he leaned out the window to bestow the tips. Even the dogs had been left behind with Mark, mightily unhappy, but far too conspicuous to be seen with the Duke. It was a wonder to travel so fast, in a well-sprung vehicle on. An excellent road, ahead of all the stage coaches and sometimes passing even a privately hired chaise. She was not certain that she approved of the post-coach. It seemed a prodigious expenditure of effort in the interest of earthly business. It must be a vain thing to go on in such a headlong rush through the early morning darkness. The horses galloped the whole of each stretch and pulled up lathered after half an hour to be replaced by a waiting team within two minutes. With the gentlemen asleep between changes, Maddie had ample time to watch the ghostly white mileposts spin past and to reflect on the speed with which she was plunging into oblivion. With dawn, long blue shadows from the trees lapped across fields sparkling with frost. She could see glimpses of a huge castle in the distance bulwark round with towers and high walls. Banners at the turrets caught the first sun. Maddie leaned forward to watch as the rays turned the stone to pinkish gold. We soar. The duke's voice startled her. She turned and found him watching her sleepily, his shoulders braced against the side of the coach in an awkward position. The vehicle bounced over a rough section of road without slowing a dot. Maddie caught the strap. Jervox's head bumped hard against the wall, while Durham almost rolled off his seat. Durham caught himself, cursed, and pushed back into place, bracing with one foot on the floor, readjusting his hat over his eyes. Jervox sat upright. He rubbed both palms over his face, then rested buried in his hands for a moment, his elbows propped on the greatcoat over his knees. The coach swayed. Along the road. Matty thought perhaps he would wake up fully. Now, but instead he turned and lay down again, this time in the opposite direction. Since he was far too tall to fit into the available seat, this position necessitated that he lay his head in Matty's lap, which he did, brazenly, with no more warning than a deep sigh as he settled into position. Jervox, she said sharply. His only answer was a slow smile perfectly uncivilized viewed in profile against the shadow of his beard, as if he were some indolent gypsy happy to sleep beneath a hedgerow. It being impossible to hold her hand in the air for the remainder of the journey, she found it obligatory to rest it on his shoulder. She held it there so lightly that on each bump it lifted, until he reached and caught it, entwining their fingers, and made her bear down solidly on his shoulder. They were both without gloves, Maddie having left hers far behind in the chapel, and Jervox's elegant white ones forgotten in the rush. Maddie watched the countryside grow bright, the castle at Windsor a massive landmark that appeared and disappeared among the hills and hollows of the road. He moved his head restlessly, snuggling closer. With his free hand, he reached and adjusted hers so that her fingers rested against his temple and cheek, just touching his face each time the carriage rolled. Maddie pretended to ignore it. She reasoned that if the Duke had been an ordinary patient, an ailing child or a sick neighbor, she certainly would have been. Glad to provide whatever comfort she could on this fatiguing. Journey She told herself that Jervox tired easily, and that the events of the past twenty-four hours would have been enough to exhaust even a person in full health. Indeed, Maddie herself felt the fluttery weakness of too little sleep and too much apprehension. It was just that his hand against hers felt so full of heat and life, firmly locked with her fingers, his shoulder pressed steadily close, his body not quite as passive under the rock of the coach as it should have been. He made a sleepy mutter, shifting, tilting his chin up as if he could not find the most comfortable position. His skin was scratchy with new beard, rough against her palm. She didn't think he was asleep at all, and she was certain of it at the next change. As the coach rocked to a halt amid the whistles and shouts of the postilions, Durham rolled over and sat up. 
Jervalx didn't stir. After a brief glance at him and Maddie, Durham made an exaggeratedly thorough search in his pockets for his purse. He finally found it. As he got down, Jervalx kissed her fingers. She snatched them away. The Duke sighed and nestled closer in her lap, without ever opening his eyes. Durham put his hand on the window frame and smiled faintly at her. I suppose I ought to bring your breakfast out to you, Miss Timms? Sometimes, in daydreams, Maddie had imagined a garden. It never had a house with it. It was just a garden, with room for everything she might want to plant. It had lavender around each of the beds and a low wall with the countryside beyond. In the spring, there were peas and asparagus, tulips and hyacinths. In the summer, vegetables and hollyhock, larkspur, sweet williams. In the autumn, the trees in the corners were heavy with fruit, hanging low over Michaelmas daisies and gelder roses. It wasn't formal, this garden, as the straight paths and majestic lawns at Blydale Hall were formal, meant only for strolling and creaturely talk. It was a working garden, with the flowers. Planted between more practical things. The first morning that she woke and looked out the leaded window of the rectory at St. Matthews upon laid she saw it. Her garden, or the disreputable remnants of it anyway, catching early sun, casting shadows, a thousand stems sparking fire as they bent in graceful arches beneath the dew. It was a long abandoned chaos, a disarray of weeds and old growth, the stone footways barely visible under ragged clumps of grass and autumned foliage, but it was her garden. The dry stone walls enclosed half an acre, with fruit trees planted in each corner, and in the middle a simple urn. Beyond the wall, a pasture, vivid green, sloped down to a village. The houses spread out along the valley, all built of the same silvery gray stone glinting light through the long finger of mist that blew up through the trees. The rectory was sinfully neglected. Durham was even worse than she'd thought. Not only did he turn out to be one of the false priests, and a more unlikely man of God she'd never met. Unless it might have been Jervalks himself, or possibly Colonel. Fain, he'd allowed this garden and this house to fall almost into ruin. Last night they had arrived at quarter past ten, exhausted, the duke so weary that he kept bumping into things that were perfectly easy to see. After Durham had unlocked the dark rectory and thrown open the door as if it were a welcoming palace, Maddie had been obliged to spend half an hour hunting it over for sheets to sleep upon. They dined out of a paper on meat pies and cross buns bought mid-afternoon at Hungerford, where they'd left the bath road and struck off in a private post-chaise all three of them crushed together in a vehicle meant for two. Maddie had slept in. Her dress for the second night in a row, not very deeply, considering the desolate chill of the house and bedding. And now, in the morning, looking out at the abandoned garden in the sun, she didn't suppose there would be anything suitable for breakfast, either. She made herself as presentable as she could with no water or brush. All the furniture was covered, the hangings over the bed dark with dust. The mattress looked higgledy piggledy made up with two layers of sheets and no counterpane. She feared that the little ball of dust underneath the frame had the unmistakable cast of mice about it. In spite of the neglect, it was a commodious house. She descended the stairs, listening in vain for any sound of the men yet stirring from the bedrooms in the opposite wing. Her steps echoed as she passed through a carved screen into a spacious flagstone hall, its only furnishing a bare table of the antique. Sort, long and dark and massive, with legs carved in heavy globes. Of wood. In the middle of it lay the paper that had held their dinner, folded over beneath a key. Her name was inscribed on the top. She took a deep breath and opened the stained document, smoothing it out. My dear Miss Timms, it's my misfortune to be forced to leave without seeing you again, in order to make my way back to town with as much speed as possible. I hope to be there by tonight, which ought to confound anyone as to the distance we've traveled should. Suspicion light on me. On my way, I will inform Mrs. 
Digby that I've made the rectory available to my ailing friend and ask her to see to it that you have a servant at my expense. Beyond that you will have to depend upon the money from the buckles until I receive my ecclesiastical revenues next month, as you find me sadly flat at the moment. I hope that you will make yourselves at home. If all goes well, I believe you may be stopping for some little time here. Rest assured that you are doing the right thing, Miss Timms, and please, to the best of your conscience, and perhaps even a little to the worst of it, do what you can to protect him. Your servant, Kid Durham P.S. If you please, will you tell him that I will think of a way to send the dogs, unless I shoot them first. Next month. He expected them to be here as long as that? Maddie folded the letter. She looked round the empty hall. In her bodice was the wallet with most of the Duke's three hundred. Pounds still intact, since Durham had paid for all the fares. She. And her father could have lived two years on that. Loud footsteps sounded on the stair. Maddie looked up just as the Duke appeared in the doorway, disheveled and intense, dressed, but with nothing tied or buttoned. When he saw her, a look of deliverance came into his face. He held the doorframe, then leaned heavily against it, expelling a harsh breath. Lone. He closed his eyes and shook his head. I'm here, Maddie said. He made a gesture with his head, back toward the wing where he and Durham had slept. Not. Durham has returned to town. She held up the oily note. Jervalks pushed away strode toward her and took it. He frowned down at the words, turning his head a little. The shadow of his beard had become a real darkness. Maddie wondered if there might be a shaving kit in the house or if she would have to go into the village. How safe would it be for them to show themselves? Durham had said that no one would recognize the Duke here, but she was loath to take any risk. He looked up, smiling one-sided. Dogs! Maddie made a face. Yes. Thy wicked dogs will come. He grinned, an unkempt barbarian. She took hold of his wrist and pulled the shirt cuff down from inside his coat. Lynx? He made an assenting sound, gesturing again toward the bedrooms. Maddie pulled the other cuff free and reached up to tie the neckpiece that was draped around his shoulders. He stood very still watching her from beneath lowered lashes as she did it. When she glanced up, he smiled at her. In his unshaven state, it was oddly boyish. She had to bite her lip to prevent herself from smiling back. Instead, she took a schoolroom tone. Bring the cufflinks. She touched his wrist and pointed toward the door. Without hesitation, he turned to go. Maddie noticed the letter still in his hand. Jervalks she said. He looked back at her. Canst thou read? He came back, slapped the paper down on the table and bent over it, leaning on both arms. My. Tim. It mis fur to be fur force. Leave see you, in order make my way back to toe. Town speed pass. He looked up at her triumphantly. Read. Before now? Didst thou read before now? Math, he said. She remembered him working with her father. Only mathematics, she said. Only numbers. He shrugged. Wilt thou not bring thy cufflinks to me? With a brief nod, he pushed away from the table and walked out of the hall. Maddie looked after him. She pressed her lips together. A week ago, a day ago, he would not have understood such a long and complicated sentence, especially not as she deliberately spoken it at a normal pace. He returned carrying the studs. Maddie accepted them. As she fastened his cuffs, she said, What dost thou think we ought to do for breakfast? He picked up the grease-stained paper between his thumb and forefinger. With a little grunt, he let it drop. Pie. Jervalks. She said, Thou art getting better. He gave her a pirate grin. Maddie girl had gone into the village. Christian prowled the house, alone and free, uneasy with it. For something to do, he 
was yanking the covers off the furniture, leaving them in white piles scattered about the floor. When he pulled down the covering from a frame over the parlor mantel, he found himself face to face with a mirror. Egad. He looked the very devil, as if he'd been three days in drink. And Durham's coat sleeve was too short, showing a vulgar width of cuff when Christian lifted his hand to feel his beard. Monstrous fine fellow, the Duke of Jervox. Just what a young thee thou prim would like. It made him lightheaded, looking at himself, a wrench of effort to focus on the not real side, like trying to stop a dream without waking. It was there but somehow it just kept not being there. A loud knocking at the front door startled him. Maddy girl, he thought, turning into the passage, but at the last moment he had a doubt. He stopped with his hand outstretched. The knocker had fallen silent, waiting, but after a pause the banging took up again. He wanted to find out if it was her, but the words failed. Him as they always seemed to fail him when he needed them the most. He tried to calm himself, to get hold of the unreasonable panic. He couldn't simply stand here, delaying forever. Finally he took hold of the ancient handle and wrenched it open. Muggy wind gusted inside, unseasonable for October, warmer than the air in the house. Storm weather. Under the dark stone porch, a girl in an apron and cap dropped a curtsy beneath her cloak. If, a pleaser, Mabrinil Diggy made all work. They looked at one another. She had a wide, dark-eyed country credulity about her, too naive not to stare at him as if he looked as bad as he knew he did. She seemed unthreatening enough. He pulled the door wide and stepped back. Maddie returned with bread and baked mutton and potatoes in a cookshop dish. She got it all through the front door and was hastening to the kitchen with the tepid burden when the sound of a female voice brought her up short. She peered around the doorframe into the kitchen. Jervox and a maid servant sat across from one another at the table, both holding steaming crockery mugs. The girl faced away from Maddie, chatting blithely about her, lad, and how he was to go into the market town at week's end to attend a lecture on chemical subjects. She repeated that twice, adding, Do I see? In a questioning tone, as if it were a perfectly normal thing in speaking to make certain that the other party understood, as no doubt it was when the inhabitants spoke to foreign people in these parts. Jervalk set his mug down with an emphatic nod of approval. Focused on the maid, he didn't seem to see Maddie, even though she was well within his view. Oh, I, he's wonderful clever, my lad is, the girl said. She drained her mug and pushed back her chair. I'm sure I don't know what to think of him anymore, since he got to attending that mechanics. Institutin. All these lectures and things. He's going to make engines. Engines, do I mark me? She turned toward the dry sink with the mug and saw Maddie. Oh. Mistress. She dropped a deep curtsy and hurried forward to take the dish from Maddie's hands. Mr. Langland asked me to sit down with Anne, mistress. I'm Brunhilde Digby. Did ye see M? Mother in the village? Did she tell E. I? Us to come? M. 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 Don't this smell good? Ought I to put it into warm, mistress? Without waiting for an answer, she set the dish on the table and began working with the iron oven inside the hearth. Jervalk stood up, his face relaxing into that easy grin that never failed to make Maddie think of worldly and temporal things. She placed the bread and another package on the table. Thou lookest a fine rogue, she said sternly. I've bought a razor and brush. He inclined his head. The water's heated, mistress, Brunhilde offered. Having been caught idling, she seemed especially anxious to please. Ought I to bring the basin down? The kitchen was already growing warm. Maddie thought of the chilly, damp bedrooms above and nodded. Yes. Come and discover to me where I might find more linens. Yes, miss us. The girl obeyed quickly, passing out of the kitchen and through the hall in front of Maddie. On the first stair, she stopped and turned, leaning down, smiling. He's a little touched, ain't he? Her smile deepened. 
But he's a darling. And so gentleman handsome. I can surely see why ye marry a lad like. And mistress, long-headed or no. The storm broke after dark, hail and fury, striking with a power that alarmed Maddie. In town, she'd taken a secret pleasure in thunderstorms, snuggling down in bed to listen to the rain pour, but this was a rampage with a roaring soul of its own. The half-empty house seemed to hold thunder in its corners, sending it back out of the shadows over and over again. Brunhilde had long since gone home. As the fire whipped and smoldered from uneasy drafts, Maddie released the duke's cuffs and waistcoat buttons in the kitchen. He stepped back when she finished, with a look she couldn't interpret, but she knew well enough not to insist on more help than he wished to have. With Maddie in front, carrying a single candle, they went together up the stairs. She paused at the landing where the two wings separated. Thou wilt be comfortable, she asked. A little suspended moment went by. He stood still, bathed in the dancing gold of candlelight, looking down at her. He gave her a lazy smile, his eyes indigo blue, half hidden by those outrageously long lashes. Maddie felt a sudden, aching wrench of emotion. It came upon her without warning, a painful fullness in her throat, like weeping, only it was not weeping but something else. Lightning froze the shadows for an instant the crack of thunder exploded directly overhead. She jerked and dropped the candle, dousing them in darkness as the sound rolled down the hallway. The rumbling shook the house like a living thing. Oh my, she said foolishly as it began to die away. Another flash and split of sound fractured the air. All of Maddie's muscles jumped in a convulsive flinch. She felt the Duke's hand touch her, and turned and went into his embrace amid the reverberations, an action that had no more wit or motive than the twitch of her hand when she dropped the candle. But his arms came around her, and Maddie instantly knew she'd done a wrong thing, a thing so sweet and dangerous that a point strike of lightning was as nothing to it. He leaned back on the wall, his hand against her hair, pressing her cheek into his shoulder. She felt the rise and fall of his chest, breathed the warm incense of a man tinged yet with the faint flowery aftermath of scent from his wedding. The thunder was a low timbre, still vibrating, a sound like a heavy wagon rolling on and on over a wooden bridge. He lifted his hand and traced her temple, a light stroke, an exquisite contrast to the steadfast way that he held her. His fingers slid downward, a feather across her cheek, a delicate caress of her lips. He pulled her harder into him, bending his mouth to her hair. Fear, Matty girl? No, she said. She began to push away. No, I am quite all right now. I am quite calm. She said it as much to herself as to him, for he did not hold her forcibly. She was embarrassed now, flustered as she pulled free. The candle, she said, feeling hot and stupid. She bent, trying to search for it in the dark glad of some task no matter how hopeless. She found the stick just underfoot, but had no way to light it. I'm sorry! He made an amused sound and put his hand under her elbow, drawing her in the direction of her bedchamber. The distant lightning gave only tantalizing and ineffectual illumination, but he seemed more at home in the dark than she. He ran his hand along the wall as they moved until finally Maddie could see the faint glimmer of firelight falling on the floor in front of her open bedroom door. She disengaged herself briskly from his hold, stepping ahead into the room. Rain gusted at the window behind the drawn curtains and rumbled in the drains. In the fitful glow of the fire, she crossed the room, knelt and put the candlestick to the coals until it flamed. There. She stood and held it out to him. Thou canst see thy way back. He did not take it. He looked at her above it. Faint. Lightning mingled with firelight and candlelight on his face. Gentleman handsome, Brunhilde had called him. Maddie thought him anything but gentle. The candlelight caught his brows and made them villainous, took away the bewilderment that softened his eyes. A drop of clear wax tumbled down the side of the candle. They both moved at once 
Maddie tilted the candlestick to save herself. At the same time, his left hand seized hers. The hot wax fell free, but not far enough, landing on the inside of his wrist. He swore distinctly. Maddie exclaimed, Thy hand! Oh, thou shouldst not have! He blew out the flame. Careful! He said sharply. Thou art burnt? Her hand was still locked under his. He gave an ironic laugh. Burn! His thumb moved across her fingers in a slow caress. He held hard then let go of her, his face outlined in fireglow and darkness. He watched her, as if to see whether she understood him. Here in this house, locked in by rain and thunder and the intensity of his gaze, she was afraid to. He put his fist against his chest. Burn, Maddie girl, he said. Then he turned and left her in the flickering gloom and thunder.